restricted communications blackout, and that'll begin at 11.36 a.m., and it'll last for about six minutes. So uh, while that's happening, we will have what's called entry interface. Uh, that is whenever the vehicle will begin to experience the aerodynamic pressures and loads of Earth's atmosphere. So uh, that's what the really exciting point. Um, and then we will get our communications back at 11.42 a.m. So all of that kind of leading up to the big visual fun part, the parachutes. Yeah, and the parachutes are going to come out in two different stages. We'll start off with the drogue parachutes. Those will do the initial slowing. Now, you have to imagine when Dragon starts hitting the Earth's atmosphere, it's moving about 17,500 miles an hour. That's its orbital velocity as it's flying around planet Earth. By the time the drogue chutes come out, just after that deorbit burn and that reentry, it's already slowed down to about 350 miles an hour. Two drogue chutes will come out and do the, uh, some initial slowing of the vehicle and also stabilize the capsule as it continues to descend through the thicker part of Earth's atmosphere. Those drogues should come out right at around 11.44 a.m. Pacific, while the capsule is about 18,000 feet in altitude. Uh, just a, less than a minute after those drogues are done with their job, they will uh, jettison and they'll actually draw out four main parachutes, which will do the final slowing of the vehicle. Those will pop out at about 6,500 feet in altitude. Uh, and when the spacecraft's moving, uh, only 119 miles an hour. So we've already slowed down quite a bit by that point. Those main parachutes will do the final slowing down before we do the splashdown. It'll be moving at about 15 or 16 miles an hour once it hits the water. And at that point, we are looking at it at about 11.48 a.m. Pacific for their splashdown in the Gulf off of the coast of Florida. Yeah, and of course, uh, the recovery team uh, will be there ready and waiting for Bob and Doug. Uh, the, and in preparation for this splashdown, uh, the, the recovery team has been busy over the last week. One of their big ticket items has been the final selection of the landing site. To increase the options for space station departure, the teams identified a total of seven possible splashdown locations. Also, in order to meet NASA's timeline for, uh, for, for um, extraction requirements, requirements. Uh, the, the potential splashdown locations have to be close to a port as well as medical facilities. So with all of that in mind, add the evolving weather conditions from uh, Tropical Storm Isaia, and it's easy to see how determining the landing site is a complex process. <laughs> Since Dragon is capable of splashdown on either side of the Florida Panhandle, we actually have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels ready and waiting to support. Uh, so one is in the Gulf of Mexico and the other in the Atlantic Ocean, which, uh, of course, will stay there. <laughs> uh, so the, the GO Navigator uh, is the vessel that we have in the Gulf of Mexico. And like I said, today we'll uh, be splashing down just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Now, in addition to weather, which has really been the key thing we've been watching over the last, it's kind of been a theme to this mission as we were watching weather yeah. so closely for their launch, and we've been watching it very closely for this return. Uh, the crew's sleep schedule is actually a really important factor in how we decide how long it's going to take for them to come home and which landing opportunities we're going to take. I mean, every single day, Dragon has multiple landing opportunities that are identified by the SpaceX team, and then those will range anywhere from about six hours from station to a splashdown all the way up to in excess of 30 hours from an undock to a splashdown. So we try to target the ones that are in that sweet spot where we're not going 30 hours from them leaving to getting back home. Uh, but we're also going at an appropriate amount of time where they're going to be off a sleep schedule in between to make sure they're rested up and ready to go uh, for the actual splashdown itself and all of those recovery operations. Uh, Dragon's going to change quite a bit um, over the course of this reentry. As we said, uh, it's made up of both the capsule and the trunk right now. Uh, it weighs in at a little over 27,000 pounds, and that trunk is jettisoned. It will go all the way about 21,000 pounds. And again, during the heat of reentry, it's going to build up on the capsule. It's going to build up a plasma that will give us that communications blackout. It's also going to heat up the capsule to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit during that reentry. Yeah, which, interestingly enough, uh the interior of the cabin uh, will actually remain quite comfortable. There are a number of systems in place to make sure that Bob and Doug won't be heating up along with the exterior of the capsule. Uh, they're expected to, I think the internal capsule 
temperature is supposed to stay around 85 degrees Fahrenheit maximum, um, but there will be cold air flushing throughout the cabin and throughout Bob and Doug's suits throughout the re-entry phase. So uh, they really won't be breaking too much of a sweat during that re-entry period. Uh, also something to note, uh, the exterior of the capsule, uh, as you may, if you followed along with our demo one recovery, uh, will due to those extreme temperatures. The we're basically in the last couple of hours of seeing Dragon in its pristine white condition. After that reentry, it will come back with a lot of that uh, space dust. Essentially, uh, we'll see a lot of the charring on the external sides of the of the capsule to the thermal protective systems that are basically built to insulate the Dragon capsule and make sure that uh, everything stays safe during that very heated reentry period. Yeah, it's going to be very dynamic for them. It's going to be a new experience. I mean, they're experienced astronauts, but this is their first time coming home in a capsule. Both, both had previously flown on space shuttle missions, uh, so they were used to kind of the glide down of the space shuttle onto a runway. This is going to be their first time landing in a capsule, and this is going to be the first time we've splashed down a capsule with American astronauts in over 45 years. Uh, the final Apollo mission, Apollo Soyuz, uh, making that splash down uh, back in 1975. So. Uh, Another historical milestone here with this mission that, that we're going to be uh, taking today. Uh, once they actually splash down on the water, though, we have a combined SpaceX and NASA team that's going to be standing by to recover them. Uh, there will be a little over 40 people on Go Navigator, uh, and it's a mix of uh, SpaceX personnel who are there uh, to safe the capsule, get it rigged up to get uh, lifted out of the water and out of the boat. Um, and also some medical personnel along with the NASA contingent where uh, both Bob and Doug's flight surgeons are with the uh, contingent on the boat there. Um, they are responsible for their medical care before flight, during flight, and after. Um, and so they'll be there just to help them out of the capsule and do their initial medical check right there on the boat before they make their way back to shore. Yeah. So earlier in the week, Bob and Doug did a couple of interviews from while they were still on station. And one of the questions asked to them was, are you nervous about returning? Uh, and they said, no, we've rehearsed this with the team many, many times, both uh, digitally as well as in person with the recovery team, actually practicing the egress operations from the capsule. So uh, coincidentally, they said they're, they're not worried about it. They're more worried about the health of their family uh, in, the, in the midst of the pandemic, more so than uh, the return itself. Uh, when I think about the return, I can't help but to think of G-forces. Uh, the uh, the G-forces that we're expecting them to experience on the way back down is around 4Gs. They also got around 4Gs on the ascent portion of the mission, so this really shouldn't be anything that they haven't experienced previously. Uh, that is, if you think of roller coasters, that's about what a, I would say, higher level roller coaster would deliver is about 4Gs. I tend to avoid roller coasters at all costs. <laughs> so you probably won't find me in a crew capsule anytime soon. Uh, that being said, Bob and Doug, like we said before, have rehearsed this many times with the recovery team, with the mission control operators, uh, and they're excited to come home. And we're looking forward to having them back on Earth. Yeah, there's uh, not a ton for them to do between now and then. Uh, just a couple of the activities that Bob and Doug will be doing inside of Dragon. Um, they're obviously going to be monitoring throughout the deorbit burn. Uh, prior to that, though, they're going to be getting suited back up. Uh, they, they're wearing those launch and entry suits for all the dynamic phases, obviously for launch. And then they wore them during all the proximity operations around the space station, and they'll be in the suits once more for the actual splashdown itself. And again, those those suits are there as just another line of protection for the crew members. Obviously, the capsule keeping them safe in a very hazardous environment of outer space or burning up on reentry with all of that heat. Uh, and then the suits are just another line of defense. So they'll have they'll have those worn. They'll be wearing those during the reentry. Uh, they'll actually do what's called a suit flush just before they reenter, where they just inject uh, some cool down nitrox into the suits just to help with kind of that conditioning inside of the capsule. Um, and before they get suited up, they'll be doing what's known as fluid loading. Uh, that's very common for returning crew members. Um, you can end up getting very dehydrated, and the fluid loading can help 
kind of minimize uh, the unpleasant effects of re-entering a gravity environment. Uh, it's very common for returning crew members from long duration missions uh, to have some orthostatic intolerance, to have their vestibular system, which is responsible for just maintaining your balance, your motion, uh, to just really be all out of whack. It's the same when you first get on board the space station and you're in microgravity and your inner ear is trying to tell you which way is up, which way is down, it doesn't really exist anymore. And the human body adapts to that when you're up there for several months at a time. And so when you get back down to Earth, it can be a little bit jarring. But that's why we have a lot of trained personnel there on site, ready to help them out of the capsule Dragon, and for their journey home. The ground, Jay, if you're ready, we are ready for the systems brief. All right. Copy. Um, yeah, uh, as stated, uh, Dragon's in a healthy state. Uh, we are proceeding toward the primary landing site. And uh, your timeline is current uh, to Pensacola. Uh, the weather's looking great. Uh, forecasted winds are at one knot and seas are very calm. Uh, we are working an issue with the generator on the recovery ship that has elim eliminated power redundancy, but we're working a plan to get a backup generator. Uh, even without this resolved, we do expect the ship to be at the designated uh, landing site and no impact to your egress timeline. And that is all we have to report. Okay, we copy all. That's uh, news about the weather, and uh, I'm sure the uh, folks on the ship will get something sorted out uh, with that generator. Thanks for the update. Yeah, good read back, and we'll keep you posted as we uh, proceed on the timeline. All right, so a quick rundown of where we stand right now for Bob and Doug. That was from the core Jay Aranha in the mission control room just behind us. Uh, the core, just as a reminder, it's kind of like Capcom. If you followed our missions throughout our history, that is really the sole person who's there to talk to Bob and Doug and be their advocate down here on the ground. Um, so as he said, we are still on track for a splashdown today in Pensacola. Uh, he gave a couple of those weather details. We're looking at wind speeds of about one knot, so just around a mile and a half per hour, and very calm seas out there. Weather was the thing we were really looking for. Um, and if you checked out some of the information we had online, we were looking for wind speeds less than about 10 miles an hour, so we're well under that for this splashdown today. We ended up getting pretty spectacular weather conditions for this. Um, obviously, some pretty nasty weather around Florida right now that a lot of people are having to deal with. Um, and three of our potential landing zones were actually in the path of that storm. Yeah, you, as you've heard us mentioned before, tropical storm or hurricane, as it was previously referred to before it got downgraded, uh, Isaia was creating a little bit of problem for us on the east coast of Florida. As, uh, like we mentioned before, three of our potential landing sites were there on the east coast, uh, ruled out due to unfavorable weather due to that tropical storm. Uh, but like we just mentioned, the Gulf of Mexico is looking really good. One mile an hour wind, that's like nothing. <laughs> and with really small waves, uh, Bob and Doug will be very comfortable and safe whenever uh, they do reach the Atlantic Ocean, uh, excuse me, the, the Gulf of Mexico. The other thing you heard called out there uh, was a generator problem that we're having on the recovery vessel. Uh, basically, there are two generators and one of them is down currently. So the team is working on a backup generator so that uh, there is no single point failure on the uh, from the gen generator aspect on the recovery ship. So working that in line, but all good news that everything will be in place on time for Bob and Doug's splashdown, which we're anticipating to be around 11.30 a.m. Pacific. Seems hard to believe that that's still so soon and yet so far away yeah, from right still, now. <laughs> still have a couple of hours, but weather is going to continue to hold, it looks like. Um, the, the system being on the east side or the eastern coast of Florida uh, has created some pretty favorable conditions for us in the Gulf. Uh, just to remind you, we do 
undock only when we had both a prime and an alternate. So we were able to get good weather. We have several pairings. Uh, since there are seven different landing zones, you have multiple pairings that you can have. So you could have uh, Pensacola as a prime and Panama City as a prime or Tampa as your alternate. Um, so you have a bunch of these different options. And we had several pairs uh, that were go uh, at that final go, no go meeting uh, just about six hours before undocking yesterday. Uh, the ones that we were able to select was Pensacola for our prime and Panama City for our alternate. If for some reason we did have to wave off today, Panama City would likely be our alternate. We still have about an hour, a little less than an hour, where Dragon has the capability to change that alternate uh, mid-flight um, if for some reason weather moved in on Panama City and took it out of the equation. Uh, but weather's still looking good at both sites, uh, most importantly, still looking good at our prime site today. Yeah, like we mentioned before, uh, all of these sites are determined based on the fact that they have to be accessible, uh, so relatively close to shore uh, by the recovery vessel, uh, and also close to medical facilities, uh, so that whenever Bob and Doug are uh, taken off the off the vessel that they're able to be close to a hospital and medical treatment if necessary. Uh, but like we said before, there were seven potential sites, three of them ruled out thanks to weather on the East Coast. Uh, and we are now targeting uh, the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Pensacola, Florida as our primary landing site. And once Bob and Doug splash down, it'll a lot of things are gonna happen in really quick succession. Uh, just to make sure that we can get the capsule out of the water and get them out of the capsule just as rapidly as possible. Uh, within minutes, actually, the teams here in Mission Control Hawthorne will actually uh, do a check on the vehicle systems following splashdown, and they'll give the go to the recovery teams to proceed. We expect that to be just within a minute or two of that splashdown. Uh, the SpaceX recovery personnel will put two fast boats, so smaller boats, uh, off of the prime recovery vessel, which itself is about three nautical miles away or so from the splashdown point, uh, which is about a 30-minute journey for the boat at the speed it travels. Uh, but those two fast boats will hit the water and move in quickly on the capsule once they get the go. Uh, one of the first jobs that they'll have is to go in and actually kind of sniff around the, the capsule itself, where they're looking for any trace signatures, vapors of what's known as hypergolic fuels. So Dragon uses hypergolic fuels. These are fuels that you don't need an ignition source to make them ignite. Basically, just throwing them together will create a, an explosion, which is what a, uh, a rocket engine firing really is, is that controlled explosion. Um, so they'll sniff around the capsule for any hypergolics. As long as that comes back a negative, uh, they can move in and start rigging the capsule itself to get lifted up, and I know that's going to be a pretty exciting operation to see. Yeah, there were actually somebody climbing on top of the capsule itself to perform that rigging. That individual is highly specialized and trained for that operation because, as you can imagine, climbing on top of an oddly shaped uh, capsule uh, in the ocean makes it wet, uh, and so having to get on top of there and secure the rigging in preparation for lifting onto the deck of the recovery ship, uh, that's a, quite a specific job, and that person has undergone hours and hours of training in order to perform those operations safely. So once that is all done, uh, the excuse me, the capsule will then be uh, lifted, hoisted up onto the deck of the recovery ship, and then they will be placed back down. But the will open the side hatch. So for international space station operations, we use the forward hatch or the, the hatch on top of the capsule in order to ingress and egress. For this particular operation of, of recovery, they will actually be coming out of the side hatch. Uh, once that side hatch is opened, our flight surgeon will pop his head in and make sure everything is good and that they're both feeling good. Uh, and then we'll pull Bob and Doug out and have them proceed to the medical tent. So something about these uh, recovery ships, they're actually fully equipped uh, medical facilities. Uh, Bob and Doug will both go through a, a little bit of a screening once, uh, once they're on deck. Uh, and then after that, they'll actually hop on an airplane and get sent back to, uh, excuse me, yeah, get sent back to Texas. <laughs> yeah, for most of our uh, splashdown locations, the crew gets taken off the boat in a helicopter. There is one uh, specific landing zone, and it's the one off Cape Canaveral, 
uh, which we were at kind of a further one for Demo 1. Demo 1, uh, we splashed down a little over 200, kilom- or 200 miles offshore. Uh, there's a closer one for crude landings, only about 24 miles offshore. Uh, but for all of our other landing zones, it takes probably several hours for the boat to get back into port. So uh, SpaceX does have the option to land a helicopter on the recovery vessel itself to then move the crew members uh, back for a much quicker uh, return to dry land, loading onto that NASA plane and returning uh, to Houston. Um, We get a lot of questions about how we're keeping the crew safe, how we're keeping the crew healthy. We have a lot of very strict protocols in place anytime we send people into space and anytime we bring them home um, as space flight can be pretty harsh on the body uh, even with all of the countermeasures that we have developed uh, a lot of astronauts will come back immunocompromised um, and so we really just have to make sure we're taking very good care of them uh, especially in our current climate with coronavirus we made uh, some additional res- restrictions and requirements in place um, for all of our recovery personnel that are going to be on the boat. All have gone through some isolation uh, and testing for uh, coronavirus before heading out to sea. And we're doing this. Anybody that's going to be in close contact with the crew, we're making sure that we have countermeasures in place to make sure uh, that they are screened and that the crew is being kept healthy. Uh, Once they get back to Houston, they'll be able to reunite with families um, and then eventually go home or go to crew quarters there in Houston. Yeah, so they're certainly looking forward to having their family reunion today. Uh, hopefully you caught their wake-up message earlier this morning, messages from both of their sons, uh, having them wake up. It sounds like there is a puppy in the future for one of our astronaut families, so <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> um, but something else to note about the recovery process is that all of this is, a, is going to take about an hour to do. We want to make sure that uh, we get the capsule out of the water as quickly as possible, but safely, uh, as well as uh, opening the hatch and and having Bob and Doug come out and wheeled into the the medical tents there. So all in all, it'll take about 60 minutes or so, and we're certainly looking forward to seeing all of that happen live. Uh, But backing up a little bit to the events that we have coming up sooner, uh, we will be performing a couple of maneuvers in order to get the, the vehicle in place and ready for its deorbit burn. Uh, that will take place and then we will close the nose cone in order to protect the, that top hatch. And then shortly after that, the vehicle will begin to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and then we will have parachute deployment. So all of that is gonna be happening around 11.30 a.m. Pacific. So uh, be sure to stick around as we prepare to step into the really exciting events of Splashdown Day. And throughout the morning and Leah and uh, Shiva were doing a great job of it overnight. We're going to be taking your questions on social media. If you have a question for us, jump on Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll try to get through as many as we can today. We do have a couple of hours until we really start picking up the operations, so we should have a chance to get through quite a few. I will take one right now. Uh, This one comes from Mogster, who wants to know roughly what speed are Bob and Doug going at splashdown? And it's quite a slowdown. Yeah, it certainly is. At the point of splashdown, they'll be going about 15 or 16 miles per hour. So that's about the speed that you go in your car whenever you're driving through a school zone. So that slow is uh, how slow that is, is the speed that they'll be uh, uh, landing in the Gulf of Mexico. A slowdown from 350 miles per hour uh, as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, and that's a slowdown from 17,500 miles per hour that they were traveling whenever they were orbiting Earth with the International Space Station. So they Pretty are, drastic. yeah, very, very drastic <laughs> indeed. Uh, we have another uh, um, Twitter question coming to us. Uh, it says, "I saw a video that Bob and Doug's suits were being pressurized in Dragon." Will it be pressurized during reentry? That's a great question. Uh, the the pressurization that you saw would have been during a leak check. That is the only point in which the the, the spacesuits are pressurized is whenever we're doing a leak check. We do those leak checks right after the crew puts their spacesuits on just to make sure that everything is zipped up properly because 
those zippers are very specialized in order to maintain that pressurization. Um, so if you got to make sure that everything is on right and everything is zipped up and we apply that pressurization in order to make sure that everything is fitting properly, we then depressurize and they're able to lift the visors on their helmets once again. Uh, and at that point, the suit is at the same pressure as the atmosphere within the cabin itself. Yeah, we'll, we'll only pressurize those suits, as Kate said, either when we're testing it or if we are in a situation where uh, the cabin loses pressure. So you can kind of think uh, on airlines they have procedures if the cabin loses pressure where they give you oxygen. Um, space, uh, a much more extreme environment where not only do we need to provide them oxygen, but we need to give them a pressurized environment and the suit's able to do that. Um, so they just leave one of the zippers open during the, the re-entry phase, and if they were in a situation where they were in a depress, they can pressurize it up. Uh, all right, we'll do one more. We got one from Mulvey Marathon who wants to know, is someone who needs my morning caffeine, wondering if Bob and Doug can start their day with a hot, hot, hot pouch of coffee? <laughs> That is also a good question. I am the same. I like my morning coffee. Unfortunately, there is no ability for Bob and Doug to heat their food or beverage in the Dragon capsule. Uh, so if coffee is part of the the packaging, the packaged food that they have, because uh, everything is pre-packaged, it is vacuum sealed so that it's easy to stow and easy to consume, uh, the coffee that they would have would be at room temperature coffee. Uh, so might not be the ideal type of coffee. Coffee, but it's safe to say that they'll be able to get their hot coffee in less than 24 hours. <laughs> All right. So, again, keep sending in those questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll continue to get them throughout our show this morning. We do need to take a moment, though, for those of you watching on YouTube, take a look at the comment section down below. We're going to be switching over our links. We need to uh, stop the broadcast momentarily on YouTube and start a new one just to make sure it gets archived correctly. So we'll be back live at that new location very shortly. If you're watching on NASA TV, no changes needed. Coverage stays interrupted all the way through Splashdown today. You won't notice a thing.
Hello and welcome to our live coverage of SpaceX Demo 2 mission. Uh, we are excited to be bringing you live coverage here from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is Kate Tice, a senior certification engineer, and it has been an exciting 24 hours. Uh, backtracking a little bit, Bob and Doug launched to the International Space Station just two months ago and earlier today departed from the International Space Station and began their journey home. They've completed all of the departure burns and they are now awake and ready to begin the day. So a couple of events that we have upcoming at 10.48 a.m. Pacific time, we will do what's known as SLU to trunk jettison attitude. And that's basically positioning the vehicle uh, in, proper, in its proper place in order to jettison that trunk. We want to expose the heat shield in preparation for capsule reentry. So we will, uh, we will separate from the trunk and that will be occurring at 10.51 a.m. Pacific time. We will then slew or maneuver to deorbit burn attitude. And that deorbit burn is what is going to really place Dragon on its final trajectory back to Earth. Yeah, once the engines fire on that deorbit burn, Dragon is committed to returning home. And that's what really adjusts their orbit to line them up straight with that splashdown zone right off the coast of Pensacola. And so we are expecting that deorbit burn. Uh, times have stayed pretty much solid throughout all the different burns that Dragon has done since it's left the International Space Station. Uh, we're expecting that burn at about 10.56 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1756 GMT. We'll try to give you guys a couple of split times here. Uh, that deorbit burn is expected to last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. It's executed primarily using the forward bulkhead thrusters on the very top of Dragon. There are four of them, and it'll alternate between uh, a couple of them during that deorbit burn. Also using uh, a number of the 12 service section Dracos just to maintain the proper attitude while those engines are firing. It's the longest burn of Dragon's trip home, and again, that's what really commits them. Once that deorbit burn is complete, they are re-entering re the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so after the completion of that deorbit burn, Dragon will look to close its nose cone. That's targeted to come at about 11, 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, or 1811 GMT. And closing up that nose cone is just under protect uh, the very top of Dragon where you have the docking ring, uh, some guidance, navigation, and control sensors, uh, and those four forward bulkhead thrusters uh, from the heat of reentry. This just helps to aid uh, in Dragon's reusability. Uh, this capsule in particular, already slated for another mission, it's going to be flying uh, the Crew 2 crew uh, next year. Uh, after we really start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, things will start heating up. The Dragon capsule experiencing up to 3,500 degrees uh, during this re-entry, and that'll build up a plasma around the spacecraft, and that'll result in what we call a comms blackout. Uh, there will be about six minutes where we can't talk to the crew on board Dragon, and we can't get any telemetry or data from the vehicle, and we can't send any commands from the ground. This is expected, and this is something that's common in spacecraft. When you're generating that much heat, it tends to interfere with those sensitive radio systems. Uh, so we're expecting that to last about six minutes. Dragon will continue flying itself using its three flight computers and the Draco thrusters on the service section to maintain a very precise attitude as it continues towards its splashdown point off the coast of Pensacola. Uh, in the middle of that comms blackout, we'll have something called entry interface. That's when Dragon's low enough in the atmosphere now that it's experiencing aerodynamic effects now. When you're flying around in the gravity of space, you don't experience lift drag, things like that, that you now have to worry about once you're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And once they get low enough, it's time for parachutes. Yeah, so first we're going to deploy our drogue parachutes. These are intended to uh, initially slow the, slow the vehicle down, but also stabilize it so that uh, just to, two minute or one minute after those drogue chutes deploy, we'll then release the main parachutes. So we'll have four beautiful orange and white parachutes, and those will also continue to, uh, to slow the capsule down significantly, uh, actually just to a mere 15 or 16 miles per hour uh, as it splashes down in the Gulf of Mexico. That splashdown will occur at 1148 a.m. Pacific or 1848 UTC, uh, and 
it's it's we're coming up to that here in a few hours so <laughs> be sure to stick with us as we will be bringing you coverage uh, all the way through that splashdown in addition to the recovery operations which you know if for our longtime SpaceX fans uh, there you know, the recovery team is really one that we haven't had a chance to showcase really since the last demo one mission uh, and so it's really great to see this new team in action uh, and and being able to perform live all of the stuff that they've been rehearsing with Bob and Doug for the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, we basically did a test run of this flight a little over a year ago at Demo 1. Uh, and Kate and I were here to do the splashdown for that one. Another early uh, morning. <laughs> another very early morning. Things looked a little bit different. Uh, SpaceX actually had both of its recovery ships out in the landing zone for DM-1, uh, both the Go Navigator and the Go Searcher. Um, for actual operations, though, those boats are split up. The Go Navigator stays in the Gulf of Mexico, at least for right now, uh, and it's responsible for any splashdowns at the four sites in the Gulf. Uh, those are Pensacola, Panama City, Tallahassee, and Tampa. Uh, and then the Go Searcher stays over on the Atlantic side for anything in the Cape, Jacksonville, and the one that I'm forgetting. I'll look it up. <laughs> uh, but those two boats are split up. At any time, one of them will be primed for the recovery operations. And there are about a little over 40 people on that ship to actually recover the Dragon spacecraft and Bob and Doug. And it's a, it's a SpaceX and NASA joint team with a lot of different personnel on board. You have people that are uh, experts in the Dragon capsule itself. Uh, you have the ship's crew. You have a number of uh, people from the medical community, uh, doctors from both SpaceX and flight surgeons from NASA, nurses, uh, and then you also have cargo specialists on board as Dragon's bringing some cargo home. Yeah. So if you followed our uh, our it, our missions to the International Space Station previously, you might hear us refer to as the maneuvering of Dragon around the station as a carefully choreographed dance. The recovery operations are just like that as well. Uh, the, whenever it comes to uh, recovering the crew, safety is the number one priority for not only the astronauts, but the recovery team and all individuals on board that recovery ship as well. So while there are 40 or so people on board, there definitely won't be 40 people on deck. <laughs> uh, it'll be a, a strict limitation to the personnel that are in the active recovery operations that will be on the on the deck, on the recovery deck of, of the ship as the, as the Dragon capsule is being lifted out of the water and into the nest. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to see that firsthand. Uh, we will be, like I said before, we'll be bringing you that coverage all the way through and uh, after Bob and Doug are brought out of the Dragon capsule. So once once the Dragon capsule is placed onto the recovery vessel in that nest, our flight surgeon will pop his head in and make sure that everything is looking and feeling good with uh, our astronauts, our space dads, and we will then have them exit the capsule through that side hatch. Uh, we will wheel them into the medical tents and they'll then get their in-depth medical review uh, with, the, with the medical team, and at which point they will then hop on a helicopter and head back to Texas. Yeah. And, I mean, all of that is supposed to unfold in just about an hour following splashdown. Within minutes of Dragon hitting down in the water, a lot of things will happen simultaneously. The Dragon capsule itself takes a number of automatic uh, steps. As soon as it detects that it's splashed down, uh, one of the first things that it does will be to detach the parachutes. Uh, as once you're splashed down, you don't need them to slow you down anymore, obviously. Um, and you don't want them dragging you through the water. So Dragon will automatically cut those main parachutes and they'll be so sitting there floating in the water. Uh, that's also one of the uh, actions the crew can take if they realize that the parachutes haven't detached. They have a hardwired button right there on their control panel to release those parachutes. Uh, within the first two minutes of splashdown, the teams will get the go to proceed in closer. Uh, the main recovery ship will be about three nautical miles away or so. Uh, and it'll deploy two fast boats that'll get to the capsule much quicker uh, within just those two minutes uh, after getting the go. Uh, the first boat will move in and do a sniff check around the Dragon capsule, checking for any vapors of hypergolic fuels used to power the Draco thrusters on board the vehicle. Uh, once they can verify that it's safe to approach, they can move in. Uh, as Kate was talking about, someone will climb up on the Dragon and uh, get it rigged. Uh, the second fast boat is basically a backup for everything that the first boat's doing, and they're also responsible for gathering those parachutes up out of the water. 
and then it'll take about 30 minutes until the main recovery vessel gets there, and then it's time to lift it up out of the water. Yeah, so at that point, uh, the ca capsule will be set onto the, the platform uh, of the recovery ship, and then we'll, like I said before, our flight surgeon will uh, do those initial checkouts. We'll pull Bob and Doug out, and then they will go into the medical tent. So like I said, that's all going to happen within about 60 minutes is, is our designated timeline for those operations, and we're really excited to see all of that unfold. It has been a very long morning night so far. Uh, we've been broadcasting for a few hours now, and I don't know about you, but I'm starting, you know, the more that we talk about the parachute deployment and just recalling what that looked and felt like for the Demo 1 broadcast, I'm, I'm, I'm getting really rejuvenated and really excited uh, to, to see that with our, our space dads on board. <laughs> And we should be able to show you a lot of the same things you saw for Demo 1. Again, it's a little bit different as for Demo 1, we had two ships out there in the same recovery zone. Um, so we were able to have uh, some of our camera assets, things like that on the other ship. Uh, now it's all on one. Um, but one of the first views we should be able to see uh, will be from a NASA high altitude research plane, the WB-57. It's going to be once again flying in the area of splashdown. For Demo-1, it was able to get us a, an infrared view of the capsule actually during that re-entry period. So when it was still glowing very brightly on the infrared as it was still generating and dissipating a lot of the heat of re-entry. Uh, able to see the drogue chute deploys and then the main deploys. And then we'll have some uh, cameras actually down on the boat on the water, hopefully getting us some great views of Dragon as it descends under those parachutes. Uh, so we are looking forward to that. Again, we have about six hours or so. Uh, until the actual splashdown, we're targeting that at 11.48 uh, a.m. Pacific, and I want to make sure 18.48 GMT. Yeah. So if you're just joining us, Bob and Doug have completed their eight-hour sleep shift. They woke up about an hour ago, an hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, they had a really nice greeting from their sons telling them to wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> and uh, they're now in their post-sleep phase where they're having their breakfast. Uh, they received their, um, basically, their informational update from the core here at SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne, California. And so far, everything is looking great or green, as we say, uh, for today's recovery operations. <laughs> Yeah. And so as we continue to monitor the operations today, we do want to keep taking your questions on social media. So we've got a couple that we're going to get through right now. Remember, if you want to ask us a question, get on Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA. First one comes from Jeff, who wants to know, is Dragon naturally buoyant, or would the ship sink if they open the capsule in the water? It would not. Uh, Dragon is designed to stay afloat for at least 24 hours. Um, if not beyond that, but the requirement was just to make sure for 24 hours. It has a ballast system to make sure it's upright in the water following the splashdown. Um, and if the crew had to get out of the capsule before they get on the boat, they have practiced those operations as well. Uh, one of the things that we do so often with spaceflight is practice for when things don't go according to plan. We do it uh, through simulations, through practices in the field, through test flights like we did last year. Um, so Dragon capable of getting the crew out of the water, but that's not our nominal plan. Uh, the plan is to get them out of the capsule once it's already on the ship, much more stable environment, a lot easier. You're not bobbing around in the ocean uh, by that point. Yeah, absolutely. So our next question coming to us from Tardigrads. Uh, the question is, how fast will the capsule initially enter our atmosphere? Well, the capsule, uh, whenever it departs the International Space Station, initially is going 17,500 miles per hour, thereabouts. Uh, whenever it is re-entering our atmosphere, it will actually be slowing down to about 350 miles per hour, partially due to the atmosphere itself. That friction building up on the exterior of the capsule will bring the exterior temperature to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is an indication that, that the, the, the atmosphere and the oxygen is actually impacting the capsule and slowing it down. Um, we also have, like we mentioned before, the parachutes that will also further decelerate the vehicle from 350 miles per hour to a mere 15, 16 miles per hour whenever it touches down on the ocean floor. All right, our next question comes from Arash who wanted to know, is Crew Dragon Endeavor reusable? It is, and in fact, it's already got a mission signed up 
in its future. It's going to be flying the Crew 2 crew, uh, which we're targeting for some time next year. Uh, it'll be another international contingent heading up to the International Space Station. We'll have two NASA astronauts on board, Shane Kimbrough, who's going to be making another long-duration stay on board the International Space Station, mm -hmm. and Megan MacArthur, uh, who had previously flown on STS-125, where she did all of the robotics the last time we repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. And they're going to be joined by two international crew members as well. Indeed. So our next question comes to... I was going to say, I can what? say who they are. Right oh, quick. go for it. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be European Space Agency astronaut Tama Pesuke and Japanese astronaut Aki Hoshide. So another international crew heading up on a Dragon. Our first international crew is actually slated to launch no later than uh, next sep or this September. This September. Mm -hmm. Yes. So again, we are taking your questions through the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. Our next question comes to us from Suraj. The question is, why is the nose cone hatch still open? Great question, also very observant. Uh, that nose cone is currently still open because underneath it are rest the four forward bulkhead thrusters, basically meaning those Draco engines that sit at the top of the Dragon capsule, we will be utilizing those to perform the deorbit burn uh, in order to place Dragon on its final trajectory back to Earth. So we can't close the nose cone until we're done using those Draco thrusters uh, because we don't want to damage the nose cone. So we'll wait until that, uh, excuse me, we'll wait until the deorbit burn is performed and then we will close and lock the nose cone in preparation for reentry. All right, our next question comes from that girl and already calling for a graphic. The next time you show the orbit map, can you explain what and where things are, especially the lines and the dragon? So if we can pull up the ground track real quick, uh, what you'll see is pretty much two lines. And dragon itself is on that dot right in the middle of your screen. So it looks like it just passed over Greece and is heading towards the northeast, about to head out over Eastern Europe central Russia and eventually right over central China. Those lines are Dragon's current orbit. So if you chase, if you trace the line from the right of Dragon and continue, you'll see it eventually meets up on the other side of the Earth and then it stops. If you watch the point where it stops, that'll continue to fill in as their orbit continues to go. So this is essentially showing about two orbits of planet Earth. And your question, your next question might be, why is it a wavy line? Is Dragon kind of flying all over the place? And that's because the map is spread uh, flat. Uh, if you were to actually look at Dragon's orbit on a globe of Earth, it would look like a straight line, but the Earth continues to revolve underneath Dragon. So every time it completes an orbit of the Earth, it's the, the Earth is still turning, so its orbit moves slightly to the left and it continues to move slightly to the left every single time it completes an orbit of planet Earth. This is actually how we figure out where we're going to be coming home and what orbit we need to get Dragon into specifically. So by the time that it's in the right orbit, it'll line itself up perfectly with Pensacola, which is where we're coming home today. Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, you might also notice that the lines are yellow and red. Uh, the yellow lines indicate where the capsule is exposed to sunlight, and the red lines would ex would indicate where it would be uh, not in the sun's light or in eclipse, as we would refer to it as. So really great question. Thanks for asking that one. Our nef next question comes from Jeff. Will there be any live views from inside the capsule before and during re-entry and splashdown? Also another great question. Yes, we will be bringing you uh, views from the capsule where we can. Like we mentioned before, there is an expected loss of signal or, or a blackout period where we are unable to communicate or receive telemetry or video from the capsule. Uh, we expect that to last for about six minutes. Uh, but here and there, we will be able to bring you uh, uh, footage from the capsule as we're able to receive. It. So excited to see Bob and Doug along for the ride. All right, our next question comes from AJ Nico, who wants to know, is the hatch opening automatic or manual? What kind of system makes sure the hatch opens safely and properly? Uh, it is a manual hatch opening. Um, you can open the hatch on either side of the capsule itself. Um, and it's 
got a number of different locks and mechanisms in place to make sure you're not accidentally opening up the hatch. Uh, you can kind of think of it uh, like the escape doors on an airplane where you have to go through nice. several steps before you can actually, uh, there's not just a handle to turn and open it. Uh, you have to go through several steps to physically open the hatch. And there are a, are a number of different configurations in the vehicle you can do to make hatch opening easier. Uh, like one thing they can do following splashdown is actually increase the pressure inside of Dragon's cabin. So it's at a higher pressure than what is outside of the capsule. And that makes the crew's job of opening the capsule hatch outward much easier. Um, so it's kind of, there's some little things that you don't necessarily think about, uh, but it is always a manual process. Mm. Next question comes to us from Klaus. Question is, what is the difference between the capsule suits and the ones used for EVA or extravehicular activity? Yeah, so those EVA suits used on the International Space, Space Station are famously used for spacewalks. Personally, one of my favorite things to watch on NASA TV are those spacewalks. Uh, those suits are designed to operate in the vacuum of space, whereas our, our flight suits for inside Crew Dragon are not. So we won't be performing any EVA suits in these ones. How However, they are designed to protect the crew in the event of a depressurization event. Um, the face shields come, are able to come down and lock, and we are able to pressurize the suits themselves uh, in order to protect the crew in the unlikely event of a depressurization. Uh, that being said, that's the primary difference why while they're both white and uh, they're both pretty good looking in their own ways, uh, one is much bulkier and that is because, you know, those EVA suits are designed to essentially do that hard exterior work uh, of, on the ISS external in the in the vacuum of space. Yeah, they're also kind of carrying their atmosphere with them. Yeah. With the Dragon suit, you have an umbilical to plug it into the seats. Um, and we have a great video that uh, we've showed a couple of times tonight where a SpaceX suit engineer describes it as kind of a suit seat system um, where the suit's able to plug in and draw all of that breathing gas and uh, cooling air, uh, whereas those big bulky EMUs, it's all in their backpack where they bring out all of their breathing gas, their water, uh, which is not only used for drinking for the astronauts, but also for keeping them cool while they're working outside in space. Um, our next question comes from Max, who wanted to know, do they control the landing location of the ship in any way? If so, how? Uh, the astronauts themselves are not, as again, Dragon is flying autonomously, uh, but what we're able to do is actually calculate where Dragon uh, will have an opportunity to splash down, and then we're able to give those calculations to the flight computer so it can then build out what's called a burn plan. Um, you've heard us talk about burns quite a bit, departure burns and phasing burns and the deorbit burn, uh, where the vehicle will itself calculate when I need to fire these engines and how long I need to fire them for to line myself up exactly where I want to splash down. It's incredibly complicated, um, and only people like Kate are able to do stuff like that. Um, but it's it, the, the crew is largely out of the loop for those. It's mostly done. Uh, with a lot of support here down on the ground uh, and the Dragon spacecraft itself. Exactly. Yeah, Bob and Doug's primary role during uh, the re-entry phase will simply to be monitoring the status and the telemetry uh, that is being displayed on their heads-up display there, which I love that view that we get inside of the capsule where we can actually see the screens that they're looking at. Yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. The, those screens are touch screen. And kind of going back to the, the question of the suits, uh, our flight suits for inside Crew Dragon are capable of interacting with that touch screen. They are capacitive, so uh, Bob and Doug are able to utilize a really high-tech uh, and easy-to-use screen as opposed to, if you think back, to if you've ever seen like a, an, uh, the flight deck of an airplane, or if you think back to the flight deck, uh, the control pan panels in the space shuttle where there were a lot of buttons and switches. Uh, now that that screen is flat, and we're also able to simply uh, rotate the the data that we are to be that's being displayed, uh, depending on what phase of the mission that we're in. So it also cuts down on the bulkiness, uh, the uh, yeah, the bulkiness of of the display itself, because we're able to configure and specialize. Um, exactly what's being shown depending on what's going on. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll get to a couple more questions in just a second. If you're just tuning in, though, welcome. 
Uh, we're about to bring Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley home from their stay on board the International Space Station. They're flying in Crew Dragon Endeavor. They've woken up on board the spacecraft. They're just finishing up their post-sleep, and they'll not have a whole lot to do over the next couple of hours until we really start getting into the meat of the operations. And that's going to start when we get ready to separate the trunk from the Dragon spacecraft. Yeah, and that's coming up in almost five hours exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> little bit of ways to go. So we've got some time. Uh, that cl that trunk separation is immediately preceded by something called the claw separation, uh, and that's just the uh, the attachment uh, fixture between the trunk and the capsule itself. And just to run down some quick times for you again real quick, we're expecting that claw separation at about 10.51 a.m. Pacific or 17.51 GMT, and then uh, just less than 50 seconds later at 10.51 and 54 seconds, the trunk itself will separate from Dragon, and that trunk eventually burns up in the Earth's atmosphere. And then after that, it's on to deorbit burn. Yeah, so we'll perform the deorbit burn. That'll last about 11 and a half minutes. That burn is what is going to place Dragon on its final trajectory to the landing zone off of the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, like we said before, they're splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico today. Uh, once we perform the deorbit burn, we will then close and lock the nose cone as we no longer need to expose those um, uh, forward Dracos that uh, are used in order to perform the the excuse me, in order to perform to perform the deorbit burn. Uh, after that, we will have re-entry of the capsule back into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, at that point, plasma will be building up on the exterior of the capsule. It will be reaching uh, an external temperature of about 3,500 degrees. Bob and Doug will stay very comfortable uh, with a temperate climate inside of the capsule. The, we have a system that flushes cold nitrox air uh, both into their suits as well as the cabin environment. Uh, nitrox, of course, is just nitrogen and oxygen. It is the air that we breathe. Uh, it's also, if you've ever been scuba diving, that's what's in your scuba tank. So Bob and Doug will be getting a lot of this cold nitrox in order to keep them comfortable during that reentry phase. Uh, the capsule will be slowing down from a excuse me, from a speed of 17,500 miles per hour to about 350 miles per hour uh, when we begin to deploy those parachutes. Yeah, first out will be the drogue chutes. There will be two of those, and they'll do some initial slowing inside the Earth's atmosphere uh, and really stabilization of the Dragon capsule. Um, they'll deploy, they'll reef just once after they come out, and we'll be under those drogues for a little bit less than a minute, and then immediately following their detachment, the main parachutes will deploy. And there'll be four much larger parachutes that'll reef in two different stages, and they'll do all of the final slowing. Those drogue parachutes will come out at about 350 miles an hour of vehicle speed when they're about 18,000 feet in altitude. And then by the time the mains come out, they've already slowed down to 119 miles an hour, with those coming out at about 6,500 feet in altitude. Uh, they'll then be under the main parachutes, uh, which we expect to deploy at about 11.45 a.m. Pacific time, 18.45 GMT. And they'll be under those chutes for a little more than three minutes before they splash down at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 GMT. Yeah, they'll be going only 15, 16 miles per hour when they do make that splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, as I've mentioned before, this reentry phase will get them about 4 Gs. They'll be experiencing about 4 Gs while they're sitting in their seat. We, they also experienced about 4 Gs on the ascent phase or during the launch phase of the mission. So really nothing that they haven't already experienced. Also, they've gone through both of them being test pilots and having flown on shuttle missions, have gone through extensive physical training as well. Uh, so I, they're pretty well equipped to ride what is basically a pretty moderate uh, roller coaster. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they'll be making that splashdown. Uh, let me just check my timing here. Yeah, uh, at 11.48 a.m. Pacific time or 18.48 uh, UTC. So we are expecting that to all happen here uh, in less than six hours. <laughs> Yeah, and they are awake. They did get uh, an initial kind of systems rundown from Jay Aranha. He's the core inside of Mission Control Hawthorne right behind us. And as he said, we're not tracking any issues on Dragon. Dragon's been healthy uh, from before on dock all the way through its flight. 
and continues to be healthy for that deorbit burn a little bit later this morning. Uh, the only item of note that we had was uh, with the recovery ship with the generator, but we're already hearing that that backup generator is on dock and being loaded on. So everything looking good for Go Navigator to make its way out to that splashdown zone this morning. Yeah, so all really good stuff happening so far, and we're looking forward to a really exciting few hours here coming up. Again, we are continuing to take your questions through the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. Uh, so we'll go to our next question. It comes from Christina. How long will it take for Bob and Doug to be able to walk normally after floating for so long in space? It, it definitely varies from, from astronaut to astronaut. Um, every, everybody is different. And everybody tends to react to coming home from space a little bit different. Um, and you can even have differences from if you flew a short duration shuttle mission and then you fly a longer duration, your body could react differently. And it can be pretty difficult uh, to walk once you get on uh, back into a gravity environment. Your vestibular system, which controls your balance and your, your range of motion and everything like that, can really take a hit uh, when you're going from a zero or a microgravity environment back to a gravity. So some crew members able to walk immediately out of the capsule. Some takes a couple hours until they really get their feet steady beneath them. Um, so it really does vary. Uh, but again, we're extremely safety conscious when it comes to bringing these crew members home. Uh, so we always make sure we have plenty of personnel, trained medical officials uh, there with them just to make sure they're safe um, with their return uh, from space. Absolutely. Uh, something else to note, the astronauts while on board the International Space Station, in addition to doing spacewalks and lots and lots of science experiments and eating and sleeping, they also do a significant amount of exercise in order to keep their bodies in tip-top shape while they are experiencing a microgravity environment. Uh, as Dan just said, it, it everybody is affected differently, but one thing is for sure, lots of exercise while in space ha is able to counteract those effects. So even though uh, it might seem like they're going to the International Space Station and having a leisurely time hanging out in the cupola and taking pictures of planet Earth rotating below, they actually have action-packed schedules and exercises as a really big piece of that. Uh, going to our next question coming from Twitter, uh, comes to us from Ridge Runner. Has the tropical storm influenced the landing site? Yes, absolutely. So tropical storm or Hurricane Isaia, it was recently downgraded back to a tropical storm, but it has definitely impacted our choices for landing site. Uh, we are, Dragon Capsule is capable of landing on either the west coast or the east coast of Florida. We have two identical recovery ships on either coast uh, that is ready and able to support. The decision on where to land actually isn't made until just a few, uh, excuse me, a few hours prior to uh, departure from the ISS. So it's important that both coasts have the ability to be able to support. Um, but the the opportunity that we had for this particular mission, we had seven potential landing zones picked out, and due to that tropical storm, it ruled out all three located on the eastern coast of Florida. So that made decision-making pretty clear that we were going to select from our Gulf Coast sites. And after a couple days of evaluation, not only of wind speeds, but also thunder and lightning storms, in addition to wave slope degrees, uh, as whenever you land in the ocean, uh, you're subjected to, of course, the wind as well as the the condition of the seas itself. All of those things taken into con consideration to make sure that landing is safe and as comfortable as possible for Bob and Doug. So yeah, I would say that that tropical storm certainly had a major impact. But fortunately, uh, today's conditions, anticipated conditions for splashdown, are going to be very mild, if not picture perfect, with a very low degree uh, slope of those waves and just barely one mile per hour wind yeah we we got extremely lucky we've had to kind of dodge around weather a bunch with this mission for those that remember the launch we got all the way down to just kind of the final minutes before launch and had to scrub uh, just because of some storms in the area and that things were <laughs> not looking great earlier this week um, and then we just kind of hit that lucky window. That's why the teams will continue to go down all the way to just the final hours before we undock uh, to try and preserve these opportunities because weather around Florida, very dynamic. You just really never know. 
Um, our next question comes from Jasmine, who wants to know which is more stressful, launch day or splashdown day? <laughs> Um, that's kind of a personal question. I don't really know which one I'm usually more stressed about. Um, I think Splashdown Day kind of feels like it lasts longer, launches something that's over so quick. Uh, you either you, you did it or you didn't. Exactly. Um, Splashdown Day, we, we have a little bit more time. Things take a little bit longer. Um, it, I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. Yeah, I, it's, it's something I noticed in the interviews that Bob and Doug have been performing on station for the last couple of weeks. Uh, they're not stressed about anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're they're cool cats up there, uh, you know, and that's partially attributed to not only their personalities, uh, but also the fact that they have done extensive training with the NASA and SpaceX teams in preparation for every element of this mission, uh, everything from... The, the phases that you go through prior to launch, to launch itself, to ascent, docking, all of the mission operations while actually on station and completing the mission objectives for this demonstration mission, and then, of course, undocking and reentry. Uh, they've they've done it all. They're yeah. they're not. It doesn't. I never got the impression that they were stressed about anything. My personal response would be, I think, a similar splashdown is has is a little bit more dynamic in terms of to the total timeline. Uh, also, it's just you know it's just so exciting that knowing that we're bringing our space dads home today. <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from Megan, who wants to know what the difference is between zero gravity and microgravity. It's it's a good thing to pick up on because it's something that gets kind of confused between the two very easily. For sure. Um, on board the International Space Station and Bob and Doug right now, what they're experiencing is, is microgravity. Um, so they are actually subject to the Earth's gravity right now almost the exact amount that we are. When you're on the International Space Station, you're subject to more than 90 percent of the Earth's gravity. The reason it seems like everything floats for them is because they are in microgravity, and that's because they're in a constant state of free fall. You can actually mimic the exact environment that they have just on an airplane um, if you fly in a parabola that has an exact deceleration rate as the rate of gravity going down. And uh, one of the easiest ways to kind of visualize it is if you were to stand on a hill and throw a ball as hard as you could, that ball would eventually go out and then it would come back down to earth. And the harder you threw that ball, the further it would go. Now, if you could throw that ball so fast that it was able to just keep going and going and going, that's essentially what they're doing. They're moving at a speed so fast that even though they're falling, they're moving forward too fast to ever hit the ground. So you're in a constant state of free fall, and that's why they experience microgravity. Zero gravity would be the actual absence of gravity. So you would have to be much further away from something uh, like planet Earth, which has a very big gravitational pull, as it is a very large object. Yeah, great question. Uh, good ears picking up on, yeah. on the difference there. Next question comes from Jason. Will the plasma trail be visible in daylight? Ooh, that's a great question. So what Jason is referring to there is the plasma that will be building up on the exterior of the capsule as it is re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I'm actually not sure if it will be visible to the naked eye because it, it will be some distance away from the, the coast of Florida. So I'm not sure if folks on land will be able to see it. Uh, that being said, we will certainly have, we'll be able to provide visual of that. We will have a thermal camera uh, mounted on our WB-57 plane, which will be bringing us live views as it is re-entering. So we will certainly be seeing that plasma tail for sure. Uh, but in terms of being able to see it with the naked eye, I, I don't believe so because, like mentioned, it will be occurring in the daylight. All right, so we're going to continue taking those questions throughout. Again, just keep using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, if you're just now tuning in, things haven't quite picked up yet, but Bob and Doug are awake on board Dragon Ship Endeavor uh, and awaiting uh, really just all of the activities that are coming up in a couple of hours. And we'll run down a couple of key times for you just to know when it's really time to pay attention when <laughs> things are heating up. Um, so we're going to start off the operations a little bit later today with our trunk separation. 
And this is when we'll essentially split Dragon into two different pieces. Uh, the trunk will detach from the capsule. The trunk burns up in the Earth's atmosphere, exposing the capsule's heat shield for its eventual re-entry. Uh, before the trunk can separate, we need to get Dragon in the appropriate attitude uh, and do something called a slew, which is just a maneuver uh, to correctly orient Dragon for that trunk separation. Uh, that's scheduled to take place at 10.48 a.m. Pacific, 17.48 GMT, um, just a little under five hours from now. Uh, then the claw will separate. Uh, this is what actually connects the trunk and through a number of fluid um, and other quick disconnects to the Dragon capsule itself. That claw will separate, followed shortly after by the trunk itself, and we're looking for that trunk separation at 10.51 a.m. Pacific, 17.51 GMT. Yeah, so after we get that separation, we will then position the vehicle into the appropriate attitude to begin that deorbit burn. Excuse me. The deorbit burn will last about 11 and a half minutes, and that deorbit burn is what will be placing Dragon on its final trajectory, really pointing it home uh, to its landing spot off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico. So once that deorbit burn is completed, we will then note that that's not actually the reentry reentry phase. Uh, that's just the trajectory positioning. Uh, the nose cone will be closing at 11 11 a.m. The Forward bulkhead thrusters, the forward Dracos, are what will be used to perform that previous deorbit burn. So once those are no longer needed, they'll be safe and we'll lock the nose cone and make sure that that forward hatch located there uh, is well protected for the reentry. The capsule will then begin to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and at 11.36 a.m. Pacific or 1836, 18.36 Universal, uh, we will have a, an expected communications blackout. Uh, like I said, there will be plasma building up on the exterior of the vehicle as it will be reaching temperatures towards 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so we will have a communications blackout period or loss of signal, and that will last about six minutes. During that time, we won't be able to command the vehicle or uh, or receive telemetry. That being said, Dragon is designed to be fully autonomous, so it's driving itself anyway. Uh, at 11.36 a.m. in the middle of that communications blackout, we will have entry interface. This is when the capsule is essentially beginning to feel the aerodynamic forces of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll get those communications back at 11.40 42 a.m. Pacific or 1842 Universal. Uh, we'll get those communications back and we'll do a comms check with Bob and Doug, make sure that they're doing good and feeling okay. And then at 11.44 a.m. Pacific, we will begin the parachute deployment. So we'll deploy the drogue parachutes, those three parachutes that are designed to initially slow, begin, continue to slow the vehicle down. Uh, they, will, they will also stabilize the vehicle so that we are prepared for the main parachute deploy. Those main chutes will come out at 11.45 a.m. Pacific on the dot, or 18.45 Universal. Uh, those main parachutes will further decelerate the, the vehicle uh, down to about 15 or 16 miles per hour, and uh, at that point, we'll have splashdown, and we'll be looking to confirm that at 11.48 a.m. Pacific. So once splashdown occurs, uh, the recovery team will move into place and uh, you know really have the moment where we get to pull our space dads uh, and welcome them back to Earth. Yeah, it's only expected to take about an hour from the moment of splashdown until we have them out of the capsule on the boat. Uh, a number of things have to happen before that takes place. Uh, within about the first minute and a half to two minutes, uh, Mission Control Hawthorne, so the flight controllers right behind us, will give the recovery teams the go to proceed uh, as they're still getting telemetry or data from the spacecraft even after it splashes down. They're able to make sure that we don't have any fuel leaks or anything like that and just make sure things are as safe as possible before additional personnel approach the capsule. Uh, they, there will be two boats that go in, two fast approach boats. The first one will get there and do a sniff around the capsule for what's called hypergols, hypergolic fuel uh, that's used to uh, power the Draco thrusters around the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, after they're done with that sniffing, uh, the second boat will be able to move in. It acts as a redundant boat for that first fast approach boat and is also responsible for getting the parachutes out of the water. 
Uh, following all of that work, they'll give the go for the main recovery vessel to move in. It'll be waiting just about three nautical miles away from the splashdown point. So it'll take about 30 minutes for it to arrive at the capsule. Uh, then it'll be time for the hoisting maneuvers. So while the boat is approaching, uh, SpaceX professional will climb on top of Dragon and affix some rigging structure uh, to the very top of the capsule, which is going to be grappled uh, by a crane, a hydraulic crane on the very back of the recovery ship Go Navigator to lift Dragon out of the water and put it in the nest. And then it's time to move the nest underneath the helipad and get the crew out. Yeah, so a number of individuals will be uh, helping to position the Dragon capsule and uh, will open the side hatch. Our flight surgeon will check in with Bob and Doug before they even unstrap or anything like that, make sure they're feeling all right. Uh, and then we will have Bob and Doug egress from the capsule. Uh, and then we will cart them into the medical tent. So uh, it's going to be a really exciting morning. Just a quick note about what you saw on your screen there a couple minutes ago. Uh, we just had a shift handover here at Mission Control Headquarters in Hawthorne, California. So our phasing shift team is now allowed to go home, rest. They deserve it, that's for sure. Uh, and now our entry team is in position and ready to support uh, the reentry and splashdown phase uh, here from Mission Control. And yeah, we've still got a couple of hours until we get into all of that. Right now, though, Bob and Doug are awake on board uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor. They were woken up at 4.40 a.m. Pacific time uh, from a really special message from their young boys uh, who I know are excited to get them back. And they'll be reunited with them and once they make their way back to Ellington Airfield in Houston uh, following a successful splashdown today. Uh, there's been quite a bit of activity down here on the ground, though. I know we just had uh, some teams changing out inside of Mission Control Hawthorne behind us, which is why you can see a few more people in there. Um, just like control rooms around the world, the teams here operate in these different shifts, as when you have crew members in outer space, you're responsible for watching over them and the systems of your spacecraft 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and so they're going to be operating in three different shifts, typically about eight and a half to nine hours each. So you have a bit of overlap where you're doing what we call handover, uh, where you're just kind of going over what occurred in the shift before you, what, what you need to really be looking out for, what's coming up, what, what is on your schedule as you, I, I hand you my console and it's your turn to take over. Exactly. Like we mentioned before, uh, in terms of scheduling operations, with in particular for the crew, sleep is really important for more dynamic aspects of the mission like splashdown and recovery. We want them to be really alert and awake. Uh, so scheduling sleep is really important for the crew schedule, equally as important for our uh, dragging controllers and operators here in mission controls. So uh, that's what you just saw on your screen there was the, the handing of the baton, if you will as the two different shifts now are getting into place and working to get ready to support the rest of the events for today. And we'll have uh, plenty to come up for us in a couple of hours. Again, we're just really counting down until we get to deorbit burn. Um, there will be a couple of steps before that with trunk jettison and everything like that. Uh, but for now, Dragon continue to, continuing to fly in orbit over planet Earth. Uh, we are just a little over five hours away, five and a half hours away from our anticipated splashdown. Yeah, that first event that we have coming up will be claw separation. Uh, that is in preparation to jettison the trunk. And we are four hours and 38 minutes away from that. So we hope you stick with us uh, as we continue to bring coverage of everything going on so far. Like Dan said, uh, Bob and Doug are awake and they are completing their post-sleep phase. Although I guess they're probably out of it by now since it's been more than an hour since they've been wake, woken up. Uh, but yeah, so they are getting ready to come on home and we're looking forward to having them. All right, and we are continuing to take your questions on Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. I think we can get through a couple more real quick right now. Uh, this one comes from Ganga Prabha, who wants to know, will Dragon take more than two astronauts in the future? It absolutely will, in fact, in the very near future. Uh, we're already counting down the days once this mission is complete to Crew-1. That will be the first operational flight in a Crew Dragon spacecraft, and there will be four crew members on board. And it will be our first multinational crew to fly on this new capable vehicle. 
Uh, we'll have to do some work between the end of Demo 2 and that flight just to get everything certified and ready to go. But that crew has already been in training for several months, even years now for a couple of them. Um, and we're looking forward to them flying as early as late September. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I've been at SpaceX for five and a half years now. And uh, to be able to say that we're coming up to our first fully operational mission is is incredible. Uh, yeah, I, my, my job is to work the certification element of our human space flight with NASA. And it's just mind boggling and um, that we're at the point where for so many years we've been getting ready for things like Demo 1 and Demo 2. And the fact that Crew 1 is knocking on our doorstep already is amazing. Uh, it's it's a really exciting time. <laughs> All right, our next one comes from Annie who wants to know, is the Crew Dragon trunk reusable? That's a good question. Uh, right now it is not. Uh, it would be Amazing to have a 100% reusable vehicle. Of course, the first stage and the inner stage, uh, we have a number of flight-proven uh, missions for our first first stage and inner stage. Uh, unfortunately, the trunk is not something that we are able to reuse. We will be reusing the Dragon capsules themselves, uh, but after the after Dragon capsule uh, separates from the International Space Station uh, as it prepares for re-entry, we will jettison that trunk and it will disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere as it re-enters. Um, we do this because we need to expose the heat shield at the bottom of the Dragon capsule in order to uh, you know, have a, a safe landing. Um, also, the trunk is responsible for carrying the solar panels, uh, which provide power to the Dragon capsule throughout flight. So since we will be coming home soon and even in the event of a wave off scenario where we have to delay after departure from the International Space Station and uh, we have to delay for you know whatever reason that that trunk would still be able to provide uh, provide the uh, necessary power through those solar panels um, but yeah so the short answer is the drunk dragon the Dragon trunk is not reusable at this point, although that would be nice because we would have to build it. Dragon for inventory. Go ahead, Dragon with the inventory. Hey, Solo, good to hear your voice this morning. Uh, let's start with location nine. So from bag 204, we consumed two additional water, so bag 204 is now empty. From location 10, we consumed two more waters from 208, so bag 208 is now empty, and then one additional from 207. So 207 has uh, two water bottles remaining. Okay, SpaceX copies bag uh, 204, took away two waters, which is now empty. Bag 208, two waters down, now empty. And uh, bag 207, one water down and two remaining. Good read back for location 12 from bag 315, one breakfast. I'm sorry, from location 11, bag 315, one breakfast. And then from location 12, bag 319, one breakfast. Okay, Bob, we copy uh, one breakfast down from bag 315 and uh, one breakfast down from bag 319. It is also great to uh, hear you guys as well, and I request to come back aboard uh, when you're able. Okay, so uh, we'll give you a call here in just a couple minutes uh, to come back on board. Okay, fantastic, thanks, Bob. All right, so that exchange, that that exchange right there, real quick, was really just an inventory. Uh, believe it or not, one of the hardest things about spaceflight is just keeping track of everything. Um, things tend to float around and get lost in microgravity pretty easily. There's a couple of stories of wanted posters for items on board the International <laughs> Space Station when they go missing, uh, and even on the station, which much bigger than just the Crew Dragon itself, they have very 
uh, intricate system to track everything through RFID and very meticulous ground annotations like we were just hearing read off. So if a crew member ever gets in a situation where they need to find something, you have people dedicated here on the ground who will know exactly where that is. It always kind of blows me away when they can, you can give them an item and they can tell you it's in this rack, in this bag, this is also in that bag. This is what this is exactly where, where you will find it. Yeah, that would be a very extensive list, especially for the items on board the International Space Station. Uh, what they were reporting there was essentially what they've consumed, both liquid and food, uh, over the last couple of hours, just documenting their fluid intake and uh, the meal consumption. Also, that to translate that request to come back on board, uh, that is requesting permission to let the cameras turn back on, of course, for privacy reasons uh, during the sleep phase. And and their wake up, um, the the post sleep phase, the, as they're waking up and stretching their legs, the cameras are turned off for the crew privacy. So that was just our core here in Mission Control requesting uh, to have those cameras turned back on. So hopefully we get some views over their shoulder or just inside the cabin in just a little bit. Uh, but again, for for Bob and Doug, they're they're finishing up that post sleep period. Um, and so they're really just going to be kind of getting getting their house in order, really getting Dragon ready for that reentry. Uh, they'll have some steps uh, just to get suited up and get positioned into the Dragon space inside Dragon itself, uh, where they're going to be monitoring uh, the the D orbit burn, all the different events on their touchscreen displays. They're going to be able to see changes in orbit, changes in velocity all just the really critical uh, bits of data to tell them how the performance of these burns and these different activities are going. Uh, they're going to be able to tell exactly what orbit they're on and see when it lines up with the coast or with the ocean just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida a little bit later. Um, they'll largely be in a monitor mode as Dragon is designed to fly autonomously uh, and kind of guide itself back, but they are in the loop essentially, where they could jump in and be that backup capability if required. Yeah, as Dan said, that they'll be putting their suits back on here shortly. Uh, we only have them wear the suits for the more dynamic phases uh, whenever they are inside the capsule. So obviously we want them to have that on uh, as they re-enter the atmosphere. So they'll put it on well before we begin those deorbit, uh, those deorbit sequences. Uh, that being said, uh, they were able to sleep. Therefore, they were able to sleep not in their in their suits uh, and comfortably in their chairs with a little bit more wiggle room there. Um, something else to note that we have coming up, uh, hopefully, we'll, like Dan said, we'll get some of those camera views uh, coming from inside the cabin. And uh, we'll, like I mentioned before, something that I really like being able to see is the, the shot between the two of them looking at the actual display panels themselves. Uh, we'll actually be able to see what they're seeing on their screens as they are monitoring all the telemetry and data and attitude information uh, as the capsule is re-entering the atmosphere. So we are going to continue to take your questions through hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. Our next question comes from Christian. What ensures that the capsule does not melt upon re-entry? Please explain the thermal protection. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one, one of my personal favorite pieces of hardware on our Dragon capsules is the heat shield. Uh, part of my job is to work with NASA to certify the heat shield, and so I am very lucky that I get to work. Dragon, uh, you're cleared to come aboard any time. All right. All right. Okay, Doug, copy, uh, welcome aboard. We should get that in work shortly. Um, in addition, uh, as able, when you're ready, request your game plan for fluid loading water. This corresponds to section three of 4.700. Okay, Doug, we have a so that call out that we heard there was inviting us to turn the cameras back on inside the capsule. Okay, I think our plan is uh, as prescribed. Um, and then I will be drinking water out of the other corresponding, probably all three of those bottles. And uh, Bob's probably going to have to break into his uh, corresponding bag as well as potentially one more in uh, volume 10.
Okay, uh, copy, Doug. So basically uh, we were saying the bottles you expect to remove are uh, the ones you just spoke about during uh, breakfast as well as one additional one from volume 10. Is that uh, an accurate statement? Uh, negative. I think it's going to be one more bag full from each side. Okay, copy. Um, we'll probably tag up with you after fluid loading complete just to get verified. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good, Mike. I think that's probably best because it, it might be somewhat variable, but I think it's uh, pretty accurate. Okay, copy. Thank you. So that conversation there about fluid loading, the official space way of saying, drink your water, <laughs> making sure that Bob and Doug will remain uh, hydrated throughout the reentry period. Uh, if you fly on airplanes, uh, that's you've, if you do your research, uh, it's important to stay hydrated while you're flying on airplanes due to the different pressures. Uh, your body tends to lose a little bit more water, and so it's important to continue to drink water to stay hydrated. Same here for Bob and Doug. Uh, you heard them mention as surprise. Oh, there we can see them uh, in their capsule. There is Doug well, Hurley like there Doug. reading his instructions. Looks like Bob is there to your right. Looks like he's wearing a blue sweatshirt there drinking some water. Uh, yeah, so they're just checking to make sure uh, there's the back of Doug's head. <laughs> um, just to make sure that they are drinking enough water. You heard them mention as prescribed. Uh, that is, that intent, excuse me, that means that our flight surgeon is prescribing them how much water they should be drinking, whether or not they should be taking salt tablets to help them retain that water uh, as they are making their journey back home. So going, and, yeah, uh, here's here's that view we've talked about a couple of times, looking directly over their shoulders. And so you have those three main touchscreen dis displays, and they can configure them in a number of different modes. Uh, it looks like the one they have in the middle is giving them their trajectory. Uh, they had one on the right that was looking at a lot of the different um, control systems, and they, they get everything from current velocity, altitude, they can get deep insight into their life support system, uh, all of the pyrotechnics on board, all of the different things of the Dragon spacecraft, those displays are really their window into it. Uh, you'll also notice a couple of illuminated buttons underneath the touch screens. Uh, some of the really critical functions uh, that require immediate action uh, get a button dedicated to them. Uh, for example, they have buttons for a number of the, number of the pyro uh, events on board the Dragon spacecraft, uh, like parachute deploy or the ability to cut those parachutes once they splash down in the water. Um, and so they're going to get these configured, and this is going to be how they track the progress of their flight home today. Yeah, if we get that view back between their heads uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there we go. The left-hand side of your screen there is actually the control display that they'll be using for the re-entry, excuse me, for the de-orbit burn. Uh, there's a number of, there's a bunch of information that will be displayed there, like trajectory details, such as entry angle and capsule perigee, and how much distance is remaining uh, between the current time and, uh, and whenever that de-orbit burn is terminated. Um, so, yeah, a lot of really important information there for them. They'll also be able to see which of the four Draco thrusters are firing at any given time uh, during that do orbit burn. So that's uh, we'll we'll probably see that particular screen on both of their screens during that phase of the mission. <laughs> so going back to the previous question that we had from hashtag Ask NASA came to us from Christian. Uh, he asked what ensures that the capsule does not melt upon reentry. Please explain thermal protection. I was just saying that my job here as a SpaceX engineer, uh, I have the awesome opportunity to work with our heat shield experts both on the SpaceX side and NASA's heat shield experts uh, and really get the stamp of approval to use the hardware for flight. Uh, it is, uh, you can think of it kind of like a pizza. <laughs> um, there is the base of the heat shield or the shape, the structure, uh, and that's made out of carbon fiber. We, and that you can think of that as the crust. Uh, we then apply uh, a coating to it that allows the individual heat shields, them, the individual tiles of the heat shield themselves to stick to the, the structure itself. So uh, what we use to adhere it, you can think of as the sauce, and you can think of those tiles as the pepperoni pieces on your pizza. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a 
a different way to explain it, uh, but that's how I like to think of it. Uh, the heat shield, again, is responsible for really protecting the capsule. Those temperatures will get up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty toasty. Uh, we will, I'm sure, have a great shot of our toasted marshmallow back on the recovery vessel once it splashes down. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that heat shield does the bulk of the thermal protective work. There are, of course, um, panels on the exterior of the Dragon capsule. I mentioned toasted marshmallow. Those white panels that are on the exterior will also become brown as it as it re-enters the atmosphere uh, and begins to char due to all of the heat and the plasma buildup. So, really good question. Um, of course. With all those external temperatures getting so hot, it is important to keep Bob and Doug comfortable in their return. Uh, there, there will be cool nitrox purging through the cabin of the capsule itself, as well as through their suits. Uh, anytime the the telemetry, excuse me, anytime the suits detect that their the suit internal suit temperature uh, is getting too high, I think the threshold is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll purge the suit with some cold air, so Bob and Doug will will, will remain comfortable throughout their journey back through the Earth's atmosphere. Pizza and, pizza and marshmallows. Now I'm hungry. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> uh, all right, our next question comes from Kevin, who wanted to know, when does Dragon start its deorbit burn? And we can give you the exact time down to the yeah. second of when it's targeted. Right so... now, it's at 10.56 and 45 seconds Pacific. And then if you convert that over to Greenwich Mean Time, 1756 and 45 seconds. Yeah, so we're just under four and a half hours until we begin that deorbit burn. So, Kevin, if you're looking to take a little bit of a nap between now and deorbit, you've got a little bit of time. Our next question comes to us from W. Stelmac. Uh, the question is, can you become taller after spending a long time in space? Great question. The answer is yes. Uh, due to the lack of strong gravity uh, pull on the human body, we have found that astronauts actually report growing in length uh, due to the fact that their body isn't being compressed in this direction vertically, uh, according to our orientation on the Earth's surface. Uh, yeah, because there's lack of gravity compressing the body, we do see reports of the astronauts saying that they got a little taller in space. Yeah, we, you can kind of think about it where you, you've been told you're the tallest when you first wake up because you've been horizontal the whole yeah. time. Um, and it is a temporary getting taller. Once they return back to Earth, they shrink back down pretty quick. <laughs> um, but keep sending in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA. As Kate just said, we still have a few more hours until we get to the deorbit burn, which is when things really start to pick up. Um, just to run down a couple of those milestones again for you, uh, prior to the deorbit burn, we have to get rid of Dragon's trunk. Um, and so what we'll be doing is first doing a slew or a maneuver to alter Dragon's attitude uh, and then just get it ready for this trunk separation. Uh, that's scheduled to happen uh, right at about 10.48 a.m. Pacific, 17.48 GMT. After Dragon's in the correct attitude, it'll first separate the claw which is the connecting point between the trunk and the capsule itself, followed shortly after by the trunk. The trunk scheduled to separate at 10.51 a.m. Pacific, 17.51 GMT. And then after the trunk has been separated, we get into the proper deorbit burn for that final burn that's going to be sending them on home. Yeah, that burn will last about 11 and a half minutes, and we'll be using the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters. Uh, once the deorbit burn completes, we'll no longer need to utilize or fire those particular thrusters, so we will close the nose cone, uh, protecting them as well as the forward hatch from reentry uh, conditions. About 20 minutes after that, the fun stuff begins. <laughs> At 11.36 a.m. Pacific or 18.36 uh, universal time, we will have an expected loss of signal, uh, communications blackout. That will last about six minutes. During that time, we won't be able to command Dragon or receive telemetry or communicate with the crew. That being said, Dragon is designed to be completely autonomous. It is steering itself at that point anyway. Uh, that blackout will last, like I said, for six minutes. In the middle of there, uh, we, or just a couple minutes after that blackout, 
period begins, uh, we will have what's known as entry interface. This is when the capsule is really beginning to enter the Earth's atmosphere, is beginning to feel the friction and the aerodynamic forces associated with hitting that atmosphere. Uh, we'll get those communications back at 11.42 a.m. Pacific or 18.42 Universal. Uh, just two minutes after we get communications back, uh, we will have our, our uh, the drogue chute deployment. Uh, the three smaller drogue parachutes that will uh, pop out uh, at 11:44 a.m. Pacific, and those are designed to uh, slow the capsule, continue to slow the capsule down further beyond what the, the the slowing of the capsule from the atmosphere. Those drogue chutes will continue to slow it down. Uh, those drogue chutes will release about a minute later, and we will see those main parachutes deploy. Four orange and white big old parachutes will come out and continue to further decelerate the vehicle. Um, at that point, it will be going from 350 miles per hour. So originally, the, the velocity during the deorbit phase, excuse me, while on station is 17,500 miles per hour as it continues to rotate around Earth, still going that fast, will come down to 350 miles per hour as it re-enters the atmosphere, uh, the parachutes will further decelerate it to a mere 15 or 16 miles per hour uh, as it touches down into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we are anticipating that splashdown to occur at 11.48 a.m. Pacific or 18.48 Universal. Uh, and at that point in time, our recovery operations will begin. And that is something that we are all very excited to see. Yeah, I mean, the clock starts ticking almost from the moment they hit the water and the teams move to work extremely quickly, but also keeping safety kind of at the forefront of everything that they're doing. This is the first time we've returned a crew to a splashdown since Apollo, since the very last Apollo mission, the Apollo Soyuz test project back in July of 1975. So uh, it's something we haven't done in a long time but it's something that we've definitely rehearsed many times for this moment, including on our demonstration flight just last year. So the teams are going to move in extremely quickly within the first couple of minutes of splashdown just to get the capsule itself safe and ready to get lifted up onto the recovery vessel. Uh, the GO navigator has left the port at this point and is currently making its way out to that splashdown zone at Pensacola. So it'll be there ready and waiting, about 40-plus people on board standing by to help bring Dragon onto the boat itself and get the crew out of the capsule. Yeah. It's an exciting day. Like I said, we're about four and a half hours away from those events that, that the orbit burn um, from occurring. So we have a little bit of time. Uh, we will continue Dragon, SpaceX to... SpaceX for heat exchanger bypass. Okay, uh, in preparation for entry, uh, we'll be commanding the uh, heat exchanger bypass close. So this will mean that manual control of cabin temperature will be disallowed. That commanding should come in shortly. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Mike. No problem. In addition, uh, we do not expect to need to elevate the uh, loop speed for uh, uh, pre-chill. Okay, copy that, thank you. And so right there, they're just doing a couple of housekeeping steps as again, they're gonna be conditioning the inside of the cabin and Doug and Bob's suits for that actual re-entry. They're gonna be cooling down the inside of the cabin uh, and doing what's known as a suit purge. Uh, so once Bob and Doug are suited up and in their seats, uh, they'll do basically a flush with very, or with cooler air, uh, with cooler nitrox flowing into their suits. Uh, they're not pressurized while they're suited up. Um, they'll just leave a zipper open a little bit. Uh, they will do uh, suit leak checks um, which uh, we'll see them pressurize the suits completely as, again, those suits designed to protect them in the event of a cabin depressurization, um, any uh, contaminants in the atmosphere, things like that. Uh, but they will be wearing them for this dynamic phase, which I know we have a question here from Nick who 
uh, had wanted to know, do the seats recline to allow them to lie flat during sleep, or do they sleep upright? Um, and the suits and the seats, kind of an integrated system. Uh, the, the seats themselves, as Kate described a little bit earlier, um, are rigid carbon fiber. So the seats do move, as we saw on launch day, uh, where they're uh, able to uh, both recline and decline. But um, the seats themselves don't move. Uh, and really, when you're in outer space, uh, you can't get the sensation of laying down. So the seats reclining don't really do much for you when you're in microgravity. Uh, pretty much any surface on the Dragon spacecraft will serve as a bed. Um, the same thing kind of true on board the International Space Station where if we have more crew members than we have crew accommodations at times, uh, crew members can just camp out. And if you've ever seen uh, any of the photos from back in the shuttle days uh, when we would have seven people in a relatively small enclosure, uh, you can just essentially uh, strap your sleeping bag to the wall and that's your bed for the evening. Yeah, so essentially in space, your body doesn't really have a reference to determine what is up and what is down, aside from you know what you can determine visually. Uh, so in the case of whenever they're sleeping, their, their body can't really feel laying down. They just feel being in their seat. So while, like Dan said, the seats do um, actuate so that they're in launch position or landing position where the entire seat is basically moving 40 degrees this way or that way, they don't necessarily recline out like a recliner chair would. So, although I'm sure that would also be very comfortable. <laughs> Our next question coming to us again from Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Can you talk about the recovery ship? Absolutely, Rose. <laughs> like I mentioned before, you know, this is the second opportunity that we've had to highlight the recovery team given the fact that our water landings and needing to retrieve a crew is very new to our company here. Uh, we're very excited to be able to highlight that team now for the second time on our webcast. Uh, the recovery team, uh, the recovery ship is, uh, there are actually two of them. We have one that is capable of assisting recoveries on the west coast of Florida, and that's the Go Navigator. That's what we will be using for today's recovery. There's also the Go Searcher, which is located on the East Coast uh, for East Coast landings. They are identical and they are able to be staffed, fully staffed, uh, not only for recovery operations, but uh, for medical as well. Six Dragon, we're putting the grab sample container collection in work. Okay, okay SpaceX, SpaceX copies, copies grab sample, sample container, container collection, collection in work. In work. Good, Good luck. luck. Good luck. And that right there, they'll occasionally... And so it'll be serial number 20888. Okay, SpaceX got the serial number 20888. That exchange right there real quick. The, the crew members um, on board Dragon, something they do on board the station as well, take a, occasional air samples. You heard them call it the grab sample, um, where they're basically taking these samples and sealing them up, and then they just get assessed back down on the ground. You're just constantly looking for what kind of atmosphere your crew members are in, uh, as when you're in a spacecraft, it's an enclosed environment, so you have to worry about everything that gets put into that atmosphere stays there. Um, so things like carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, um, carbon monoxide, any other contaminants can build up in an enclosed space and eventually become hazardous. So we have to have a lot of systems uh, to help constantly scrub or clean those things out from the atmosphere. And we'll do these grab samples just to make sure that they're basically doing their job. Yeah. Going back Going to back Rose's, Rose's question, question coming to us coming from, from Twitter, Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA, ask asking, asking us to talk, talk about the recovery, recovery ship. ship. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so we, we have two, two identical recovery, recovery ships, ships or vessels. Or vessels. Um, um, specifically, specifically to our recovery, our recovery today, today, we, we are, utilizing are utilizing Go Navigator, Navigator for, for our Gulf, or excuse me, for our landing in the Gulf of Mexico. In addition to the recovery ship itself, there are also two fast boats. So those will be transported 
to the to general, general location, location uh, about three about nautical miles point. away from the landing site itself. Um, those fast boats will be deployed from the vessel and uh, they will make their way very quickly to the capsule itself. Uh, they'll wait a couple hundred feet away from the capsule as the initial sniffing tests are done. Uh, those sniffing tests are intended to determine whether or not any toxic vapors from the hypergolic uh, uh, fuels on board. Hypergols are essentially propellants that uh, whenever you put them in contact with each other, they, they ignite. So it is an ideal uh, propellant used in space because you don't need an ignition source. You just combine the two and you have your reaction. So um, those, those fumes are toxic, and so the team will make sure that there aren't any of those floating around and make sure that it is safe to approach. Once they get that go for approach, they'll head over to the capsule, uh, and essentially someone that I'm really excited to see in action today uh, will, cover, will actually climb up on top of the capsule and attach the rigging equipment necessary to hoist the dragon out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. So um, all in, excuse me, that that should take about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and at that point, the recovery vessel will be in place. They'll be able to hook everything up, use the um, hydraulic crane to lift the capsule out of the water and onto the recovery vessel, get it settled comfortably in the nest. And at that point, we'll open up the hatch and say hi to Bob and Doug. <laughs> yeah, and they'll almost immediately move into medical quarters on board the ship yeah. uh, as it has pretty much everything you need to outfit and sustain a crew of a little over 40 people. Uh, and then immediately over the Dragon Capsule is the helideck, where they'll be landing a helicopter following recovery today, which is what's going to actually bring Bob and Doug back to shore. Um, next up, our question comes from Spinach, who wants to know, why do you need a heat shield on entry but not on ascent? Speed relative to atmosphere must be roughly equal in both cases. Yeah, so that is a really good question. Um, the short answer is it's all about directionality. So whenever we are launching the Dragon capsule, uh, it's pointing upwards and it is heading towards the International Space Station. Uh, so the heat shield, or rather the, bo the bottom of the capsule is not exposed and is not encountering any thermal, uh, any thermal differences or, or temperatures. Uh, during that ascent phase also, it's important to note that um, while the capsule is actually going through the Earth's atmosphere, which is where you have atmosphere and therefore friction as you're moving through the atmosphere, and that's what causes the, the, the charring as we see uh, upon reentry, the amount of friction that the capsule is experiencing as it is leaving the atmosphere to go to the International Space Station is a fraction of what it will encounter as it is re-entering. Also to note, the shape of the Dragon capsule is uh, more aerodynamic at the top. Uh, so again, allowing it to cut through the atmosphere with minimal friction. Um, so after the capsule detaches, and as we will see today, comes back down, that flat end is designed to encounter the atmosphere and slow it down. So it's kind of by intention the opposite effect. Yeah. We use the atmosphere to help slow us down safely, um, as opposed to wanting to escape Earth's gravity as efficiently as possible. So we want to cut through it as much as possible. All right, next up is a question from Casey. He wants to know what will the crew be able to see out of the window upon reentry? Uh, I think it was Bob who actually answered this a little bit earlier this week, where he recalled what he saw during uh, his reentries on the space shuttle, where when astronauts look out the window, they can see the ablative material of the heat shield. So the heat shield is designed uh, so as parts really start to heat up, they actually kind of peel off, and that helps dissipate the heat or the most intense part of the heat during reentry. And for a crew member, it looks like just red bits of glowing material flying past your window. Um, and for them in particular, there will be uh, plasma building up around the spacecraft as it heats up to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And so out their window, they'll be able to see essentially some really bright orange, not quite flames, uh, but definitely something that looks energetic. And that'll be uh, their main view out of the window, which they'll have those windows open uh, and uncovered during the reentry. Our next question comes from Jeff, who wants to know what's the longest someone has been in space. I know the cumulative record holder right now is a Russian cosmonaut, Gennady Vidalka. He's got 
uh, a little over 800 days uh, in space. Uh, he's been a long-duration crew member not only on the International Space Station, but also previously on the Russian Mir Space Station, which was uh, really kind of the, the harbinger of long-duration space flight, uh, where you had people up there living for months and months and months at a time. I believe the current record holder, is it still Peggy Whitson? Peggy Whitson is the American record holder right gotcha. now. All right. Our next question comes from Timothy, who wants to know, is this the first splashdown since the Apollo missions? Yes, it is. This is the first U.S. splashdown since the Apollo missions. There was one Russian Soyuz. I'd have to go back and look up exactly which mission it was, uh, but it technically did land in a frozen lake. So it was a splashdown, although <laughs> unintentional. Uh, this is the first time we've splashed down American crew members, uh, or at the very least, this is the first time we've done an ocean-based splashdown uh, since Apollo, uh, the last one being Apollo so used back in July of 1975. Our next question coming to us from Krishna. What wind speed does it take for the splashdown to get scrubbed? Ooh, that is a really good question. Uh, I can't recall exactly what it is off the top of my head, but I think it is no more than 15 miles per hour. Or I might be recalling a different It was constraint. about 15 feet per second, which is about 10 miles an hour, was the range that we were looking to be under uh, for this mission, which today we've said a couple of times the weather ended up being almost perfect for the splashdown. We have winds in the splashdown area of only about a mile and a half per second. Um, so very gentle winds there today, uh, but for this particular mission, our constraint was about 15 feet per second, which is about 10 miles an hour. Our next question coming to us from Danny. Again, this is using the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. Keep your questions coming. Question is, great stream, guys, learning so much. Oh, awesome. Glad to hear. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Would it be possible for the SpaceX capsule to be used again in future missions as it is, or would it need a complete overhaul before heading back up? Awesome question. So uh, we absolutely uh, have been aiming to use, to reuse Dragon capsules from the very beginning. Uh, initially, when we started reusing our Dragon cargo capsules, uh, figuring out how to waterproof it was quite the challenge. And once we figured that out, we were actually able to reduce the amount of overhaul or refurbishment required between usage of the capsules. So that being said, Things like the heat shield and the uh, TPS or thermal protective system panels on the exterior of the capsule, those things generally, as of right now, would not be reused, but the guts and the brains of the capsule, most definitely. Uh, we aim to, and of course this is, this prog this this process transforms over time. The more that we do it, we understand more, we learn more from data and tests, uh, and we're able to make the process more efficient. Uh, and so eventually we will hopefully be able to get to absolutely no refurbishment required uh, in order to reuse a capsule. All right, our next question comes from Texas Dog Mom. Wants to know why is it important to know exactly what food and water is consumed during reentry? It's a good question. Um, and it really comes down to we have a very set amount of food. And again, Dragon, not the biggest space, so it's probably hard to lose something on Dragon. Uh, but we do meticulously track everything in microgravity just so if we are in a situation, because remember, uh, today was the primary landing opportunity for Bob and Doug. If for some reason we had to wave off, they would still be in space for another 48 hours. And so we're always just tracking where everything is inside that capsule um, for the mission, not only so it's easy to find, but at the end of the mission, if we find something is missing, you have to go and find it. Um, that's something, uh, if you think to how aircraft factories operate, um, anything that gets brought into the area has to be tracked because if it's not, if something is found and it hasn't been tracked previously, or if you know you brought something in and you can't find it, you have to generally stop what you're doing and go find it. Um, so definitely important to track everything on board, water and food, was just the item of the day for them this morning as they were in their post-sleep, uh, just wrapping up, uh, getting their breakfast before they began their day. 
And there you see a live shot of our Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne, California. Our Dragon operators are ready to begin our deorbit phase, which, again, that won't be happening for a couple hours still. Um, but everyone is in place and ready to monitor Dragon as we approach the final steps of our re-entry phase. Uh, at this point, we're going to check in on Dragon, see where it is. It looks like it's about to go over Brazil down there in South America. Uh, so enjoy this live view of our ground track.
Dragon SpaceX for uh, procedure 4 decimal 700 deorbit preparation. Dragon SpaceX for procedure 4 decimal 700 deorbit preparation. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Doug. Um, just want to clarify uh, a couple things. So, per uh, the previous mention for section 1, the no path is applicable because we will not be elevating loop speeds. In addition, when completing step uh, three decimal four, please be sure to untether and stow the camera caps back in location eight. Okay, to copy all, and in 3.4, you want us to uh, take all the uh, camera caps, untether them, and put them back in location eight. And uh, I think our suggestion would be that we'll probably just do that now, unless you guys have a uh, reason not to. Hey, we agree with that plan, and that's a good readback. Um, appreciate it.
All right. Well, we are still following along with Bob and Doug's journey back home today. Everything continuing to proceed smoothly with the departure of Dragon from the space station yesterday. Uh, they have been awake for a couple of hours now after getting their eight hours of rest on board the Dragon capsule. And everything's really focused on the events coming up in just about three hours from now. Yeah, so we have a number of things that will be happening. Um, as Dan said, we're actually looking for our events to begin at th in three hours and 42 minutes. Uh, first, we will have claw separation. So that is uh, deactivating or separating the trunk. Uh, the claw is the piece of hardware that delivers power and telemetry and fluids between the trunk and the Dragon capsule. In order to expose the heat shield in preparation for re-entry, we will jettison the trunk. Uh, it will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and disintegrate during that process. Um, but once we do that, we're, Dragon Capsule will be in its next, it will be in its final physical form prior to re-entry. Uh, we'll then initiate a deorbit burn. It'll last about 11 and a half minutes, and that burn is intended to place Dragon on its final trajectory for its landing site, uh, which is just off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. So once that deorbit burn happens, uh, Bob and Doug will uh, then sit back and continue to monitor all the telemetry that and data that they have on their screens. That's their primary mission for today is to just keep a, a tab on things. Uh, there you can see on your screen that they're they're now not in their suits yet. We'll wait a little bit longer before they have to don their suits. Uh, but they're there doing some checkouts and moving about the interior of Crew Dragon. Uh, like I said, they, we will perform that deorbit burn, lining up the capsule uh, for that final reentry and and splashdown off the coast of Florida. Uh, and but and after we do the do orbit burn, we will close that nose cone. So the do orbit burn will utilize the four forward bulkhead thr Draco thrusters. Uh, we will not need to use them, and we want to for the remainder of the mission. And we want to protect that uh, forward hatch there. That's the hatch that is used for ingress and egress, or entering and exiting the space station. And as these capsules are designed to be reusable, we definitely want to protect that hatch. So we close and lock that nose cone. And then after the nose cone is in place and we confirm that it is locked up, we then maneuver to that deorbit burn attitude. Uh, and, or excuse me, uh, there, let me rephrase that. <laughs> we are performing the deorbit burn. The nose cone will close, and we will uh, then begin the process of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. We just saw Bob uh, kind of re-stowing his spacesuit. They keep uh, their spacesuits, at least for this mission, in uh, the seats on either side of them, as Bob and Doug are right there in the middle, in the commander and the pilot seat. Uh, but after they're able to successfully re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, we'll get out of that comms blackout, and we'll get to the actual parachute de deploys. Um, so first we'll have two drogue chutes come out. Those will do the initial slowing and stabilization of the vehicle, followed shortly after by the four main parachutes, which are scheduled to deploy right around 11.45 a.m. Pacific. All of that sets us up for splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida, uh, just a few miles away from Pensacola. That's splashdown time targeted for 11.48 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1848 GMT or universal time. Uh, there to meet them is going to be the crew of the Go Navigator, which has left its port. Uh, these actually some live views from the boat itself as it continues to make its way out to the recovery zone. It was able to leave the port uh, right at around 9.20 a.m. Eastern time this morning. Uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, they were tracking an issue with one of the backup generators on board the uh, Go Navigator. Uh, they were working to try and get a replacement for that, uh, but weren't able to get it on board quite in time. But Go Navigator still has a fully functional prime uh, generator on board, and not having that backup is not uh, any constraint on normal recovery options this morning. So Go Navigator uh, steaming full speed ahead, heading to that recovery zone. And they're going to be there several hours before splashdown. They'll maintain a distance of about three nautical miles from the anticipated splashdown point and just be ready and on standby for when Bob and Doug are in the water.
Yeah, as you may have heard us mention before, it has been, at least over the last week, the recovery team has been really busy with trying to determine where exactly we were going to Point Dragon for its return home. Uh, in order to allow for uh, multiple depart, excuse me, allow to uh, in order to allow for multiple de departure. Uh, times from the International Space Station. So again, this is just trying to line up things like crew sleep schedules uh, and weather and just physical location as it is orbiting Earth. We identified seven potential uh, splashdown locations, four on the east, uh, yeah, four on the west coast of Florida and three on the east coast. Uh, and it has been priority number one for the last week for the recovery team to determine which of those seven locations Bob and Doug would be splashing down at. Uh, the weather of around Florida is uh, ever-changing, especially when you have something like, as we currently have, a tropical storm rolling through the area. Uh, having that storm roll up the east coast of Florida uh, uh, prevented us from obviously being able to land at any of those. So selection was then narrowed down to the four in the Gulf of Mexico on the west coast of Florida. And we continue to evaluate the weather at designated intervals. And uh, we were able to determine that the best location for recovery would be off the coast of Pensacola. Uh, condition, or excuse me, requirements for these landing uh, zones need, are essentially that they need to can't be in the middle of the body of water because uh, the landing zone has to be close to a medical facility and it has to be close to a port uh, so that the recovery vessel can actually get to and from the recover excuse me, to and from the landing site yeah and we've continued to watch the weather we got pretty lucky with the weather that we're looking at today. Uh, we had some weather criteria that we're looking for. We have to meet those criteria in order to get basically a go condition to splash down. Uh, one of the main things we were looking at was wind speeds, which we were looking to not exceed 10 miles an hour. And winds in the splashdown zone right now just barely over one mile an hour. So getting extremely calm winds and very calm seas for what should be a very stable operation for this recovery today. Uh, we actually just locked in uh, Panama City a few hours ago, uh, our kind of last chance to lock in an alternate site uh, was uh, just a little over an hour and a half ago at about 5.48 a.m. Pacific. Dragon has the capability to change alternate sites once it's in free flight, uh, and we do have, again, seven different uh, splashdown locations. Uh, just based off of the weather, uh, and everything else that we looked at, Panama said we chosen as the alternate for this opportunity that was already looking like our best one just based off the weather, and they just locked that in a few hours ago. But everything continuing on track for this Pensacola splashdown. Uh, Go Navigator is well on its way to the splashdown location, and Bob and Doug are just a couple of hours away from that deorbit burn. We are taking your questions this morning from Twitter. Be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll try to cycle through as many of them as we can get to. Uh, this question comes from Tim. What's the current distance to the ISS? Good question. Uh, something that I find that people, people often assume is that the International Space Station is really, really far away, and it's actually not. Uh, it is about 250 to 300 miles above the Earth. I think when I saw a report earlier, or maybe it was actually Leah who mentioned it in the earlier broadcast, I think it's about 263 miles above the Earth's surface right now. So depending on um, you know where it is in its orbit, it might be a little higher, it might be a little lower. Uh, and yeah, so it is, it's actually not that far away. It's basically the distance from Los Angeles to San Francisco, uh, you know, as the crow flies, uh, just above us. So it's really not as far as, as many people think. Again, this is using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, this next question comes to us from Nicholas. How far off the coast will the capsule land? Will it be possible to see any of the action from the coastline? Trying to find our exact distances. It varies depending on which coast that we're going to. Um, we do stay far enough away that you wouldn't really be able to see it from the coast. Um, obviously, you do want to still be coming down in an area pretty far away from land to make sure you're hitting a splashdown zone. Um, and just so you're not near any 
major air traffic areas, things like that, is you do have to clear uh, air zones. Uh, we have to make sure that we have notices going out to ships not to go into a certain area. Um, but uh, there are just uh, several kilometers, obviously, or several miles offshore. Uh, the Cape is the closest one. That one's typically only about 24 miles offshore. Uh, the other ones range uh, anywhere from uh, about 50 miles uh, all the way up to a few hundred, um, just about 200 or so. When we landed Demo 1 last year, it was about 240 miles off off of the Cape. Um, so it is, it is different depending on where you're going. Um, but... Uh, one of the things that we have uh, in our basically our recovery arsenal are helicopters where Bob and Doug will get recovered by that uh, rec main recovery vessel, the Go Navigator, and after they're out of the capsule and into the medical facility, a helicopter will come and land on the deck, and then it's only about a 10-minute helicopter ride from the Go Navigator back to Pensacola where they'll be moving on to a NASA plane ready to take them over to Houston. Yeah, so one thing to note, um, the capsule will be re-entering our atmosphere and we will have parachute deployment starting at about 18,000 feet above the surface of the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, those drogue parachutes and the capsule itself. Dragon SpaceX for timeline and recovery status update. All right, should we get an update up to the crew now? Okay, first off, for timeline update, uh, we are now within 4.5 hours of splashdown for contingency planning purposes. How copy? Four point five for splashdown. Copy all. Okay, for recovery forces, I believe Jay told you that we were working a uh, backup generator on the recovery vessel. Unfortunately, we're unable to get that generator aboard before uh, Go Navigator had to depart due to timing constraints. Um, however, Go Navigator has departed and we're expect and uh, is expected to be on site at approximately 1700 UTC. Navigator will be on site in time for splashdown. Yep, good read back. And uh, as uh, Jay mentioned before, uh, we're down to one generator due to the loss of the uh, the other one. Yep, we copy. So that was just a real quick update on giving the crew on board Dragon the latest. Um, as you just heard, uh, Go Navigator on its way. It's expected to be in the splashdown zone on time uh, for their descent. Again, we're targeting a splashdown at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 GMT or Universal Time. Uh, and they talked through the generator issue. Uh, the Go Navigator is still fully equipped to safely recover the crew uh, this afternoon or this morning, uh, but they are down one of the generators on board. Uh, still able to use that hydraulic lift, get Dragon up out of the water and on board. Uh, the ship itself has a full deck area where it has an A-frame on the very back of the ship, and we'll get some views uh, from the boat throughout the operations once we get a little bit closer into the recovery zone. But that A-frame used to physically lift Dragon out of the water and onto the deck. The crew stays in their suits, in their seats, the entire time they're in the water, uh, as long as everything is following the nominal timeline, and they'll get picked up out of the water and put into the Dragon nest on the boat, eventually moved under the Hella deck. Uh, up to a crew access platform where we'll have some people standing by to open up the hatch and assist Bob and Doug getting out. Yeah. So just real quick, uh, going back to the Twitter question that we had a minute ago, if action would be available to view from onshore, I just did a, a, a little bit of sleuthing, um, and I, due to the, the splashdown location, I do think that if you're in the Pensacola area, you might be able to spot the main parachute deployment. Um, 
or after they inflate, those main parachutes uh, are deployed around 6,000 feet whenever Dragon is descending about, when it hits about 6,000 feet above the Earth's, about above the surface of the ocean. Those main parachutes will deploy, and it takes a, about a minute or so for them to fully uh, deploy out into their larger state, ca state capturing all that airflow. Uh, but it is possible that, I think, that if you're in the Pensacola area and you have really keen eyes, you might be able to spot those orange and white parachutes uh, off in the distance. Again, the capsule, you know, from that distance would be pretty small. So no promises, but it might be worth a look. So if you're in Pensacola, take a look south uh, and around 11... 48 is, yeah. I've lost track of my time, 11.48 a.m. Pacific or 18.48 Universal. Yeah, and it's on what we call an ascending approach. So if you're at Pensacola looking south, the capsule will be heading towards you from the south. It's going to be moving from southeast to north, uh, southwest to northeast across the Gulf of Mexico uh, as it makes this approach. There are also what we call descending orbits. Um, so essentially when Dragon is traveling from uh, the northwest down to the southeast, which would actually bring it over uh, the U.S. before it's flashed down. Uh, but we are on an ascending one today, so it's largely going to be over the Gulf the whole way in during that final descent. Yeah. So, again, we are taking your questions through Twitter this morning. Be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA, and we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can this morning. The next question comes to us from Andrew. He asks, why can't Dragon right, make... Dragon for interior cameras. Go for SpaceX. Yeah, Mike, uh, could you take the uh, interior cameras down for a few minutes? In work. The crew just making a quick ask, having those interior cameras brought down. Uh, they work with the teams on the ground, a lot like those on Space Station. They have cameras in there just so they're able to get kind of rapid response, any questions that they have, any help that they need. But then obviously the astronauts getting the privacy they need, uh, whether they're doing suit up or just kind of anything else where you don't need people checking in on you. Yeah. So again, going back to this question from Andrew coming to us from the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter, why can't Dragon make a straight downward descent instead of orbiting around the world? That is a great question. Uh, you have to keep in mind that when Dragon uh, is at the International Space Station, it is at the same velocity. Uh, it is going 17,500 miles per hour, and it is orbiting the Earth. In order to have it perform a landing of straight down, you would have to have some sort of force to stop it going from that fast. Uh, and that's really not possible due to constraints like having enough fuel and size of the capsule and all that good stuff. Uh, so Dragon we don't... SpaceX, we should be external cameras at this time. So there was that confirmation from SpaceX core uh, that the internal cabin cameras have been shut off. Uh, so Dragon's reentry is the uh, can't be straight down because you would need some sort of force uh, in order to stop it, thanks to uh, I think it's Newton's second law. Um, that being said, an orbital reentry like we do use is uh, highly calculable. Uh, we are able to have very precise details in terms of where it's going to land uh, and at what time. So uh, there really, you know, there's no downside to doing it in the way that we do do it, other than the fact that um, from a physics standpoint, the straight down approach uh, isn't really possible. All right, so our next question uh, from Elaine, what difference is there in the route map from the red and the yellow line? Um, I think Kate touched on this a little bit earlier. That's showing you where Dragon is essentially in sunlight or in eclipse. Um, we don't have shades on this map, but uh, if you look at the red parts, that's where Dragon is essentially on the dark side of the planet at that point in the orbit. And then the yellow line in the orbit is where it's in sunlight. Um, so uh, obviously matching up with uh, the sunlight for all of us down on planet Earth, the sun I think it's up here in California. There are many windows, uh, but 
that's that's all that line is sign- is signaling. And you might wonder why are there two lines? It kind of looks like uh, it's actually just one continuous line. Um, and just to to run you down real quick again, uh, Dragon is in kind of the top right portion of your screen right now. Uh, there's a little circle with the dragon icon. It's currently just uh, to the north of India, flying over China. It's going to continue on this southeasterly pass over Southeast Asia. Uh, it's about to head into an orbital nighttime, which means things will get dark for the spacecraft and uh, the crew on board. And that also means it's about to cross what's known as the Terminator line. That is the line between night and day on the Earth's surface. And when you're uh, on board the International Space Station, or in this case, on board Dragon, uh, you can get some pretty spectacular views uh, as uh, the Earth goes from night to almost pitch black beneath you. Yeah, one of my favorite views that we get from the International Space Station is uh, as they are transitioning from day to night and night to day, you, you get to see the sunrises and sunset from their perspective. And uh, I just absolutely love it when we actually get to see those th- the lightning as well. Um, it's just such a cool phenomenon to, to view from above. So we'll, we'll hang out for a few minutes here and watch Dragon's track as they continue to circle the globe. We're still about three hours away from things really starting to pick up when we get into trunk separation and do orbit burn, but we're going to continue to stick with it as we get ready to welcome Bob and Doug home a little bit later this morning.
All right, if you're just now tuning in, we're still following Bob and Doug's journey back home on the conclusion of our Demo 2 mission. Just to walk you through how we got here, everything started back on Saturday when they made their way into the Dragon spacecraft where they had been living on board the International Space Station for about 62 days. And by the time they splashed down, they'll be just shy of 64 total days spent in space. Everything started with hatch close after Bob and Doug made their way into the Dragon spacecraft, closing up the hatch on their side. Uh, after that, they were able to get the hatch closed on the station side, closing what's known as the A-pass hatch. It also had a docking target affixed to it, but that created an area between the two known as the vestibule. That vestibule gets exposed to the vacuum of space following the undocking, so we first have to depressurize it, or basically draw all of the air out. After that and some leak checks are completed, the crew gets ready for their actual departure from the International Space Station. The teams on the ground, both here in Hawthorne and in Mission Control Houston, did a go-no-go. -go. Basically, we check everything on Dragon, everything on station, and get them ready for departure. Following a successful go for undocking, it's time to actually move Dragon away, and separation takes place. A docking command was sent, and then just about five minutes later, Dragon fired its thrusters in two small bursts to separate from the International Space Station. It then begins to fly away and did so yesterday evening doing four departure burns to bring it first up and over the International Space Station, eventually passing beneath and out in front. All four of those departure burns done successfully. By that point, Dragon's opening rate away from the station got larger and larger and larger until it was time for it to move into its departure phasing burn. This was one several minute long burn, about a six minute long burn to fine tune Dragon's path to its eventual splashdown site. That was conducted successfully last night after Bob and Doug had gone to sleep. And then once that departure phasing burn was in the book, we only had one more burn coming up down the line. And then it, we were going to get uh, ready for this reentry. Bob and Doug did have about an eight hour crew sleep period. Um, as this is about a 19 hour trip door to door from space station down to the ocean off the coast of Pensacola in Florida. That crew sleep is completed. They will. They woke up a couple of hours ago, and our more dynamic action is about to pick up soon. Yeah, so our events coming up next will be the claw and trunk separation. Uh, this will essentially be the final, when we separate the trunk, it'll be the final physical form of Dragon prior to reentry. Uh, we will then have exposed the heat shield at the bottom of the capsule after jettisoning that trunk, allowing it to get ready for its reentry. We put a deorbit burn we activate the deorbit burn sequence, and that puts Dragon on its final trajectory to the landing site off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico. That deorbit burn will last about 10 and a, excuse me, 11 and a half minutes. After that deorbit burn completes, we then close the nose cone. The deorbit burn will utilize the four thrusters at the top of Dragon, as you can see there. We no longer need to utilize them, and we want to protect the top hatch, or excuse me, the forward hatch there, so we close that nose cone and lock it up. After that, Dragon will begin to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, and we will experience a six-minute long communication blackout due to the plasma building up on the exterior of Cabin, uh, uh, due to the buildup of plasma on the exterior of Dragon. Um, we won't be able to send uh, commands or receive telemetry, but that's okay. Dragon is completely autonomous. It is designed to steer itself anyway. So uh, with that blackout communication period will last for about six minutes or so. Um, after that, about a couple minutes after that, we will, after we regain those communications with the crew, we will deploy the drogue parachutes. These are designed to slow the, begin to slow the vehicle down even further uh, and also to stabilize the drogue. Dragon capsule. About a minute or two after drogues deploy, we'll fire off the main parachutes. So these will be four orange and white parachutes that will deploy and begin to catch even more air and create more air resistance, slowing the vehicle down even further to a mere 15 or 16 miles per hour as the capsule then splashes down in the Gulf of Mexico. 
uh, where we've located a landing, designated a landing location near Pensacola, Florida. Recovery operations then begin immediately after a splashdown is confirmed. The main parachutes will be cut from the capsule autonomously, uh, and the recovery crew will then begin to move into position in order to retrieve Bob and Doug. Uh, the team will actually be waiting three nautical miles away from the splashdown site. Uh, whenever the splashdown approaches, they will they will then occurs. They will then move closer. They will pull the caps, get the capsule ready to be lifted onto the recovery vessel. Once that is secure in the nest, they'll then get to open the hatch and have Bob and Doug egress or exit uh, from the Dragon capsule. And at that moment, it'll be the first breath of fresh air in two months since they've launched back on Falcon 9 in late May. Uh, so we're really excited. All of that will be coming up shortly. Uh, those events that we're, we have uh, in the future that the do orbit burn and the jettison of the trunk, uh, that will all be in like three hours exactly. So my countdown here shows that the trunk separation uh, will be happening three hours from now. So we're looking forward to all of those events coming up. Uh, it has, it's going to be a very exciting morning. Like I said, seeing Bob and Doug for the first time coming out um, from the capsule on that recovery vessel. Go Navigator will be the first time that they are getting, you know, t they're back down on planet Earth for the first time in two months. Safety is everything, and of course, the human body uh, experiences microgravity. And just to be safe, we will uh, place them uh, onto into a wheelchair or um, uh, a. Uh, my, my mind is a blanking. Stretcher, yeah. stretcher, yeah, it's, there we yeah. go. <laughs> Essentially, we'll, we'll be helping Bob and Doug yeah. uh, as they get out of the castle. Anybody who's familiar with our long-duration crew members returning to Earth, if you've ever seen a Soyuz landing, you've seen the crew members get physically lifted out of the capsule, typically, and immediately carried over to chairs where we're able to do quick medical checks, take things like pulse, a, a number of other items, and just really give them a moment to rest. As It can be pretty jarring on the body when you re-enter into a grab environment after living in space for several months um, so we're just doing everything we can possibly to keep them safe um, not only just physically once they get back uh, we've also had a lot of protocols put in place uh, with the current environment with uh, coronavirus just to make sure every member of our recovery team has been self-isolated and tested prior to being in that close contact with Bob and Doug yeah so really awesome morning we have coming up now with respect to the recovery ships themselves uh, I should say recovery ships so so there on your screen, uh, we have live views coming to you from Go Navigator as it is making its way to the designated landing site off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, in the lower right hand side of your screen, what you see there is the hydraulic lift that will be used to hoist Dragon out of the water and into the nest, which is just barely out of view there. Uh, but that nest is what the capsule will sit on and then be pulled more towards the interior of the deck, and that's where we'll open the hatch and, and have Bob and Doug come out. So as you can see, we got some blue skies with a couple of clouds. Uh, it, it's a picture-perfect day. Those seas look really calm. Uh, earlier, the, uh, the most recent weather report indicated that we were looking at about one mile per hour for winds, which is fantastic. So it's great to see those live views coming to us from Go Navigator uh, as it is making its way towards the Pensacola, Florida recovery zone. Yeah, we you really couldn't have asked for better weather than we got today. Uh, weather was the one thing we were really keeping a close eye on as we marched towards this splashdown today. We had a number of different checkpoints throughout the week where NASA and SpaceX were meeting, assessing the weather, and our conditions where we had to have not only our prime site with go weather conditions, but our alternate site, at least one alternate site as well. Dragon does have the capability to download to different alternate sites once it's in free flight. So uh, our, we just passed a checkpoint a few hours ago where they locked in Panama City City as the alternate site and we have seven different landing zones around Florida three of them on the Atlantic side Jacksonville Daytona and the Cape were not in consideration for this weekend uh, as they are still dealing with the tropical weather system but we're able to get great weather at Pensacola and they're set up for that splashdown today and go navigator is on its way it left the port just about an hour and a half ago um, and
and we've been following its progress. It had uh, one of its backup generators was, was failed, and they were working to replace it with another one, but weren't able to get it there in time. But that is not a constraint to do the recovery operations. Go Navigator is still perfectly capable of effectively and safely recovering the capsule and Bob and Doug from, from the ocean in its current state. Yeah. So like we mentioned before, we are taking your questions this morning through Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Our next question comes to us from Jim. He'd like to know, what are all those people in that room doing? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, that is Mission Control Center here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. There you see all of our Dragon operators and our mission director. So uh, those are the people that are essentially continuing to monitor Dragon. As I've mentioned before, Dragon is, is designed to fly itself autonomously. There are very few things that the folks in that room have to command manually. Um, but for those things, it's a lot of data review and verifying that the conditions that need to be in place before sending said commands uh, are achieved. But those people are essentially responsible for ma uh, monitoring the health and safety and telemetry of our crew and capsule. Yeah, mission controls are just a part of human spaceflight. Uh, this one has been in the game ever since uh, Dragon launched. While Dragon was docked to the International Space Station, it was powered down for a lot of its time there, uh, but they would still come in occasionally to wake Dragon up, do a bunch of checkouts, and we did a number of uh, different tests while Dragon was docked to the International Space Station. This was uh, just another chance to see how it integrated into the overall station system as we were passing both energy, uh, electrical power, Power and data to and from Dragon while it was docked. Uh, Bob and Doug and a couple of their Expedition 63 crew members also doing a habitability study. As again, this is a test flight, so we did a bunch of demonstration flights uh, on the way up uh, to the station with Bob and Doug manually controlling the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, and this habitability study was something that they did while they were on board. Uh, it was largely kind of just some some spatial tests where they were inside Dragon, they practiced uh, getting in and out of their suits and doing leak checks, uh, and they had two of their Expedition 63 crew members come and join them uh, so they could test out sleeping arrangements of uh, four people in microgravity in a Dragon capsule. So they are able to do that uh, just, again, to give teams some real tangible, this is how we're going to do this when we're flying these full operational crews, with our first one, Crew 1, coming up as early as the end of September. Yeah, pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> Our next question comes to us from Ibrox Baby. How do they get the hatch open once Dragon has splashed down and who will be doing it? That is a good question. So we won't be opening the hatch until Dragon is lifted out of the water and placed onto the recovery vessel. Uh, that hatch will be manually opened. Uh, we will, the flight surgeon will actually be the first person to pop his head in uh, and say hi to Bob and Doug while they're still strapped in, uh, make sure they're feeling okay, that everything went well, uh, and then we will uh, have them unstrap and we'll help them exit from the vehicle and then we'll have them go into their medical tent for full medical uh, evaluation. So, uh, really good question. All right, our next one comes from For the Love of Tennis. Said when the shuttle returned from space, you could hear a sonic boom. Will that happen with Dragon? As far as I know, no, uh, that will not happen, I don't believe, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I know that I don't, nobody will likely hear it if it does happen this time, as Dragon's going to be passing over the Gulf uh, for its entire descent uh, through that final uh, after deorbit burn and actually passing through the Earth's atmosphere. So if it happened, it would happen out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, where it would be very unlikely. I'm, I'm not sure, though. We'll have to, we'll come back to this one a little bit later and get you an answer on that. Um, our next one comes from Lakin, who wants to know, will Bob and Doug be able to feel splashdown or feel the capsule rocking in the water? I think the answer to this is an unequivocal yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, they'll be touching down at about 16 miles an hour, which is vastly slower than that 17,500 miles an hour they're going right now in orbit, but still enough that they'll feel a bit of a jolt. Um, some of the Soyuz landings, which um, might be a little bit rougher, but those use soft landing engines, and a lot of astronauts kind of compare those to being almost like a minor car crash because uh, you are still strapped into a seat. Um, and then you're kind of 
hitting into something. So they'll, they'll definitely feel that. And uh, they have been talking about their expectations for rocking in the water. They've been uh, a little graphic at times. It's uh, what they think they might experience uh, with seasickness once they get down. Uh, but as they've told us, there's only one way to find out. But they're prepared for it nonetheless. Yeah. Uh Given the fact that they have both flown on shuttle missions previously and they are both test pilots, Bob and Doug have gone through extensive physical training uh, for all of their missions, including this one. Uh, I have mentioned before that the Gs that we're expecting to encounter during reentry is around four Gs. We also saw about four Gs during the launch portion of the mission. So this really shouldn't be anything too different from what they've experienced previously. Uh, for a point of reference to those of us that haven't been to space, there are many roller coasters across the world that deliver 4Gs or more in throughout the ride or at one point or another. So uh, it's safe to say that 4Gs might sound like a lot for those of us that haven't been to space. It's actually just kind of like a kind of a moderately intense roller coaster so uh we can expect that to they will feel the they will feel the splashdown and they will feel the rocking a little bit if there are waves the most recent weather report indicated that the waves weren't going to be too bad so all in all we are expecting it to be a pretty comfortable touchdown for bob and doug uh on their uh return home to earth <laughs> Our next question comes from Terry and his dog. <laughs> uh, at what speed will the capsule hit the water? Great question. So we are anticipating about 15 or 16 miles per hour uh, will be the speed when the capsule touches down in the Gulf of Mexico. Like we said before, we're targeting just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, that is where Go Navigator, our recovery ship, is in route to. And when the capsule is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere itself is helping to slow it down. We will deploy for, uh, we will deploy parachutes to help further slow it down. And by the time it hits the top of the ocean, it's only going 15 or 16 miles per hour. All right, our next question comes from Ezekiel, who asks one that I think a lot of people are going to be thinking about real soon. How do we get to buy tickets, or how do we get to buy tickets soon for traveling to the International Space Station? That, you know, good timing, um, as that is something we're looking at uh, on the not, in the not too distant future. Uh, NASA recently committed to supporting at least two private astronaut missions a year to the International Space Station. There are a number of companies, SpaceX included, uh, that have been working to kind of develop the capability to fly private citizens, non-government astronauts into space and potentially to the International Space Station. So I would say definitely follow the industry, uh, keep an eye out. Um, the prices will likely be a little bit high at first, uh, especially for most of us, but that really is a major goal right now of a lot of space travel is to try and open it up to those who aren't necessarily just uh, governments. Uh, space travel for so long has just been the realm of governments who would have the budgets to do these kinds of things. And we've seen uh, basically an explosion of commercial activity in low Earth orbit. The International Space Station has been kind of the cornerstone of enabling that entire market with a marketplace and a capability for research and transportation and a number of other things. And we work with a lot of partners in the space industry to try and just grow that even more. Yeah. Another question comes to us from Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. This one comes to us from Chris. How airtight is the ISS? Well, I think it's safe to say that the ISS, the International Space Station, is completely airtight. Given the fact that it is orbiting Earth in the vacuum of space, uh, it has to be airtight in order to make sure that the crew is safe throughout their stay on station. Yeah, it's... It is essentially airtight. There is enough that you will get a tiny little bit of leak sometimes through seals. Um, so it's never anything where you'll be sucked up against the side of a hatch or anything like that. Uh, but just because making something perfectly vacuum proof is extremely hard, especially when you have so many interconnecting parts. That's why we do occasionally have to inject additional breathing gases into the space station atmosphere. Uh, we actually deliver them in these super densified spheres um, called NORS tanks, nitrogen and oxygen regeneration, regeneration system, uh, just to kind of top off the atmosphere inside of the International Space Station. But great question. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's do one more from Andrea. Why are spacecraft usually painted white? 
That is a good question. <laughs> so generally speaking, a lot of it comes down to preference. Uh, all SpaceX vehicles, our operational vehicles, are black and white. Of course, Starship currently is silver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but as of right, that's still in development. But all of our operational vehicles are black or white. Uh, and in this case, it just so happens that uh, in order to conform to that aesthetic, the paint that we use, the thermal protective paint, on top of those panels on the exterior of the capsule, we make it white. <laughs> and, and a lot of other things are white exactly for the reason Kate just said is those thermal properties. Uh, when, when you're in outer space, the only way you can really heat up or absorb heat or reject heat is through radiation. And if you are a black surface, it's just like down here on planet Earth. If you wear a black shirt and you feel hotter, that's because your shirt is basically absorbing more of that infrared radiation. So uh, to help keep things cooler, essentially, you can paint them white with these reflective um, or very uh, low albedo coatings, um, and that can help maintain a better thermal. We have a lot of things we call thermal blankets, which are just essentially white fabrics that will cover up uh, metallic areas of the space station that would otherwise get really hot uh, in direct sunlight that you can keep cool just with that white color. Great question, though. Again, we are taking your questions through the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter, so be sure to continue to submit those. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can throughout the morning. And for now, we're just going to continue to watch Bob and Doug as they zip around planet Earth. We are a little less than three hours away now from things really starting to pick up. Uh, we're going to be looking for all of those events that we talked through, starting with that trunk separation coming up soon. And everything's still on track for a splashdown today at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 Universal Time. So stay tuned.
Dragon SpaceX for 4.700. Okay, Doug, we're just uh, a couple minutes into the uh, planned suit donning time. I wanted to give you guys a go for all sections of 4.700 deorbit orbit preparation. We are standing by to support suit don. Okay, copy that. We are through uh, section 3, and we'll report the status of the... Uh, inventory here in a few minutes and uh, copy go for suit donning and just as a status for that we are in our comfort garments and our orthostatic garments and uh, we have started the fluid loading protocol. Okay SpaceX copies uh, will listen up for that inventory in a few minutes and you got your uh, comfort garments orthostatic garments and have started fluid loading. Thank you for the update. All right, so we just heard a call up to the crew as they're getting into uh, some of their activities to get ready for this deorbit burn. So they're about to get suited up. We heard they're in their comfort garments. So those are essentially the black athletic clothes that they're going to wear as the base layer underneath their suits. They're also in what they called orthostatic garments, and those are essentially compression pants or compression shorts that they're wearing, and that helps to kind of squeeze uh, or that helps to kind of increase the blood flow as they're going to be going from all of the fluids and they're being up around their head uh, to being back in a gravity situation where you're uh, your blood, everything kind of pulls around your legs just due to the pull of gravity. Uh, these garments kind of squeeze the legs and force some of that blood back up. So it's not as kind of a jarring uh, of a transition from the fluid shift happening. So they're doing that to prepare for their readaptation to gravity. Uh, also doing fluid loading, uh, which has been just shown to help with orthostatic intolerance. So uh, essentially they won't feel as uh, dizzy or disoriented once they get back down. Um, it helps by actually increasing the amount of plasma in the blood even um, for once they uh, re-enter gravity. So all that going on board right now on Dragon. Yeah, so it's exciting to hear that they are beginning uh, the it's beginning to enter the last phases that they as crew members need to complete <clears throat> prior to re-entry. Um, we're about two hours and 20 minutes away from the next physical milestone in terms of the vehicle itself. Uh, we'll have what's known as claw separation uh, and that's where the mechanism that basically contains the umbilicals for power and telemetry and fluid uh, between the trunk and the capsule, we will separate that in order to allow us to jettison the trunk. By doing so, the heat shield of the capsule will be exposed and allowing Dragon to be re uh, ready for re-entry. Uh, a couple minutes after we jettison the trunk away from the capsule, uh, we will then maneuver the capsule into a position to allow for it to perform the deorbit burn. This will be the burn that places Dragon on its final trajectory. Uh, we are aiming for the Gulf of Mexico today, specifically off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, is our designated landing zone. Uh, after uh, the deorbit burn completes, which we're expecting that to be about 11 and a half minutes, uh, we will then close the nose cone and lock it. And then a couple minutes after that completes, we'll begin to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and things will start to get pretty hot. <laughs> Yeah, and everything is going to be standing by in the recovery zone once they're done with that deorbit burn, that re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere, and eventually landing under parachutes. This is a live view from the Go Navigator, which is still making its way out to the recovery zone. Uh, it left port just a few hours ago, um, just about two hours and ten minutes ago. Uh, making its way out from Pensacola to the anticipated splashdown zone. It's going to be on station about three nautical miles away from the anticipated splashdown site, at which point it'll take it uh, just around 30 minutes to close in on the capsule following the splashdown. 
Uh, as we did discuss earlier, that was pretty much the only issue that had come up so far today was with a backup generator on the Go Navigator. They were not able to get a replacement one on board in time, but all the flight rules still enable us to go through with this operation. Go Navigator with its primary generator still fully capable of affecting a recovery this morning. Yeah, so that recovery time, we're looking at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 Universal. Uh, so if you want to take a nap, you have a couple of hours before <laughs> the action really kicks in. Uh, but we will continue to be bringing you coverage uh, throughout the entire mission. Um, hopefully we'll have some more great views from Go Navigator, our recovery ship making its way to the uh, splashdown location. Like we said before, the recovery vessel is currently carrying about 40 people. Uh, they all have, it's actually a combination of SpaceX and NASA people. Uh, they all have specific jobs. And uh, whenever we are actually performing the recovery operations, you only see a small handful of those individuals on board because safety is the top priority, not only for Bob and Doug, but also for the personnel on board. So we'll make sure that unnecessary personnel will be away and in one of the uh, one of the back rooms, whereas the operational deck during active recovery mission or during active recovery operations will have those key personnel involved, and we will be able to see the descent all the way through splashdown, uh, as well as the fast boat approach. So those are the two smaller boats that make their way to Dragon after it splashes down. They're the ones that are doing the initial preparation of the capsule, um, preparing it to be lifted out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. Uh, so we have quite a bit coming up, and we're looking forward to being able to show you all of that. Um, as I've mentioned before, the recovery team is a newer one here at SpaceX since, you know, the whole crew recovery process is newer. Uh, and it's really cool that we get to showcase them a little bit. The last time we were able to do so was about a year ago, year and a half almost, yeah. uh, and on the Demo 1 mission. So uh, be sure to stay tuned throughout the entire recovery process because once the capsule is lifted up and out of the water and is secured to the deck of the ship. Uh, that will be our first opportunity to hopefully get a couple thumbs up from Bob and Doug indicating that they're feeling good after their return. Yeah, we expect it to take about an hour from splashdown to them getting out of the capsule. A lot of it will be those initial checks happening in the opening minutes following splashdown, and it'll take about 30 minutes for the primary vessel, the Go Navigator, uh, to get very close to the Dragon capsule itself. And then once it's there, <laughs> It'll take only a few more minutes to lift it up onto the boat and then move it on that nest towards the crew recovery platform. So it's a platform uh, with enough space for just a couple of people underneath the helipad uh, on board the Go Navigator where they'll be able to open up the hatch. Uh, SpaceX's Anil Menon, uh, one of the flight surgeons that works here, is going to be the first one through the hatch. He'll do a quick check on Bob and Doug. Uh, making sure they're ready to come out, and then we'll be assisting them out of the capsule and immediately over into a medical facility on board. Uh, they'll be on there for just a little while, and then we'll look to land a helicopter on board uh, the, the ship, and then they'll catch a quick flight back to Pensacola. Yeah, so after that, they'll also then be transplanted by air, airplane uh, back to Houston after they complete those uh, checkouts at the Pensacola Naval uh, Air Station. And they'll, then the, the best part of the day, family reunions. So I'm sure Bob and Doug are looking forward to being able to give their family hugs again in less than 24 hours. Uh, if you were tuned in earlier in the webcast, you may have caught the special wake-up message sent to Bob and Doug to uh, bring them out of their sleep phase. It was nothing short of precious and adorable, uh, a message from both of their sons. They each have one son, and uh, it was a nice little audio recording saying, Daddy, wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> so I uh, highly encourage you to check it out because uh, it, it is certainly heartwarming and quite a special opportunity to be able to share uh, a moment like that uh, with their family from far away. <laughs> and they were pretty adamant. It's a good thing we have weather because it sounds like those kids are expecting their dads home today. <laughs> I think one of them has got to go get a dog.
so he's excited. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, but everything's gone extremely smoothly with Dragon's Flight. It all started yesterday on Saturday uh, when they loaded in and departed the International Space Station. Uh, since then, we've had a series of steps all executed flawlessly. We haven't had any issues tracked with Dragon during the departure uh, and the setup for Splashdown. Again, today, this is our prime location. Uh, this is our prime opportunity. So once we undock from station, uh, Dragon had uh, an identified prime and a backup, uh, the alternate, which was uh, several days later. Uh, if we were unable to land today, uh, we would target a different site 48 hours later. It's actually about 47 hours from the initial splashdown target to the secondary. And that secondary was locked in a few hours ago as Panama City. But everything's looking great with the weather today. As we talked through, we, were, we had constraints of about 10 miles an hour for the wind. And our initial weather report last night, we were about a mile an hour. And we just got upgraded to about two miles an hour. That so correct. Winds have doubled, but... When you go from one to two miles an hour, we're still well within the limits. Um, so still looking forward to an on-time and, and a good splashdown today. Yeah, the other good news coming out of that most recent most recent weather report uh, is that the waves are also looking really calm. Uh, the, the threshold for the waves is based on how high the wave is going to get and how frequently. So uh, waves occur in this type of pattern. And, you know, for safety reasons, we can't have high waves or waves at a certain height occurring very frequently that makes recovery operations dangerous uh, and we're pleased to report that the last uh, information that we got regarding the weather anticipated at splashdown are very small waves I, I, I pulled up here real quick it was something like uh, yeah here we go just half a foot occurring every six seconds. So you can basically think of it as if your ocean baseline is here every six seconds your ocean if your ocean baseline is here your every six seconds your wave comes up a half a foot every six seconds so uh really calm so it's really glad we're really happy to see that uh while unfortunately the weather in the atlantic ocean landing zones um wasn't really cooperating we're very happy to report that the anticipated weather for splashdown today is going to be mild and uh based on the views that we were seeing from go navigator earlier quite the picture perfect day yeah, and weather is something that we track very closely. If you've been following the mission since May, you know weather was definitely in the conversation back when we launched, where we had to scrub the first attempt just due to some bad weather that moved into the area. But we're able to just kind of pinpoint right between some clouds for that second launch attempt on May 30th. And then we were watching it extremely closely today, too, uh, or even in the lead up uh, to where we are today. And we're going to continue to have weather checkpoints all the way up until about an hour and a half before landing. Uh, that's really the final opportunity we have to wave off. Um, and we actually have a question from Twitter. Just a reminder, use the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter, and we'll try to get to your question throughout the morning. And uh, this one from Demi wanted to know, if the splashdown were to be scrubbed, could Dragon go back to ISS, or could they be in the orbit on their own? Uh, for this mission, we don't have a plan, essentially, to re-rendezvous with the International Space Station. We weren't going to undock until we had good weather at a prime and alternate location. Both were go at the time that we left. Um, so if for some reason we had to wave off within the next hour or so from Pensacola, Dragon would continue in its orbit. It would make some adjustments over the next 47 hours, and then we would target a splashdown at Panama City. We had to lock in that um, that alternate site just a few hours ago. Uh, up until that point, for the first about 15 or about the first 12 hours or so, uh, Dragon has the ability to change alternate sites. So we could have targeted one of the other Gulf sites, uh, potentially even going back to Pensacola on the second uh, two days later. Uh, but we were able to lock in Panama City. And uh, not anticipating to need that, but Dragon does have the ability to wave off and kind of reattempt a splashdown two days later. Yeah, as we've mentioned earlier, Dragon will be will be performing a deorbit burn that'll last 11 and a half minutes. That deorbit burn is the moment where we are sending Dragon on its final trajectory to the landing zone. That deorbit burn maneuvering is performed a little bit less than an hour prior to splashdown itself. So, like Dan said, uh, definitely continuing to monitor weather until. 
you know, the very last moment that we can. But there is a little bit of flexibility there in terms of if we have to wave off for 24 or 48 hours, Bob and Doug would remain in the capsule. All right, our next question comes from Cody Bone O'Brien, who wanted to know what were Bob and Doug doing in space? Well, they spent 62 days on board the International Space Station as crew members of Expedition 63, and they were fully-fledged crew members, so they kind of did the full gamut of space station operations. They did everything from executing science, uh, contributing more than 100 hours of their time to uh, executing science experiments on board from pretty much every discipline we have on there, from biology to technology demonstrations um, to just learning more about the human body and how it adapts uh, to spaceflight. Uh, Bob Bankin was part of four spacewalks along with Chris Cassidy. Uh, the two of them both now have 10 spacewalks in their careers, ties them with Mike Lopez, Alegria, and Peggy Whitson as the most for U.S. astronauts. Um, so they were, they were extremely busy while they were on the space station. I know Chris Cassidy was happy to have some help on board uh, as it's just been him and his two Russian cosmonauts for the last several months. And they're kind of back in that situation now, and that's why we're really looking forward to Crew 1 coming up this fall. Yeah, days on the International Space Station, in addition to spacewalks and uh, performing science experiments, you also have to eat, you have to sleep, and you have to exercise. <laughs> so uh, it's really easy to see how whenever there are only a couple of people on the International Space Station that things that are, uh, you know, exercise, eating, and sleeping are absolutely essential. Exercise helps to keep the body strong and um, try to prevent the effects of uh, that microgravity has on the human body. So uh, when it comes to what might get shifted out a little bit, uh, it's not exercise, it's not eating, it's not sleeping. And so having two extra hands on board to assist with things like space Spacewalk and spacewalks and being able to perform some of the science on board uh, was was definitely a help. But in addition to that, Bob and Doug were also completing mission objectives related to Demo 2 while it was docked, you know, making sure that the battery life was as expected, making sure that the solar panels were still absorbing and generating power as expected. So uh, it, they've... I. I am sure that uh, by the time that they get home, they will be pretty tired, not just from, you know, the dynamic events happening today, but just from the last two months as a whole. I, you know, I'm getting tired just thinking about it. Ready for a break, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, our next question comes from Philip Hartman, who wants to know how much training does it take to be able to operate, control all of the technology on Dragon and the things on Space Station? I can touch on the space station stuff. We typically train crew members for about two years. Um, we've had a couple that uh, kind of cram in that training a little bit shorter than that, but typically crew members get assigned about two years out and spend that entire time training just to do day-to-day -day tasks on board the space station. I mean, that's everything from just operating the basic facilities, uh, learning how to repair all of the major pieces of hardware, like the thing that generates your oxygen or scrubs the carbon dioxide, uh, how the water recycling system works. They get kind of crash courses and operating a bunch of different science hardware that's on board the space station. It's it's you kind of have to become a jack of all trades when you're up there because one day you're a mechanic, the next day you're a physicist, the next day mm -hmm. you're spacewalking, and so they they get a whole bunch of training that they have to take, uh, and it's done all over the world too. Yeah, definitely can't call a handyman when uh, something goes wrong. <laughs> you yeah. are the handyman. Uh, next question it comes to us from Abby. Again, this is the hashtag Ask NASA uh, on Twitter. This may be a silly question, but is there a telescope on the ISS that the crew can use? They don't have a telescope. Uh, they don't actually have very many windows that look up at the stars. Uh, we have a number of science experiments that are on the International Space Station that use its position outside of the Earth's atmosphere to, to look kind of beyond our solar system. Uh, we have some that aren't necessarily telescopes, uh, but like the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is looking for signs of dark matter. Um, and then we have one that was a Japanese payload. The name is escaping me, but it was essentially looking looking for pulsars throughout the universe. And it was really cool. It was essentially developing a futuristic version of GPS, where it was looking to develop a system or a map where you could use pulsars, some of the brightest objects in the universe, uh, to navigate. 
and obviously that's not something we need to worry about right now because we're not leaving our solar system anytime soon, but we're already learning how to do that, and we're using the International Space Station to do it. They have some big lenses for their cameras, but those are pretty much pointed back down towards Earth. Um, our next question wanted to know, how does the communication to Dragon work? Is it done through satellites? Partially, yes. Um, if you think about the International Space Station orbiting Earth, uh, it technically is considered a satellite as well as a spaceship. Really big one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then we also have ground stations uh, across the world that are able to provide uplinks and downlinks from the station, uh, as well as from Dragon Capsule itself. So uh, we try to make all of those connections as, as direct as possible to us here in Mission Control, you know, for uh, trying to reduce latency and make sure that we get high quality feeds so we try to avoid ping-ponging as much as possible uh, but yeah there there are a number of ways uh, but generally speaking we go from capsule to ground in as short of a distance as possible all right our next one comes from Juliet who wants to know does NASA have a full-size mock-up of the space station in a training facility we have several actually uh, we have a building called the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility uh, in, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston where we have uh, a full-size mock-up of every single habitable module. So that's essentially saying every single module you can actually go inside. Uh, there's a huge part of the space station itself that's just external, that isn't pressurized, and the astronauts only really see when they're spacewalking. So to familiarize them with that part, we have a full-size mock-up in the bottom of our swimming pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, a 40-foot deep pool where they practice how to spacewalk. Uh, so we have several, and they're typically of kind of different fidelity is what we call them. So you'll have some that have real racks, real science hardware, real you know oxygen generation system built in. And then you'll have some that are just kind of representative of them. They'll be full size, but they might have uh, like a printed poster of what's on the wall here. But you can still use things like that for emergency training. We, we really try to do as much training on the ground, and I know we do the same in Dragon, in something that's lifelike for what they're about to be flying on once they're in space. So by the time that they get there, a lot of your actions just feel like reflex. So at this point, we're going to check in on Dragon. Looks like it is about to go over Eastern Europe. Uh, we're going to show our uh, ground track here and allow you to follow along. Uh, we still have, let me check my timer here. We still have two hours and one minute until our major milestone uh, begins. That will be the claw separation and preparation to uh, jettison the trunk. Again, that's coming up in two hours and one minute at 10.51 a.m. Pacific or 18.51 Universal. So uh, stay with us and enjoy watching Dragon traverse the Earth.
Dragon for inventory after fluid loading. Okay, SpaceX is ready to copy fluid uh, inventory after fluid loading. From location 10, uh, two additional bottles were consumed from 20, bag 207 and one from bag 206. So that leaves uh, 208 empty, 207 empty, and 206 with two remaining. From location 9, three bottles were consumed from 203. So that leaves uh, 203 and 204 as empties. Everything else is per the packing plan. Okay, thanks for the update. Looks like bag 207 consumed two bottles, 206 consumed one bottle, 208, 207 are empty, and 206 has two remaining. And then from location nine, we copy um, two bottles from 203, I believe, and that means 203 and 204 empty, the rest per packing plan. From location 9, 203 and 204 are empty and everything else is per the packing plan. Okay, copy location 9, correction, uh, 203 and 204 empty, the rest in location 9 per the packing plan. Good, we're back. And uh, just one more sanity check, Bob. Could you just tell us the total number of bottles uh, consumed? Let me uh, try to do the math from my uh, notes here. I believe since departing station, we've uh, consumed 13 bottles. Okay, copy, 13 bottles. Uh, we'll uh, reconcile our records down here and let you know if we got any questions. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Solo. And we're about to close out uh, locations 9 and 10 and be suited, and so it's uh, not going to be practical to go back and re-inventory anything if there's uh, any questions after about uh, three minutes. So um, please let us know if you can uh, early. Okay, copy. And actually, we do have a question for location uh, 10, uh, bag 206. Can you please uh, read back the quantity there remaining? Let me uh, unstow that bag. It looks like uh, I made a mistake. I thought they had three bottles in each one, and I just reported one was uh, removed. I'll have to unstow the bag to count the quantity inside of 206. We have a pretty good readout, Bob, that 206 started at uh, five bottles. So if you uh, know you took two out of there, we can uh, call that one three. From 206, we took a single bottle out. So uh, let me count them for you. Okay, thanks for that double check.
And in location 206, there are four bottles remaining. Okay, four bottles remaining in 206. That math makes better sense to us. Appreciate it.
All right. Well, we are still just getting closer and closer to things really picking up as Bob and Doug get ready to hit the final phase of their flight back to Earth and the end of this Demo 2 mission. Still have a couple of milestones to go, but, I mean, everything picked up when we departed the space station yesterday, and it's been a pretty smooth ride so far. So everything really kicked off back on Saturday as on their 62nd day on board the International Space Station and their 63rd day in space, Bob and Doug began to get the capsule ready for their ride home. Everything picked up when they uh, got all of the final cargo into the Dragon capsule and then got themselves in and then closed that hatch. Uh, crawling in through the top hatch to the Dragon spacecraft, getting suited up shortly thereafter. Meanwhile, on the station side, Station Commander Chris Cassidy closed the A-pass hatch, creating what is known as the vestibule, a space between the two hatches that would be exposed to vacuum following undocking. Then we use valves on the Dragon side to draw the air out of that vestibule in a depressurization step bringing it down to vacuum and getting it ready for that eventual physical separation or undocking. After that was complete, the teams down here on the ground, both in MCCX right behind us in Hawthorne and in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston, did a go-no-go -no -go for undocking, making sure everything was good with systems on board Dragon and the health of the International Space Station. Following that go-no-go, no go, we had a successful separation with Dragon using Draco thrusters around its service section to physically separate from the International Space Station. After hooks had driven back that were holding it in place, it executed those two quick burns. Then it was on to four departure burns spread over a number of hours, initially taking Dragon up and over the International Space Station, which brought it behind, and then after it lowered its orbit beneath the station, eventually bringing it out in front. Front. Uh, following all of those successful departure burns, it was just about time for the crew uh, to get some sleep. Uh, and actually during their sleep period, we were able to do what's known as the departure phasing burn. Uh, it's a little off in this timeline as it actually switched in the they final hours down. leading up uh, with that departure. Dragon SpaceX, we have you loud and clear for suited comm check. I read you the same. Just pausing that timeline as the crew in their suit up steps, they just did a comm check. Um, so they have communications run through the umbilical in their seats directly into their suits where they're able to maintain that conversation with the ground. We heard uh, a little bit of chatters a few minutes ago as they were finishing up that fluid loading. Again, that's done to help with uh, combating orthostatic intolerance. And to put it simply, that's dizziness um, in most people. Uh, fluid loading can actually help. Uh, your body react to uh, what's typically a, a rush of blood away from the head once you get back down in a gravity environment, which can make you extremely dizzy. Um, so fluid loading, you can actually up the amount of plasma in your blood, um, and that just helps kind of minimize that. They're also wearing what's known as an orthostatic garment, um, essentially compression pants that's squeezing their legs and forcing some of that fluid from the legs up towards the upper part of their body. So everything's continuing to proceed. They're suited up inside Dragon uh, for the second time in the last 24 hours as we get ready for this deorbit. Yeah, there on your screen, you can see a shot of our mission control center here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Those folks there are uh, our Dragon operators, they are technical experts that continue to monitor the data and telemetry coming down from Dragon, uh, not only about the vehicle, but of the crew themselves, uh, continuing to make sure that everything is going well and just making sure that we are green or go to step into uh, the next major milestones that we have coming up. Uh, at this point, we're about an hour and a half away from that. Um, those milestones will begin with uh, the claw separation, which is when we initiate the, the jettison of the trunk. Uh, in order to expose the heat shield underneath the capsule, uh, we need to let the trunk uh, go away. So we separate the two. That trunk will actually re-enter the Earth's 
excuse me, the uh, the trunk will actually re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and it'll disintegrate upon doing so. Oh, we got our nice little animation back here, so I'll toss it back over to Dan. Yeah, we did that departure phasing burn. That's what really kind of set us up on our pathway towards where we are today. And then the crew did have a sleep period. Is Again, this is a, about a 19-hour phasing or a 19-hour trip. Uh, from the station to the splashdown. And then as Kate was saying, it was on to, we're almost up to claw and trunk separation. Yeah, so at 10.51 a.m. Pacific or 18.51 United time, or Universal time, uh, we will have that claw and trunk separation, which like I said before, will basically allow us to expose the heat shield and prepare us to execute the deorbit burn. The deorbit burn is intended to place Dragon on its final trajectory to its landing zone, which as we have mentioned before, it's determined to be off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, the do orbit burn will last about 11 and a half minutes. After doing so, we will close and lock the nose cone. Uh, we do this in order to protect the forward hatch located there at the top of the capsule. Uh, and, we're, and we do that after the deorbit burn because the thrusters located there uh, in the forward bulkhead are what we use to uh, actually perform the deorbit burn. So once that nose, clo nose cone is closed, we enter a six minute long communication blackout. Uh, this is because we are re-entering the atmosphere. As we encounter that atmosphere and friction builds up, plasma builds up on the external sides of the capsule, uh, creating a barrier essentially where we can't command the capsule or receive telemetry. However, Dragon is completely autonomous, so totally fine. It's driving itself by, it's driving itself at that point anyway. So uh, we will then, that, like I said, that blackout period lasts for six minutes. A couple minutes after that, we will deploy the drogue parachutes. Drogue parachutes are used to, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to help slow the uh, vehicle down further before we deploy the main parachutes, as well as to stabilize the vehicle. A couple of minutes, about a minute after the drogue parachute deployment, we will deploy the four main parachutes. Uh, if you watched our demo one splashdown, those are big, beautiful orange and white parachutes, and those further decelerate the vehicle down to a mere 15 or 16 miles per hour. That's the speed that they'll be going when they splash down in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we're targeting just off the uh, east coast of Florida near Pensacola. Once splashdown is confirmed and we cut the main parachutes uh, away so they don't uh, uh, so they don't pull the capsule, recovery operations begin immediately. So that entails uh, essentially going, getting the uh, the vessel, excuse me, the, getting the capsule out of the water and lifting it onto the recovery vessel. Uh, and once that is all secure, we open the hatch and we get our first glimpse of Bob and Doug uh, back here on planet Earth for the first time since they launched on Falcon. And nine back in late May. So that particular moment will be the first time there they get to breathe fresh air uh, and we're looking forward to getting some thumbs up from them whenever we see them exit the capsule. And everything's lining up for an on-time splashdown and recovery. We've been following the progress of Go Navigator as it makes its way out to the recovery zone. Uh, it left its port in Pensacola just a few hours ago, and we're tracking that it should be arriving on station uh, just about at the top of this current hour. So it'll be there in advance of all of the upcoming uh, hardware milestones where we get into trunks up and everything like that. So it'll be there and ready uh, with the operational teams a little over. 40 personnel on board from SpaceX and NASA ready to assist in the recovery of the capsule and getting Bob and Doug home. Yeah. So as those mission controllers there in our mission control center here, just to my left, uh, continue to monitor Dragon's health. Uh, we continue to monitor Twitter uh, for your questions. We're using the hashtag AskNASA, and we're trying to get through to as many questions as possible this morning. Our next question comes to us from Jackie. Uh, the question is, what is the name of the Dragon recovery vessel that's sailing to the splashdown location? Great question, uh, especially because we actually have two. The one that we are utilizing today is Go Navigator. This recovery ship is for all of our west coast, or excuse me, of all of the splashdown locations on the west coast of Florida. So any potential splashdown location uh, in the Gulf of Mexico is serviced by Go Navigator. 
For our East Coast landing sites, uh, which we are we will not be attempting today, we use Go Searcher. Both the Go Navigator and the Go Searcher are identical. They have fully, excuse me, they have a fully functional uh, recovery platform as well as medical bays. So it's really nice that we're able to assist uh, the departure process. So departing the International Space Station, it's really great that we're able to assist that departure process by allowing for more opportunities for departure by having more more landing sites. So uh, today we are using Go Navigator, and it departed for the landing zone about two and a half hours ago, I think, at this point. Uh, and it is en route to the designated landing zone uh, just off the coast of Pensacola. All right, and our next question comes from Takur, who wanted to know, what's the importance of inventory check during the splashdown? Uh, if you were just listening a few minutes ago, you heard uh, Bob and Doug going through a, a wide range of inventory checks, and a lot of it was their food and water, particularly the water as they had just completed that fluid loading. Um, as we've talked about a few times today, we have to meticulously track every single item in for, on a spacecraft um, for the obvious reasons, like if an astronaut needs to find it, it helps to know where it is. Um, but but, and then for some of the less obvious reasons, like we have to track where everything is, and if something is missing in the spacecraft, you have to kind of halt work once it's back on the ground and make sure you find it. Um, and then also for things like food and water, that's something we call a consumable. So those are essentially resources that you have a finite amount of. Uh, food, water, obviously one of those. Uh, they have about three days worth of food and plenty of water on board. Um, it wasn't the limiting consumable for this flight home, uh, as was discussed in our uh, pre-return uh, news conference, uh, carbon dioxide scrubbing was uh, kind of the low man on the totem pole uh, for the trip home. They have uh, just about three days worth. Um, so you have to think of all of these different items uh, that are life support systems typically that fall into that consumable port uh, whenever you're kind of mapping just how much on-orbit lifetime that you have. So uh, we knew that we were going to either return today or within 47 hours after that. And so we make sure we have plenty for that situation and then hours beyond that as just extra margin as we're always about redundancy and backup plans and everything like that. Something else to consider uh, with respect to the importance of inventory. Uh, during the reentry period, we don't want anything loose flying around. Uh, that Very is certainly hazardous to the crew. And so taking inventory of what has been unstowed and then restowed allows us to be absolutely sure that something didn't accidentally, because you know, as you're floating there, it is easy to let go of something and then it might drift off to behind the control panel. Uh, like Dan said before, it's very easy for things to kind of drift off on the International Space Station and get lost. Uh, so really having this inventory allows us to make sure that there aren't any foreign objects uh, that aren't supposed to be out during the times in which they are meant to be stowed. So uh, inventory is important for a number of reasons. Our next question comes to us from Tim. He says, my 10-year-old daughter Haley wants to know how hot the exterior of the spacecraft will get during re-entry. Awesome. Well, good morning, Haley, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for tuning into our webcast. We're really pleased to have young viewers joining us uh, for these, this historic mission. So a really good question. The outside of Dragon Capsule will reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very hot, but Bob and Doug will be safe and comfortable inside of the Dragon Capsule. Uh, we have measures in place to make sure that the inside of the capsule will be flushed with cold air, as well as the air inside of their spacesuits. So even though the outside will be getting really hot, Bob and Doug will barely be breaking a sweat. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from Mohan, who wants to know, will the Super Draco thrusters be a backup to the parachutes? That's a good question because one of the earliest designs of Dragon had it doing what's called a propulsive landing. So kind of like how the Falcon 9 comes back, uh, an early design of this Crew Dragon had it landing propulsively, so using those Super Dracos to touch down on like a runway. Um, that's no longer in Dragon's configuration. Uh, in fact, those uh, Super Draco thrusters are completely inhibited following a successful flight into orbit. They're only used 
for an emergency escape situation, either on the pad or during the initial climb up to orbit. They enable Dragon to do that escape uh, from the pad all the way up, so you have kind of that extra safety net your entire way uphill. But once they're on orbit and they're making their way to the space station or even when we're coming home, those thrusters are disabled. We're only using the smaller Draco thrusters around the service section, so the bottom of the capsule itself, uh, and the four at the very top, the forward bulkhead thrusters. Um, our next question from Amy wants to know what happens to the parachutes after splashdown? Are they recovered? Yeah, absolutely. So there will be, after splashdown, there will be two fast boats or smaller boats that will be approaching the Dragon capsule. Uh, the first boat is responsible to for determining that there aren't any uh, toxic vapors surrounding the capsule. Uh, that, that boat that fast boat will then also be responsible for preparing the capsule for lift out of the water. The second boat is responsible for retrieving the parachutes out of the water. Uh, we definitely don't want to leave any waste behind where possible. Um, and so that second boat is responsible for going and retrieving the parachutes. After splashdown, those parachutes are automatically uh, cut so that there isn't, there's no potential that if there was a little bit of wind, that the Dragon capsule wouldn't be moved due to wind catching in those parachutes. So great question, but short answer is, yeah, they're cut, uh, they're automatically cut after splashdown, and then one of the crews from the fast boats is responsible for going to pick them up. The next question we have coming from hashtag AskNASA on Twitter comes to us from Novacon. What will be the purpose of the crew for the Crew-1 mission? The Crew-1 mission will be what we call the first operational flight of the Dragon spacecraft. So the mission we're still on right now is a demonstration. This is still a test mission. This is when we're really proving out Dragon's capabilities from launch all the way through splashdown. After this test, if everything goes well and we're lined up great for a splashdown today, we'll sit down and we'll go through a certification process for SpaceX to fly operational missions. This means they'll be flying regular expedition long duration flights. So the Crew-1 will be the first four person crew to launch in the Dragon spacecraft and then spend six months on board the International Space Station. So we'll have four individuals, uh, Mike Hopkins, uh, Victor Glover, Shanna Walker, and Soichi Noguchi from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency launching in Dragon and then spending six months on board the space station doing science experiments, uh, conducting spacewalks, repairs, everything that a normal expedition crew does. They'll just be arriving and leaving in a dragon. Yeah, I think Commander Chris Cassidy will still be on board with our targeted, given the, the current targeted Crew-1 launch. Basic dragon contact from the PLT. We've got you five by five, Bob. I'm too loud with SpaceX and uh, check between us. And uh, please repeat the last uh, five seconds of that call. We had a bit of a calm dropout. SpaceX is out of clear as well. We have Green, Doug, and I. And, uh, Dragon, we copy that you heard us loud and clear. Unfortunately, the rest of the message was garbled. Please uh, repeat one more time. Yeah, we've got a good comm check between both of us, and we are complete with suit downing for decimal 010. How copy? Okay, that was 5x5. Five five. Uh, we copy that you are complete with suit donning procedure. Okay, it sounds like the crew now suited up. They just conducted those communications checks, those comm checks with the core here in Hawthorne. Uh, the core of the crew operations responsible engineer that's essentially the, the person who's talking directly to Bob and Doug throughout their flight. Uh, that's rotated to, through a couple of different positions as we're on the third shift uh, of their flight home. Um, and that'll be pretty much the person who's getting all of the updates to and from 
uh, Bob and Doug being that liaison between the teams on the ground. Uh, but they, they did those comm checks successfully. They are in their suits. They're going to stay in their suits and in their seats for the rest of the day, pretty much, from uh, that deorbit burn. And SpaceX looking for an update on uh, sections one through four of 4.700 deorbit preparation when able. And SpaceX Dragon, we are complete with uh, sections one through four. And uh, looking at section five, uh, the only thing left there to do is uh, five alpha decimal two. Uh, as far as the uh, yeah, suit link check, I think everything else is complete. Okay, copy uh, sections one through four are complete. And uh, it sounds like um, we have. Uh, Sounds like you're completing fluid loading and standing by for the leak check. That's a good copy, Mike. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. So what we heard there was communication between Dragon and... And, Mike, I just uh, wanted to check back with you on the comm dropout that you had on the, uh, the last two calls that I made to you. How is uh, this comm now? Was it uh, explainable as just random dropouts, or is it uh, continuing from the PLTC? Okay, uh, Bob, we had you five by five just then, much better than before. We're investigating root cause, but given uh, the clarity of your call just now, I would suspect your audio system is healthy. Happy, thank you. Okay, so there we heard a little bit of communication, just confirming that we were uh, that Mission Control was able to read or hear, uh, as it's referred to, uh, Bob and Doug clearly as they have put on their suits. We also heard the go for uh, leak check. So now that the suits are on, we will be performing a quick leak check. We do this every time the suits are put on or donned, as you heard it called. Uh, basically, this is where we pressurize the suits. It's the only time that we pressurize them uh, throughout the mission. And it's essentially to make sure that, you know, all the zippers are in the right, are zipped up properly. All it takes is, you know, one small unzipped piece to not hold the pressure. So we make sure that everything is uh, fitted up accordingly and that it's ready to go in case of the, in case of uh, a need to pressurize the suits uh, later in, in the, in the mission. Uh, unlikely, but it's nice to know, you know, just for that, um, for testing purposes to know that that capability is there. That's what they're designed for. So that leak check will commence. And um, after we get that, uh, will pressurize this, the, the, the suits themselves, and then they will depressurize. Bob and Doug will be able to lift the visor on their helmet again. Uh, and then that's essentially, you know, that's that's what, what they will be wearing uh, during this last phase of their mission as they reenter the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, a lot of good stuff there. Again, nope. It's a, no call there. Fake out. <laughs> uh, like we said before, we're taking your questions through Twitter this morning using the hashtag AskNASA. Our next question comes to us from Robert. Is the U.S. Navy supporting recovery with ships and aircraft? They are not. I suspect that that question comes from the last time we did splashdowns with U.S. spacecraft and astronauts, where we had the Navy assisting throughout the Apollo program for the recoveries. Uh, they are not assisting in this. Uh, all of the uh, recovery assets for the nominal mission are SpaceX. So SpaceX owns both recovery ships, the Go Navigator and the Go Searcher, um, and then contract out with uh, the different helicopters and other assets that are used in this recovery. NASA does have a Department of Defense backup, essentially, uh, if Bob and Doug were to have to splash down anywhere other than those seven sites that we target around Florida, we have the capability to call them up to affect uh, a fast rescue and recovery uh, using para-jumpers or whatever assets are available to us. Uh, th they are also called up on launch days uh, in the event that we were to have an abort on the way to orbit with them coming down somewhere in the Atlantic. But uh, for now, today, everything is SpaceX and NASA. <laughs> 
Another question coming to us from Humzi. Is there a time limit on how long the capsule can be left to float in the Atlantic Ocean before it needs to be recovered? Yeah, so obviously we want to get the crew out as soon as possible, uh, let them get out and stretch their legs and begin their medical evaluations. Uh, however, the capsule would be able to float there for a couple of days, like we mentioned before. Uh, there is enough onboard water and food. Uh, they would be comfortable, uh, although if the waves pick up, I certainly would not be comfortable. <laughs> that being said, uh, we do strive to recover them as soon as possible. Uh, this is part of the reason why we have uh, a numerous potential landing zone sites and we have special criteria for where they actually land to ensure that we're able to get the crew uh, up and out of the water and into the medical uh, bays essentially within an hour after splashdown. <laughs> All right, our next one comes from Mark, who wants to know, can they take over from the computer and do a manual splashdown if required? They can. Uh, initiating a deorbit or an emergency deorbit is one of the capabilities available to crew members on board. You would have to be in a pretty extreme situation to do that. Um, something we're obviously not in today is everything's gone really smoothly with Dragon, uh, but that is something that's available to them. Uh, they also have the capability to manually step in for a number of the different steps during the reentry, uh, both mainly for uh, any parachute deployments uh, or even cutting the parachutes after they've splashed down. Uh, if that doesn't happen automatically, they have a button right in front of them on their displays where they can make that happen. So they do have quite a bit of capability to jump in if required. Yeah, that is one of the few hardwired uh, buttons on their display panel, but it is certainly not one that can be triggered accidentally. It is a two-step verification uh, lever, essentially. So uh, no need to worry about performing an emergency deorbit emergency de accidentally. <laughs> uh, next question comes to us from NASA plus space equals heart. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Uh, will this Crew Dragon be reused? Yes, it will. Uh, this particular capsule is intended to be reused on the Crew 2 mission, which will be launching sometime next year. Uh, and yeah, we already have plans for reuse for it. In fact, the team at the Cape is already preparing to begin those uh, refurbishment processes as soon as the capsule lands, essentially, really getting a head start on that. The capsule is waterproof. Uh, that was a process that we learned how to do through the crew cargo program, uh, our reuse efforts with that program. With our previous version of the Dragon capsule, also known as Dragon One, uh, the process of making that waterproof ha has trans that knowledge that we learned from that has transferred over to crew Dragon capsules, and it's safe to say that uh, it is with uh, very little refurbishment required to the internal hardware. Uh, you know the is. There's very little refurbishment required because we're able to keep it watertight and eliminate any exposure to salt water, which for metallic surfaces does cause corrosion, which is no good for space flight. So uh, short answer is that, yeah, we will be reusing this uh, as soon as next year on the NASA Crew 2 mission. All right, our next one from Lisa. What are Bob and Doug bringing back from ISS, if anything? There's quite a bit, actually. Uh, they have about 150 kilograms or a little over 330 pounds of cargo uh, essentially strapped to the ground right underneath their seats. Uh, the lion's share of that is utilization or science samples, uh, a lot of it cold stowage samples that's kept in powered freezers. Uh, those samples coming from a range of biological, biomedical studies, uh, a lot of them with the astronauts themselves as the, as the test subjects. Uh, as cargo return, a pretty critical capability as we do, we execute a lot of the science on station, but we need to return a lot of the samples for analysis down in labs here on Earth, and they're going to be bringing a lot of that down. Uh, they're also returning some vehicle hardware items uh, that have either malfunctioned or just passed their service life and need to come home or get inspected. Um, and then a couple of their personal items, things like their sleeping bags are coming back with them. 
Uh, and they also have a couple of special items we've touched on a few times, including that Tremor dinosaur uh, that was chosen by both of their sons as their zero G indicator for this mission, uh, and the flag that was left there by Doug Hurley and his fellow crewmates of STS-135, the final space shuttle mission that is coming home. It's been up there for just about nine years, and it will fly again when we send humans around the moon in the not too distant future. And I know we haven't seen it, but I have heard that Little Earth is also coming back. I almost forgot about <laughs> that. Uh, he, Little Earth was the zero G indicator on Demo 1 and remained on station after that mission, and it's pretty sure it was packed away to come home on Demo 2. I think you're right. <laughs> so right now, Dragon is currently flying over the far south Pacific Ocean. Uh, we have a nice little map here to show you of our ground tracking. So there you can see it on your screen. Uh, if you're curious, the yellow indicates where the capsule is in daylight. The red part of the line indicates where it goes into eclipse or uh, whenever it's basically hiding in Earth's shadow. So right now it's in daylight. Bob and Doug must be getting some pretty spectacular views as they're completing their suit up process. Uh, but at this point, we're going to take a quick break and leave you with our lovely ground map here. Dragon SpaceX for video. Go ahead. Yeah, request to come back aboard when y'all are ready. We are ready for you to come aboard. Outstanding and work.
Dragon SpaceX, you are go for procedure 4.011 suit leak check. Check and work. Okay, so we just heard the crew now stepping into suit leak checks. As we've described a few times, this is when they're actually going to pressurize uh, their suits that they wear for launch and entry, and really any of the dynamic phases of the mission. Uh, so they'll completely zip up and seal the suits and then flow nitrox in they to control. Dragon in two decimal two, we are ready to pressurize. Dragon SpaceX, you are go to pressurize. So Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley getting to the go. They're going to pressurize their suits. So pressurized nitrox now going to flow in. Again, these suits are, we have confirmation the leak check is in progress. So these suits are worn as just another line of defense to help protect the crew members um, from the, really the harsh environment of outer space. Uh, if they were to experience a cabin depressurization, uh, any kind of poisonous leak in their atmosphere, um, or even a fire, these suits are designed to protect from all of those different instances. Um, so the suit leak check is pretty standard. Anytime before we get into one of these dynamic operations, we just want one more check to make sure that the suit is ready to go in case it's called upon. Um, and so they'll pressurize now and flow some nitrox, some uh, nitrogen and oxygen uh, through their suits. They'll look for it to maintain a constant pressure uh, and then once that's done, they'll depressurize the suits and they'll leave the zipper open. To, uh, they'll typically leave uh, one zipper, just unzip a little bit uh, when they're not pressurized. Uh, they'll still have cool air flowing through. In fact, they'll do what's called a suit purge uh, just before we do the deorbit burn. So at the same time, they uh, flush the cabin atmosphere itself with uh, some cool down air. They'll flow some cooled air through the suits just to help uh, regulate the temperature, the cooling effect inside the capsule, uh, just to make sure the environment stays at a comfortable temperature for them while the Dragon capsule itself heats up to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So we got about a minute left in this suit leak check. We'll wait for the results on that and we'll just be one more box checked on our way to the upcoming uh, trunk step, deorbit burn, re-entry, and splashdown. And one interesting thing to note, if you're watching this ground track, you're gonna start to see uh, that line coming out of the bottom left corner and ending in the gulf, That's that means we are on our final orbit. And so Dragon's basically on its last lap around planet Earth. The last 90 minutes it's going to spend uh, until we just about get to that splashdown. So you can keep an eye on that. The line's going to stop moving uh, where you can see it terminate in the gulf. Dragon SpaceX, we show nominal leak check.
So there a minute ago we had confirmation of nominal leak check. Again, that's just ch checking another box off on the to-do list as uh, Bob and Doug continue their return home back to planet Earth. Uh, up next, we will be making sure that the nitrox system is safe uh, and that we are able to proceed into uh, the next phases of our of our uh, descent to the uh, the Gulf of Mexico. We are aiming for a splashdown site just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Right now, our recovery ship is en route. Uh, to that designated location zone, and it will be there ready and waiting for Bob and Doug to splash down. There are your screen. We do have a live shot from Go Navigator. Again, that's our recovery ship located in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you can get a little bit of a feel for that wave action that we got there. Generally speaking, pretty calm looking based on the waves that we can see there in the shot. Uh, and yeah, so we're excited to be able to welcome Bob and Doug back home. Uh, just checking my timeline quickly. Their landing will be coming up in just under two hours. We're looking at uh, an hour and 57 minutes. Uh, that will be happening at 11.48 a.m. Pacific time, 18.48 universal coordinated time. Before we get to their water landing, uh, we have to perform a couple of steps prior to that. If you've been following along with us this morning, you're probably very familiar with this. Uh, but for perhaps those of, those of you who have joined in within the last few minutes, uh, at this point, we are exactly an hour away from the next physical milestone that needs to be completed prior to uh, Dragon Endeavor's return to planet Earth. Those activities will begin with claw separation. The claw is what connects the umbilicals, uh, the power, the telemetry, the fluids uh, between the dragon capsule and its trunk. In order to expose the heat shield in preparation for dragon's re-entry through the atmosphere, we need to jettison the trunk. It will disintegrate upon entering the Earth's atmosphere itself. So once we separate that, uh, we're now able to step into what's called slew to deorbit burn attitude. That's essentially maneuvering the capsule into position uh, to perform the deorbit burn. The deorbit burn is where we fire the four Draco thrusters that are located at the top of the capsule uh, near the forward hatch. We call those the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters. Those will be utilized to perform the deorbit burn. Uh, It'll last about 11 and a half minutes. That deorbit burn is what will be placing Dragon in its final trajectory to the exact landing location. So like I said, that'll be about 11 and a half minutes long. After that burn completes, we want to close the nose cone and lock it up. Uh, like I said, that's where the forward hatch is located. And since these capsules are designed to be reusable, we definitely want to protect those thrusters and that hatch because that is the hatch where the astronauts uh, basically exit and enter the capsule when they're going in and out of the International Space Station. So once we have that nose cone uh, locked it in place, we then enter, uh, we begin to enter the Earth's atmosphere. Here. And SpaceX uh, for deorbit burn brief. Go ahead. Okay, first off for uh, timing, showing no changes. Your tablet and onboard times on your timeline are within about one minute or less of our ground estimates. How copy? Copy. Uh, timing on board is. Uh, the iPads and uh, within a minute. And even better, the uh, onboard uh, countdown in your timeline should be within a few should be within a few seconds. So looking pretty good um, for the vehicle. Endeavor is looking great for entry. Uh, the ready comm during bombs comm check earlier uh, we consider temporary, and we are not tracking any system issues. How copy? Endeavor's in good shape and good come from the PLT. Okay, uh, as far as recovery goes, Go Navigator is uh, 
just about uh, at the recover in position, so within a few kilometers. In addition, the uh, WB is airborne. Her recovery team is a uh, go at this time. Go for recovery, copy off. Yep, and one quick go back, recovery has arrived, so they are on station. Um, in addition for the weather, uh, I'm looking at the weather right now from Go, or the water video from uh, Go Navigator, and it looks like glass, it's awesome. Uh, the latest splashdown forecast, though, is uh, winds at 2 decimal 25 knots, wave height less than a foot, and a six second period. How copy? Copy, winds, waves, and weather. All right, so there we heard the deorbit briefing. This is basically the opportunity that the core here. Okay, Doug, that's all we got for the burn brief. We'll talk to you shortly before deorbit sequence start. Copy all, thanks, Mike. And uh, correction there, we'll have uh, the go-no-go no go for you shortly. That'll be the next step. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, the, the burn briefing there, just making sure that everyone's on the same page. Since Bob and Doug's primary primary role during re-entry is to monitor telemetry, timing, uh, and data, it is important to make sure that their onboard timers, or, or basically time listings, are synced with the most recent trajectory simulations that we've generated here uh, in, in mission control. So that's what that was, just making sure that their, their t sequence of events was lining up with the uh, with what we're seeing down here uh, in in mission control, so. Uh all really good stuff there. We also heard that the recovery vessel Go Navigator is in position, uh, so it is ready and waiting for splashdown, which, like I said before, uh, will be occurring at 11:48 a.m. Pacific, 18:48 Universal, and we're just under two hours from that happening. So uh, I don't know about you, Dan, but as we're stepping into these checks and these, and uh, you know, we did the leak check, we did have, to, have done a couple of com checks, and now we're talking about deorbit burn. My heart's starting to go. We're it's, getting there. It's starting to feel real. We're, we're, we're waking back up. Yeah. It's, it's time to bring these guys home. And I mean, hearing, hearing the core call up, the water looks like glass from their ship views. That's exactly the, the type of thing we want to hear. Uh, the wind has picked up a tiny bit to 2.25 knots. It's about 2.6, a little under 2.6 miles per hour. So still well within our margins for what we were looking for, for accept, acceptable splash sound weather. Um, right now in the room behind us and over in Mission Control Houston, teams are just doing a final go, no go. And so that should wrap up over the next couple of minutes. And then we'll hear them call that up to the crew members when they get the final go to do the deorbit burn. Um, but we'll be doing all of the other activities prior to that, uh, including the claw and trunk separation, and then just getting ourselves ready for deorbit burn. So things are definitely going to start picking up uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, really, the next hour is, real, is really where things start to happen. Um, but we're, we do have a couple of uh, moments now to get joined by a special guest. Dragon, SpaceX is go for the deorbit burn, and the burn has been enabled. That's a great call to hear. Denver County, go for the deorbit burn, and we see it on board. All right, so we just heard it. That means uh, both the SpaceX and NASA teams are go for deorbit burn. So we are uh, counting down to that, that deorbit burn. Uh, still a bit of a ways off. It's just under an hour from now from starting for that 11 and a half minute burn. But for now, as we are go for deorbit and return of Bob and Doug, we're going to send it over to the uh, the Johnson Space Center real quick, where Courtney Beasley is standing by in Mission Control Houston, along with uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, also there in Houston. So Courtney. Thanks, Dan. Yes, joining me in a studio here at NASA's Johnson Space Center is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Another historic day for our agency, returning humans to Earth in a commercially built and operated spacecraft. How is this mission paving the way for the future? Well, it's a great question, and I, I think um, it's really 
establishing the business model for the future. So you can see today I'm wearing my Artemis shirt. Uh, and when we go to the moon, we're going to go with commercial partners. Um, and, and, you know, NASA's goal here, we don't want to purchase, own, and operate the hardware the way we used to. We want to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. But we also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation and safety uh, and really create this virtuous cycle of, of economic development and capability. And that's, um, that's what today's return is going to represent. This is the next era in human spaceflight where NASA gets to be the customer. Uh, we want to be a strong customer. We want to be a great partner, uh, but we don't want to be the only ones that are operating with humans in space. And while on board, Bob and Doug were, of course, conducting science experiments and spacewalks. And how are NASA's efforts on this station contributing to life back here on Earth? So when we think about the International Space Station, um, it really is focused on how do we do those transformational activities that benefit human life here on Earth. And uh, certainly, um, you know, when we think about advanced, uh, advanced materials, industrialized biomedicine, these are the things that we're developing every day. Some examples would include, as far as advanced materials, very, very thin materials like an artificial retina for the human eyeball, so somebody who has macular degeneration might not have to lose their eyesight in the future. Um, we can only create materials that thin in the microgravity of space. We cannot do it here in the gravity well of Earth. But that's just one of so many examples. When we think about how we compound pharmaceuticals, when we think about how we um, you know, create immunizations for things like salmonella um, and, and other diseases, um, th these are capabilities that are available to us because of the resource that is microgravity. Um, but, it, you know, advanced materials, things like very pristine fiber optic cables, we call it ZBLAN, for example. These are all things that we think that there is a marketplace for the future. So, look, right now we're doing commercial resupply of the International Space Station. As of today, uh, when Bob and Doug come home safely, we will be doing commercial crew to the International Space Station. The next big thing is we need commercial space stations themselves. And in order to create the market for commercial space stations, we have to have these transformational capabilities that come from the microgravity environment. And that's really what we're developing right now. And as you know, a big day for NASA today, but how about a big week? This week alone, we launched Mars 2020. Artemis One's launch vehicle stage adapter was delivered to Kennedy Space Center. And here we are completing the first commercial, commercially crewed mission to the International Space Station. What are your thoughts on the state of the agency at this point? So make no mistake, uh, NASA's budget right now is the highest it's ever been in nominal dollars. Um, and, and it's at, you know, $22 billion. The budget request that President Trump gave us that is before the House and the Senate right now is $25.2 billion. It's not just about sustaining, you know, capabilities like commercial crew, commercial resupply, the International Space Station. It's also about developing new capabilities so that the United States of America can stay the preeminent spacefaring nation. It's why we created the Artemis program to go to the moon sustainably with commercial partners and international partners to use the resources of, of the moon to live and work for long periods of time and then take all of that knowledge onto Mars. And of course, as you mentioned on Thursday, you know, we launched uh, the, you know, another Mars mission. The most sophisticated robot that NASA has ever developed is right now on its way to Mars. And we're going to prove that we can turn the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars into pure oxygen for life support. But there's so many other things. We're looking for life on another world. We're looking for signs of ancient life um, on Mars. Um, we're talking about microbial life, but life nonetheless. And um, this, is, this is really a, a bright moment for NASA. I want to be clear, though. Um, we need support from our members of Congress in both the House and the Senate. Uh, we, we need to be able to get that $25.2 billion budget that we have requested. Um, and so I'm working with members of Congress and senators on both sides of the aisle every day, uh, doing town halls across the country. We are in great shape. Uh, but in order to stay number one in the world, uh, we're going to need we're going to need the resources that, that, that the president has requested. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Such an exciting day. And in case you missed it just moments ago, both SpaceX and NASA are both a go for deorbit burn. So with that, we'll send it back to Dan and Kate at Hawthorne for the latest.
All right. Thank you so much, Courtney. Great to hear from the administrator. And we're we're in it now. We're we're kind of in the final stretch. This is what I feel like we've been waiting for for the last <laughs> couple of hours, and it feels pretty great to be here. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, in this next phase of the mission, Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning Bob and Doug home. Uh, as you've heard us talk a little bit so far this morning, uh, Dragon will maneuver to the correct attitude and jettison its trunk, uh, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the um, of the assembly. Uh, we need to expose the heat shield in order to prepare the capsule for uh, atmospheric reentry. So uh, we. We will, oh, there we got a nice view of Bob and Doug in their suits. This is the first time we've seen them in their suits and in their chairs this morning. So there they are tapping away, preparing uh, to initiate the uh, deorbit sequence. So yeah, let's talk I mean, a little, I'm sorry, I was, go ahead. I was gonna say, just like in the lead up in the last couple of minutes, we heard they had good suit leak checks. As Kate described earlier, once the leak checks are complete, they don't keep the suit pressurized, so visors are open. Uh, they're going to have cool air running through their suits and the cabin and just getting ready for the ride. Yeah. Uh, whenever they are re-entering the atmosphere, the external temperature will reach about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The internal temperature of the cabin, however, will stay around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we have a couple of systems in place to keep it cool and comfortable for Bob and Doug as they are returning. Uh, like Dan just said, there will be some cool air flowing through their suits. The cabin itself will also be purged with cold, cooler air as well. Uh, so that will assist in making sure that the temperature stays pretty temperate uh, inside the capsule. And I mean, we're, we're just 42 minutes and 50 seconds away from things really kicking up. And this is going to be when we really start to do uh, that first maneuver to get ready to jettison the trunk. And then we'll do that claw and trunk separation. And then it's time for just kind of that final firing of those engines, that really just that downhill ride. Yeah, those uh, forward bulkhead thrusters, uh, there are four of them, four of those Draco thrusters there at the top of the capsule near the nose cone. Those will be utilized to perform the deorbit burn. This burn is what will essentially give Dragon its final trajectory back home. Uh, this is the last burn that the capsule will perform. If you've been following along since yesterday, Today afternoon, you know that there have been a number of burns completed. This deorbit burn will be the final one. It will last about 11 and a half minutes. After that burn completes, uh, we no longer need to utilize those Draco thrusters, and we want to protect the forward hatch up there, so we close the nose cone and lock it up. Uh, we're expecting that event to happen at 11, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, about uh, 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 10 minutes, or excuse me, uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Wow, mental <laughs> math on air is hard. <laughs> uh, 25 minutes after that, the capsule will be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, and like I mentioned, approaching about 3,500 degrees, and that's because we're we're in that heat of re-entry, and so that's where things will really heat up for Bob and Doug on their re-entry, uh, and that's where we'll have that comms blackout. Um, and we actually have a Twitter question that's germane to this right now, where Stephen asked, during the blackout, will you not be able to communicate with Bob and Doug, but you will be able to track them? And it's it's kind of a mix. Uh, we won't be able to talk to Bob and Doug. We won't be able to send or receive any data from the Dragon spacecraft. So we won't have basically telemetry-driven tracking, but we know exactly where they're going to be as their orbit's already been calculated. We've had this orbit calculated since yesterday, essentially. It's gotten fine-tuned as we've done those burns, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll know exactly where they're supposed to be even though we can't communicate during that time. Exactly, and even though we won't be able to send or receive signals uh, or commands or telemetry, Dragon is designed to be fully autonomous. Uh, at that point, it is driving itself anyway, so there's really nothing to be worried about Bob and Doug's primary function at that point is to monitor all of the telemetry that they see on their screens and to stay comfy. Yeah, and uh, once they're through that, uh, that really that initial entry, um, we'll have that part called entry interface, which we 
uh, kind of explained as that's when the capsule's really experiencing aerodynamics. They've been flying around in the vacuum of space with no air, so no lift, drag, stuff like that on their capsule and entry interfaces where they're really starting to hit the, the atmosphere and it's affecting the capsule. And it'll continue to use its Draco thrusters on the service section to really guide it back home. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of guiding it back home, <laughs> here come the parachutes. At 11.44 a.m. Pacific or 18.44 Universal Time, we are, we're going to be deploying the drogue parachutes. Drogue chutes are utilized for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, to continue to further decelerate the vehicle uh, and also to stabilize it. Like Dan said, it will be experiencing some of those aerodynamic pressures. And so we want to make sure that the, the capsule is well and stable. And, before we deploy the main parachutes. Those main chutes will be deploying at 11.45 a.m., and there will be four of them. Those will essentially deploy, and it takes a couple seconds for them to fully inflate. So it might look a little funny at first, uh, but we assure you that they are working properly, and it just takes a couple seconds for the air to continue to catch in them and for them to fully expand uh, to their large, rounder shape. So after those chutes deploy, it only takes three and a half minutes for a bob and dub to splash down. Uh, that'll be occurring at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 Universal. And like we've mentioned before, our splashdown location is off the coast, off the western coast of Florida. We're aiming for a location near Pensacola. Uh, our recovery vessel Go Navigator is currently in location, ready and waiting for splashdown. They're actually going to be waiting about three nautical miles away from that splashdown point. Yeah, we got the call that they were on station. We also got the call that the NASA WB-57 airplane is in the air. And we've actually seen a couple of brief spurts of video. That's the airborne asset that we'll have. That WB-57 is a high-altitude research plane uh, that NASA flies. It's outfitted with a number of imaging cameras. Uh, the main one that we'll be seeing is an infrared one. Um, if you watched the demo one splashdown, which I'm sure you all did, uh, you were able to see uh, that first, and this is actually a glimpse of that WB-57 camera. Um, we'll be getting this back, and uh, if we acquire it the same time we did for Demo 1, uh, we were able to see the capsule while it was still in that atmospheric reentry. so it was just this really bright light that all of a sudden lit up the sky, and that was the first view we got of Dragon. And so we'll use that to hopefully see uh, during the entry and then the initial parachute deploys, and then we'll have a couple more assets on the ground or on the water on the boat uh, that will get a couple more views of Dragon as it delivers Bob and Doug safely to the ocean. Yeah, so as you can hear, the, all of this excitement will be happening in pretty rapid succession. Uh, on your screen now, we can see closest to the, to the camera, we have NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. Uh, he is the, the pilot or the commander for this particular mission, and then two there now on the camera to the right is astro NASA astronaut Bob Benkin. Uh, we are very fondly looking forward to uh, bringing our space dads home this morning, uh, and it looks like, uh, like we mentioned before, that'll be happening in about an hour and a half. Again, targeting Splashdown for 11:48 a.m. Pacific, 18:48 Universal Time. But like we mentioned before, the action really begins at the claw separation milestone which is slated for 10.51 a.m. Pacific in about 38 minutes from now. So, uh, again, we are continuing to take questions this morning through Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Our next question comes to us from F1 Fanatic. Do the astronauts need to have face masks down during reentry? That is a great question. Very astute observation that those visors are in the upward position. So right now, the suits are unpressurized and Bob and Doug are breathing just the, the normal cabin air. Those face masks, the, our visors as we refer to them, uh, do need to be lowered and uh, locked during the reentry period. We need the, the spacesuit to be fully enclosed during the more dynamic elements of operations and certainly the reentry period is one of them. So we'll actually at one point during the deorbit burn preparation 
uh, phase, we will actually hear communication between uh, ground station, or from ground here, mission control headquarters at SpaceX to Bob and Doug, just to confirm and double check that those visors are, uh, are in place where they should be. Our next question comes to us from Philip. Where exactly are the parachutes stored before deployment? They are stored on uh, in two separate compartments on the Dragon spacecraft um, on a side of the vehicle that has a deployable panel. Um, the drogue parachutes are stored in the kind of the upper part, it's called the upper bulkhead, um, and they're deployed by two drogue motors um, or mortars. Uh, so pyrotechnics that are fired to actually deploy those drogue parachutes. Um, just further down the panel, kind of at the base of the spacecraft, is where the four main parachutes are stored. And again, those get drawn out by the drogue chutes. Um, there are redundant systems in place to make sure uh, that if uh, the first set of mortars don't fire, you have backups to get these chutes deployed. Um, we're uh, one fault tolerant on both the, uh, the drogue parachutes and the main parachutes. Um, so one out of two droves and three out of four mains uh, is what the vehicle's been rated and tested to. Uh, we've, uh, SpaceX has done uh, a tremendous amount of testing on these parachutes, uh, even within just uh, the last several months in the lead up to the mission. Uh, as parachutes, obviously a very critical part of the reentry. Um, and this is something that is very meticulously packed and documented before the start of any mission. Uh, and NASA assisting SpaceX as we have some experts who have been involved in parachute missions uh, for decades. Um, but uh, the parachutes are stored under deployable panels and we'll see them uh, basically fire open as the as the parachutes come out and deploy at the different altitudes. Yeah, those panels are basically located above and below the side hatch uh, panel. So if you are looking at the Dragon capsule, uh, the, you know, the anchor point for those parachutes will ensure that the side hatch will effectively be uh, as far away from the ocean uh, surface as possible, ensuring that we're able to expedite the process of um, egressing Bob and Doug from the capsule and the whole recovery process as a whole. Great question. All right, our next one comes from Scott. He wants to know what are the tablets on their legs used for? What kind of devices are they? I think you've heard him call out a few times that they're using iPads uh, on board and they're really just uh, essentially their user manuals. Uh, they're able to dial up different procedures, uh, checklists, things that they're looking for throughout uh, their flight. They get, they're they able to Velcro them essentially to their suits. Um, and just like uh, the uh, the main displays in front of them, they're touchscreen enabled and they have the touchscreen capable gloves in their suits. Uh, it's really just another information source. Um, Dragon doesn't have the big paper manuals that we were used to in the shuttle era and things like that, uh, just kind of streamlining everything as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Like we mentioned before, this is a demonstration mission, and so Bob and Doug's job here is to make sure that everything is working as it should be. So a lot of what they're doing is going to simply be monitoring, well, not simply, <laughs> Paying attention can be, uh, especially whenever you, there's a lot going on dynamically around you, is staying focused can be tough. So it's yeah. not an easy job what they have coming up. But they will essentially be responsible for monitoring all the data and telemetry that's being received on screens. And part of the debriefing that will happen once they get back on land is quite simply, was there anything that happened in reality that you weren't expecting or differed from what you were instructed would occur? So making sure that in the future fully uh, operational uh, missions that we have, starting with Crew-1, launching later this year, uh, that those crews are fully prepared and that we make those, essentially those instruction manuals that they do have access to as perfect as possible uh, because it is essential that we we have correct information and that the crew is informed and aware of all the operations that are going on regardless of whether or not they may not they're not the ones necessarily commanding because the vehicle is autonomous uh, but it is important that they they do they do know what's going on 
All right. Our next question comes from Sam. Might be the most important one of the day. Wanted to know if Bob and Doug can listen to the SpaceX <laughs> webcast when they're inside the Dragon capsule. I mean, I certainly hope so. It's not like they have too much else on their mind. Right. <laughs> um, no, they're not able to listen to us, but one kind of fun fact that always kind of makes us geek out a little bit is the crew members on board the space station will usually get uh, NASA TV pumped up to them anytime their crewmates are launching or landing. So they're able to watch uh, their friends and former crewmates as of just a few hours ago return home. So, uh, Chris, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> Great question. Another one comes to us from Ruhr Rocker. Does the Dragon capsule have windows where Bob and Doug can look out? Absolutely. Uh, actually, one of my favorite pictures that Doug Hurley has posted on Instagram to date was actually one of the first pictures he posted at the beginning of this mission was a shot of what he could see outside of Crew Dragon's windows. Uh, there is a window located on either side of the side hatch, and uh, it, it certainly will provide um, visual uh, confirmation that re-entry is happening like Dan mentioned before. They'll be able to see uh, a little bit of the energy that's being um, that's being expelled during the re-entry period. Uh, you know, some of those pieces of the ablative material as they heat up and are designed to flicker away, uh, they'll actually be able to see that from, from the windows themselves. So it'll be quite the fireworks show. <laughs> All right, our next one comes from Joe. Wants to know, does the Dragon Capsule have Netflix? <laughs> Another important question. Yeah, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, as our as our views here of the capsule cycle through, uh, we'll be able to see what their screens look like. There we go. So there in the center screen, we actually have the ground tracking map. As you can see there, actually it might be kind of hard to make out, but uh, Dragon is actually uh, in uh, crossing over the Atlantic Ocean, now approaching what looks like uh, England and Ireland. So it will be crossing over into Europe soon. Um, and also on those screens on to the left and the right of that uh, ground track screen were their telemetry screens. So uh, those will be the, the interface that they use during the uh, during the deorbit burn, uh, and that's what they'll essentially use to make sure that everything is looking good and performing nominally. Yeah, and I mean, the that center screen that you just saw, that's essentially the same map that we've been looking mm -hmm. at uh, throughout our coverage here today. So uh, they're looking at a lot of the same data that we're trying to give you guys down here on the ground, just where are they over the Earth? Because uh, it can be a little disorienting uh, to look out the window and figure it out quickly. Uh, but they're able to see just how far along their orbit they are, where those milestones are coming up. Um, so they can just, again, they're, they're in a monitor mode and they're ready uh, locked and loaded to jump in if required. Um, our next question comes from Roshan, who a uh, seven-year-old Ian wants to know, why is the Dragon capsule cone-shaped? Uh, for a very specific reason, and it's why a lot of cat or a lot of spacecraft are in a capsule shape. Um, when they were trying to really figure out the most efficient way to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, um, uh, both from uh, handling the trajectory um, without having uh, wings like a space shuttle, um, you are starting over. When they were really first trying to figure out how to uh, best shape a spacecraft to efficiently and effectively re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in the safest configuration, where they essentially landed on was a cone shape. Um, or, or a capsule shape. They, they, there were uh, very initial drawings that you could find all manner of spacecraft that were put into wind tunnels. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, all the way back in the early days of spaceflight, when we were in the in the Mercury, um, and uh, the the very early days, uh, they were able to determine that the capsule shape was really the most efficient. That shape of heat shield dissipated the heat the best, uh, was the easiest to control, and was really the safest option. And physics haven't changed since the 60s, at least not a great deal. Um, so that's why you still see a lot of capsule-shaped uh, spacecraft, and it's really just for re-entering an atmosphere. Good question. So there on your screen, again, we have live shots coming from Dragon Endeavor as it is 
making its way back towards Earth. We are in approaching the final steps of the day of, of the mission, in fact. Uh, and at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.18 uh, a.m. or p.m., excuse me, <laughs> uh, Universal, we will, we will have the, the splashdown of Dragon Endeavor. So right now, Bob and Doug are essentially cycling through, preparing for uh, what we call deorbit burn initiation. Uh, this will be where uh, there's a the deorbit burn is is what will be placing Dragon on its specific on its final trajectory to a specific landing location. Uh, that location has was. There were seven possible ones. We determined the best one for today's reentry uh, to be off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. The recovery vessel Go Navigator is in place, ready and waiting. Uh, and it seems like Bob and Doug are pretty comfortable there. They are in their spacesuits. The leak check has been performed and we got the call out that it was nominal. So everything good there. Right now, those visors are in the up position. Uh, they will be closed and locked whenever we get into the dynamic portion here upcoming in just a few minutes. Checking my timeline here. We're just about 24 minutes and 20 seconds from things really picking up. That's when we'll start to get into the attitude to separate the trunk. And just about eight minutes after that is when we'll start the deorbit burn. Uh, and again, that'll be the longest burn of Dragon's return journey. Uh, the latest timeline we got had it lasting for about 11 minutes and 22 seconds. It'll be the last firing of those forward bulkhead thrusters. Um, the four Dracos at the very top of Dragon that'll eventually be covered up by the nose cone following the deorbit burn. And as we've said before, that deorbit burn is what commits them to coming home. When that happens, that capsule is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And that'll put them essentially on a collision course with planet Earth. It, it lines up their, their orbit uh, to intersect with that splashdown point in the Gulf of Mexico. While we have just a few more minutes until we get to that, we still have some questions coming in. Again, if you have one, jump over on Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, this one comes from Scarif Survivor, who wants to know, does Dragon lose radio data contact with satellite or ground stations during reentry? And the answer is really everything. Uh, as that plasma uh, builds up around the spacecraft, it essentially prevents signals uh, being sent or transmitted or received by Dragon's antennas around the outside of the spacecraft. So uh, it's both satellites and ground stations um, that it won't be able to communicate with. But again, Dragon continues flying itself. Uh, we know what its orbit is plotted out to be, so we know where it is, and we even know the expected time of that calm blackout in about six minutes. So. Uh, it does lose contact with everything. We won't be able to hear from Bob and Doug until they're on the other side uh, of that blackout, and then we'll reestablish communication with Drag. All right, we have another one from Nettie Banda. Wanted to know how many seats are in Dragon. So as you can see on your screen there, there are actually, uh, I guess one is hidden, there are actually four chairs there available. We will be utilizing all four seats on the Crew-1 mission uh, launching later this year. 
currently targeted for September. Uh, right now, Bob and Doug are only occupying two of them as this is a demonstration mission. So uh, yeah, we will be utilizing all four of those seats in future missions, but as of right now, uh, I believe it was on the uh, launch portion of the mission, one of those seats was occupied by Tremor, who if you've been following along is the sequin dinosaur uh, that was voted on by uh, the two sons from Bob and Doug as what should be the zero G indicator. So Tremor was strapped into a seat during ascent and when they got the okay to release him, he started floating into the capsule and uh, uh, you know gave us its sequined glory there in <laughs> on the edge of space. <laughs> All right. Well again just another time hack as we're coming up on these for just a little over twenty minutes the start of all of our deorbit burn sequencing starting. Um, so we're looking at that to, to really pick up at about uh, 1048 as we'll start getting into the attitude for trunk separation. And then we start basically executing a bunch of steps that are going to commit Bob and Doug to this re-entry. Yeah, we're looking forward to those. Uh, it will be it'll be quite the journey. Now, of course, uh, with respect to the deorbit burn, Bob and Doug will remain in their seats and strapped in for the entire duration. In fact, they won't be exiting those seats until they are being, uh, until they're able to egress or exit the capsule after it has splashed down and been recovered out of the ocean and uh, safely resting in the nest of the recovery vessel. Along that note, our next Twitter question is from Brett. The question is, what is the orientation of the astronauts when seated? As in, do they face the front or the top of the capsule, and do they find it comfortable? Great question there. So in the views that we just had a couple minutes ago, they were, uh, re I guess what we would call in the reclined position, they were facing towards the top of the capsule. Uh, during the launch portion, whenever they were actually getting into the capsule, back in late May, the seats were actuated in the down position uh, where they were facing towards the hatch. Uh, the angle of difference is about 40 degrees between the two positions. They actuate in order to make sure that whenever there are uh, whenever there are G's being experienced that it is in the most comfortable and uh, safely ergonomic way possible. So that's where seat or uh, actuation comes in handy. Also, it also helps them to get in and out out of the capsule, it's a little trickier whenever the seats are in the up position or when they're when they're reclined facing upward toward the top of the capsule. As for comfort level, I've heard that they have found it pretty comfortable. Uh, the seats are actually custom fitted for each astronaut uh, destined to be flying in it. So whenever a crew member is assigned to a mission, they will also be assigned a seat specifically. So there will be no uh, mid-flight fire drills where everyone is. <laughs> switching seats. Uh, everyone has a designated seat. They're essentially small, medium, and large. Uh, and the armrests are also customizable depending on how long the crew member's forearm is. So um, we have taken many steps uh, with comfort in mind, as well as style. You've seen those spacesuits. They look pretty good, in my opinion. Um, but those spacesuits are also similarly custom fitted for each individual crew member. So with the combination of the custom fit of the suit, as well as the custom fit of the seats. Uh, we have aimed to make it as comfortable as possible uh, in the event of, you know, some sort of situation where we need to wave off an activity, uh, you know, for up to 48 hours. That's a long time to be in a confined space, even if you are highly trained like these guys. Uh, so yeah, making sure that they are as comfortable as possible while inside the cabin was certainly high priority. All right. Our next question comes from Richard. Uh, this one deals with kind of hygiene on the space station. Just curious how the astronauts that have been on station a while, how do they stay so clean cut? I know there's not a barber on board. Did they cut their own hair? It just looks clean cut. Do they shower, do laundry? How do they do it? They do have to cut their own hair. Um, and uh, even the current commander, Chris Cassidy, who's still on board, famously shaved his head once as his fellow <laughs> crewmate, Luca Parmitano, was about to arrive on space station just so he had uh, some, some bald company. Um, <laughs> But they do have trimmers on board the International Space Station that have a vacuum attached to them, so they're not just uh, getting hair just uh, all throughout the cabin as 
like everything else, hair would just tend to float around and get caught in the drafts of the air circulation on board. So they use uh, basically vacuum cutters uh, in order to give themselves haircuts. So that's how they're able to do it. No professional stylist up there, um, but they're able to, to make do and yeah. stay a little less shaggy. Quick time check here as we just passed 1030. Uh, it's now 1032 here in California. Uh, we are less than 20 minutes away from our first event uh, here on our list as Bob and Doug begin to check off, continue to check off the boxes of their return home. That first event is claw separation. That's essentially the initiation of trunk jettison. Uh, all of that means that we will need to unlatch the claw from the trunk. Uh, that is the mechanism that holds and connects the trunk to the capsule, delivers fluid, uh, telemetry, power, all that good stuff. We need to uh, expose the trunk in order for the capsule to deorbit. So we will jettison the trunk uh, and then we will begin a deorbit burn a couple minutes later. That deorbit burn is slated to begin at 10.56 a.m. Pacific. 1856 universal coordinated time. So in just 20, just under 23 minutes, we're expecting that to start. Once again, if you're just joining us, we've got some live views inside the Dragon Endeavor capsule. Bob and Doug there in their seats as they are making final preparations and doing final reviews as we get ready to initiate the deorbit sequence. Closest to the camera there is NASA astronaut Doug Hurley and further away from the camera is NASA astronaut Bob Benkin. These are two incredibly, incredib incredibly wonderful humans. Uh, we affectionately call them our space dads here at SpaceX. Uh, it's been such an honor to be able to fly them. Of course, Doug Hurley was actually the pilot of the final space shuttle mission, STS-135, back in 2011. And honestly, when I heard that he was assigned to this mission, uh, I I cried because, you know, just to have the opportunity to return the pilot of that final mission to the space station uh, in in this capacity was is so cool. Uh, and I just I I've I've loved following this mission uh, since the moment that we started training for it here in Hawthorne. Well, we know that they're ready. They've and all of their suit checkouts, everything to get themselves to this point. And once we begin these events, they're going to keep a very close eye. As again, crew is always in the loop to step in. But Dragon going to be executing all of these uh, different maneuvers and separation events automatically uh, via a pre-programmed timeline. Uh, we're continuing to count down. Uh, we'll have our first maneuver in a little under 13 minutes. We're a little over 15 minutes from the claw separation. Uh, that claw connecting the service module to the, uh, the Dragon capsule itself, a series of quick disconnects uh, will retract, cutting off any of the uh, fluid and data paths between the two. And then shortly after that, uh, just a few seconds later, the trunk will separate. And then we will be just less than five minutes away from that deorbit burn. Again, deorbit burn expected to last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Now, of course, during re-entry, Bob and Doug will be experiencing a couple of Gs. We're anticipating them to, to feel about four Gs during re-entry. This will make it a little difficult for them to move their arms around. Not impossible, um, but essentially what they're doing right now is reviewing uh, all of the event details for splashdown. Uh, making sure that 
they, and I've said this before, they have rehearsed this both uh, via, they've rehearsed the sequence of events in person with the recovery team, as well as through simulations here at Mission Control, uh, or at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. So at this point, uh, because it will be difficult for them to maybe flip through to the exact part of the procedure they might want to review during the actual re-entry event itself, they are, uh, they are reviewing those now in preparation for that splashdown or for the re-entry sequence. We've got another Twitter question. This one from one from Laura Mountain. This one's pretty cool. Uh, is it quiet in the Dragon, or does it sound like an airplane? Well, it doesn't sound like an airplane, at least not right now, as they're still flying through the vacuum of space. There's there's none of that rushing air. Uh, they'll get some of that uh, once they're further down uh, during their descent. Um, and then they're also able to hear when the Draco thrusters fire. Um, and one of the really cool things they've done to train the crew is uh, SpaceX had a number of microphones placed throughout the cabin during that Demo-1 flight last year. And they were able to record what it sounded like inside through all of the major, uh, all of the major burns, the launch, the descent, landing, everything. And in the trainer upstairs here at Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters, they have speakers set up where as they're doing simulations or practice runs of the different phases of the mission, they're able to hear what it should sound like inside Dragon as they're going through that. So I know that's one thing Bob pointed out is one of the things they're looking for is, does, does this sound like I was expecting it to? Does, does this look like, is that a light I'm supposed to see? All of those different things that for them is like reflex by the time they've trained it this much. At this moment, we are less than 10 minutes away from this sequence starting. We are just about nine minutes away, in fact. And first, we'll see that uh, maneuver where we'll get in the proper attitude or point the dragon really in the right direction for the claw and trunk separation. We're essentially going to do a, a 90 degree yaw maneuver, turn dragon sideways uh, to, to make sure the trunk goes out in a way, uh, not coming out. Uh, in front of or behind the capsule, essentially re-entering the atmosphere with the capsule. We're going to avoid that. Uh, and then Dragon will position itself for the deorbit burn. It's going to point those forward bulkhead thrusters um, into the direction that it's currently traveling. This is called a retrograde maneuver. And this is done specifically to, uh, we're going to slow the capsule down, but more than anything, we're changing the the perigee or the lowest point of the capsule's orbit. Again, essentially putting it up on an intersection point uh, with that spot in the Gulf where we're coming home. Eight minutes, Kate. We are getting close.
Dragon SpaceX for deorbit sequence. Go ahead. All right, Doug, we are five minutes out from deorbit sequence start. In addition, I uh, just wanted to inform you, we are expecting some ratty calm during claw and trunk set due to vehicle orientation. Okay, copy. We see 445 left for the uh, slew, and then uh, ratty calm during the uh, claw set. Good read back, Doug. Hey, we are almost four minutes away from this starting. Yeah, we just heard the call out there, confirmation from SpaceX Core down here at Mission Control uh, to Crew Dragon that we now under five, but at the time of the call, five minutes away from deorbit sequence start. Uh, so like we've been mentioning before, that the orbit sequence will involve uh, separating from the trunk and performing the deorbit burn. Uh, as you may have noticed on your uh, the ground tracking map that we've been showing you before, Bob and Doug were in their last orbit around Earth. Uh, I I can't remember what the number was that you you quoted earlier, Dan, but they have done thousands of orbits around Earth during their two month uh, duration on station. So it is really exciting that the line that we see on that trajectory map uh, is no longer, a, you yeah. know, fully around it. They're they're coming home. We're not we're not seeing two lines showing what their next orbit is going to be. They are on their final orbit of planet Earth, um, and this is their 1,024th orbit around our planet since they launched back in May uh, of earlier this year. So. We're counting down. We're under three minutes away from that first maneuver, and that's going to be a slew, as you heard Doug radio down. Uh, and that's essentially we're going to change the attitude. We're going to use those Draco thrusters to essentially spin Dragon about 90 degrees to the side uh, so we can uh, jettison that trunk. Um, and that will be done in two stages. We'll do the claw separation and then the trunk separation. Two minutes, 32 seconds, mm -hmm. and counting. This is where things really pick up. This is where we really commit to coming home. And this is where we're in kind of the final stages of Bob and Doug's trip in outer space. And pretty soon we'll be seeing them in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, well, they are staying comfortable and continuing to monitor data and telemetry in the vehicle. Uh, Dragon is actually doing a couple of things itself to prepare for this deorbit sequence. Um, again, it's doing these things autonomously. Uh, it's isolating the thermal control system loops from the radiator. This is the system that will help keep Bob and Doug cool uh, while they are re-entering the atmosphere. Like we've said before, the external temperature will reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and that thermal control system is uh, what helps keep them cool during that time. Also, Dragon is initiating uh, the separation of the claw mechanism, which will terminate the data, the power, and the fluid and the fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. So right now, the vehicle is preparing to execute that, and we are anticipating execution of claw separation uh, in three minutes and 35 seconds. So, <laughs> you know, we've been here for <laughs> 10 hours, hours, I think, at this point. Uh, uh, the webcast as a whole has been going on for almost a uh, little bit less than 24 hours. So, you know, we're in the final moments here as Dragon is beginning its its journey home uh, to bring Bob and Doug back to Earth. Yeah, this is this is the moment that Dragon is in the position to start coming home. Uh, the recovery team's already on station. They have been for a while out there off the coast of Pensacola. We are less than a minute from starting all of these carefully choreographed sequences to essentially split Dragon in half, get rid of that trunk so we have the capsule. I'll point the heat shield back down towards Earth following that deorbit burn. And then we bring them home. We are just about 30 seconds away now 
from maneuvering Dragon to get ready to get rid of that claw first and then that trunk separation. There will be about a 35 second difference uh, or 35 second jump from separating the claw to separating the trunk and we'll keep our eyes on the ground track for you and make sure we get kind of exact locations of when these separation events are occurring. Uh, we're, we're looking for both the claw and the trunk to separate cleanly and then it'll be less than five minutes until we do the deorbit burn. Yeah, and after that, it'll... Dragon SpaceX, deorbit sequence start. All right. Great news. Never copied. All right, so the Draco thrusters on Dragon starting to fire. It's now moving its way over to the trunk jettison attitude. We should be about two minutes away from the claw separation. For those of you that are just tuning in, you are just in time. <laughs> At this point in the mission, we are now beginning to execute the final steps of Dragon Endeavor's return to Earth. Uh, right now, we are performing the claw separation slew, which basically means Dragon is maneuvering itself into position, uh, into the proper attitude in order to separate the Dragon trunk. Uh, and that will be initiated first uh, by separation of the claw. The claw is the mechanism that attaches uh, the trunk and the, uh, excuse me, and the capsule together. The claw is what delivers power and telemetry and fluids, and we need to expose the heat shield. Uh, right now, the trunk is blocking that, so we will jettison the trunk, and we will um, then have uh, uh, allow us to maneuver into the proper attitude to perform the deorbit burn which Dragon has performed a number of burns so far overnight uh, and this early this morning. And this will be the final burn that the vehicle has to perform for this mission. And we just heard confirmation Dragon's in the trunk separation attitude. We are now standing by for claw separation. And we just heard confirmation. Confirmation of claw set. And with the claw separated, we're now standing by for the trunk separation in less than 30 seconds. Ten seconds till trunk separation. And we just heard confirmation of trunk separation. The trunk separation coming at 10.52 a.m. Pacific with Dragon flying over the Indian Ocean just off to the west of Australia. Dragon SpaceX, we show nominal trunk jettison. Oh yeah, we felt it. All right, so the crew just got the call. Nominal trunk separation, that's exactly what we were looking for. Next up is gonna be that D, that D orbit burn. Again, this is the longest burn of their trip home. This is the longest firing of those thrusters and the last time we're using those forward bulkhead thrusters. Exactly. Uh, those forward bulkhead thrusters, like Dan just said, that's what we're using to perform the deorbit burn. Once we uh, do that, we will then be able, that deorbit burn will last for 11 and a half minutes. Once that is completed, we don't need to use those thrusters anymore, so we will close and lock the nose cone in preparation for re-entry. So 
So we're a little under three and a half minutes from the start of the deorbit burn. Again, our sequence of events has started. We we're able to separate that claw at 10.51 a.m. Pacific at 17.51 GMT or Universal Time. And at 10.52, just a minute later, the trunk separating while Dragon was flying just off to the west of Australia. So claw separated, trunk separated. Next up, deorbit burn. Yeah, right now, uh, Dragon is running exclusively on battery power now that the trunk is separated. Also, right now, uh, telemetry is looking really good for the vehicle. Uh, the nitrox system is primed for cabin and suit cooling, and the heat shield is exposed and ready for atmos atmospheric re-entry. Like I said before, that nitrox system, which is uh, essentially the air that we breathe every day down here on Earth, uh, nitrogen, oxygen combination, a mi mixture, uh, it's the same stuff that they put in your scuba tank if you are a scuba diver. Uh, the nitrox system is used to cool the cabin and the suit uh, to keep the crew comfortable during the reentry phase. Uh, they will actually have cold air flowing through the their suits themselves, uh, as well as through the cabin itself, so a two-pronged approach to maintaining a comfortable, a comfortable temperature there inside the capsule. Uh, like we said, uh, the next event that we have coming up will be the deorbit burn, uh, which we're expecting that to commence in one minute and 40 seconds. According to the ground tracking map there, Dragon is approaching the southwestern coast of Australia. Right, we are we less are, than a... We're excited. Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> we are inside a minute to deorbit burn. And again, one more time, this is this is the long one. This is expected to last 11 minutes, 22 seconds. This is that burn that commits the dragon to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And you can get kind of a sense of just how far they're going to go. By the time they fire this burn, they're just gonna be off to the southwest of Australia. And this is going to realign their orbit to intersect with that point off the coast of Pensacola where they're gonna be splashing down. Yeah, this is the moment where Dragon is fully committed to the reentry point. Uh, we, again, we are aiming for just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Our recovery ship Go Navigator is ready and waiting to begin the recovery process right after splashdown occurs. Once again, uh, if you're just joining us, we are now in the final steps of the deorbit sequence, uh, the deorbit burn will be starting here in just a couple of seconds. And we just heard confirmation deorbit burn has begun. Uh, okay. Coming at 10.56 a.m. Pacific, again, while the Dragon spacecraft just off the southwestern coast of Australia. So here we go, <laughs> 11 more minutes to go. I'm ready, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's safe to say that Bob and Doug are ready. They, they've done a number of interviews over the last few weeks while they were on station, and just the excitement and the enthusiasm for the mission is, is palpable. Uh, just the opportunity to be able to fly these two incredible humans to the International Space Station and back is such an honor, and uh, we're just really excited to get our space dads home safely and back to their families as quickly as possible. This deorbit burn that we are currently in, it will last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Already a little more than a minute 10 in counting, so we have about 10 minutes to go. Just heard a call. Propulsion system performing nominally. That's the word we always want to hear. We always like to hear. So just under 10 minutes to go left in this burn. 
And all within the last 10 minutes, again, it seemed like we had slow progress of events all morning, and then boom, within the last 10 minutes, we had a couple of things happening. Uh, Dragon maneuvered itself into the appropriate position to jettison its trunk, uh, and it did so successfully, nominally, and then it initiated the deorbit burn just a couple minutes ago. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time those four forward Draco thrusters will fire, forward kind of meaning at the top of the capsule. Dragon Endeavor has not yet entered Earth's atmosphere, but this deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site in the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, uh, although we can't see it at the moment, Bob and Doug are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration. Uh, Draco fire, excuse me, Draco thruster firings and trajectory details, such as entry angle, capsule perigee, and how much distance is remaining until that deorbit burn terminates. So Dragon is flying itself, so all they really have to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs, keep tabs on things. So while this burn is completing again, we're just a few minutes into it. It'll last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Uh, we we have a couple more events coming up uh, afterward. In uh, let's let me check my timeline here real quick. In 40, just under 44 minutes, uh, we will have the initial parachute deployment. So uh, that is essentially when we will be deploying the drogue parachutes, the small parachutes that are designed to uh, further slow down the capsule as as it is re-entering the atmosphere, as well as stabilizing it. And then a minute after that, we will deploy the drogue parachutes, and that is targeted for 11.44 a.m. Pacific, 18.44 uh, Universal. And then just a couple minutes after that, we will have splashdown. So again, that's all in just under 45, 44 minutes. Right now, we are performing the deorbit burn. We've got a little over seven minutes left in this burn. And the only performance call we've gotten so far is everything's still looking good with the propulsion system on Dragon. Uh, once this burn completes, we will have kind of a couple minutes, uh, about three minutes, to catch our breath before things pick right back up and we get the nose cone closed. Uh, and then there'll be a bit more of a gap, and at that point, uh, they will maneuver Dragon to its entry attitude, essentially heat shield pointed down and into the... Uh, the line of velocity and that heat shield protecting them from the, the heat of reentry. Uh, temperatures getting up to about 3,500 degrees uh, on the Dragon spacecraft. But everything looking good. We're about five minutes into this deorbit burn. Again, it started right at 10:56 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 1756 G 56 GMT. Uh, Dragon was flying about 260 statute miles uh, just off the southwestern coast of Australia. So right now, during this burn, the, the, we just heard a call that we're halfway through the burn and everything is looking great, everything performing nominally. Uh, during this burn right now, Bob and Doug are currently monitoring the deorbit tool, which, like I said earlier, uh, captures things like the perigee, the uh, reentry interface, uh, how much time, or excuse me, how many mile, how much distance remains uh, before the burn itself. Uh, is terminated. They're also monitoring the burn duration and uh, the firing of those Draco thrusters located there at the uh, on the forward bulkhead of the capsule. Uh, there on your screen, you actually can see what Bob and Doug are seeing right now. Uh, that is right, that tool on their screen. So uh, on the left and the right of the center screen, uh, that is the deorbit. Uh, 
that that is the deorbit monitor, monitoring tool. Just past seven minutes into the burn, a little over four minutes remaining. Everything's still looking good with Dragon Ship Endeavor's Dior burn to commit it to coming home. Everything continuing to be on track for our splashdown. Again, our splashdown time uh, right at 11.48 and 24 seconds uh, Pacific was the calculated time. Uh, when it would be typical for a couple seconds on either side. Uh, but that time is 1848 GMT or Universal. But we're we're already through several of the really major steps to initiate this re-entry. The claw is separated, the trunk is gone, the deorbit burn has begun, and we're more than halfway through, just a little under three and a half minutes remaining. There on your screen is a shot of our mission control center here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where the Dragon operators and mission leaders are there monitoring Dragon's progress. They continue to watch the propulsion data and all the GNC data, uh, making sure that everything is looking healthy and nominal. Just about two minutes, 30 seconds until the end of this burn. We'll listen for the call out up to the crew uh, on the performance of the burn, and then they'll start moving into the next steps. Again, we'll get about a three minute breather before the next major milestone comes up when we get ready to close the nose cone, uh, that protecting the docking ring, guidance, navigation, and control uh, sensors, and also these four forward bulkhead thrusters that are currently performing the deorbit burn. Uh, during the actual re-entry process. So we are at just under two minutes from the conclusion of the deorbit burn. Again, Dragon is committed to its splashdown point. There is no going back. Yeah, we already have the recovery team ready and on standby. They've been there uh, for quite some time now. Um, here and we have about 90 seconds left in the burn. Weather looking great at the splashdown site off Pensacola. Uh, winds uh, just around two and a half miles per hour. Uh, sea being described as like glass by the core here in Hawthorne radioing up to the crew. Ended up getting fantastic weather for this first crude splashdown of Dragon. We are one minute away from the end of deorbit burn. Again, this burn is placing Dragon on its final trajectory to the landing site off of the coast of Pensacola, Florida. That is in the Gulf of Mexico. And our recovery vessel, Go Navigator, and the recovery team are ready and waiting to see Bob and Doug come back through the atmosphere. Like we said, this orbit burn, uh, during this two orbit burn, be entering the atmosphere just yet. Uh, that won't happen for about an hour.
Dragon, SpaceX, deorbit burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure initiated. Final burn, nose cone and burn. All right. The orbit burn complete. We heard the call, nominal burn. Bob and Doug are on their way back home. This burn commits them to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Oof, all, there, all we have <laughs> left now is to wait. That was really one of the last major moments uh, before they start re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll have the nose cone closure coming up next. Uh, that should be coming uh, in just a couple of minutes as uh, we had about a three minute span uh, between the end of the Dior River and that moment. Yeah, the nose cone is actually currently in the closing process, so it doesn't just snap shut. Uh, it does slowly close and uh, lock. So right now that nose cone is in the process of moving of it, moving back into the closed position. And uh, we will hear the call out for whenever it has fully closed and whenever uh, the latches have secured. Seeing some data, it looks like it's about halfway there. Uh, it's opened a little bit more than 90 degrees. I think the, the exact count was 110 degrees uh, opening range or range of motion for the nose cone. Uh, so we're a little more than halfway now to getting that nose cone closed. So I have just heard that we have a visual on nose cone closure. So it'll take a minute for the hooks to close in. They close in uh, a series. So the first series will close and then the second will follow. And that'll take about a minute to complete. All right, well, as we just wait for the finish to that nose cone closure, uh, we'll have a bit of time again. We'll have about 20 minutes uh, or a little, little over 21 from right now until we really start re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. We're expecting that entry interface uh, in about 21 minutes. And then right around that time, we'll also be looking for that blackout we've been talking about. Uh, we've had a little bit of what we call ratty calm at this point. So you'll hear kind of some sporadic uh, interruptions in the audio transmission just because of how Dragon was oriented um, for the, uh, the trunk jettison and for the actual deorbit burn. Uh, but that, that blackout period will be due to the plasma that builds up around the capsule uh, interfering with those antennas either sending or receiving data. So I've heard the call out that the first set of hooks for nose cone closure are in motion. So these, this will complete in two sets. The first set is now in motion. So really good news to hear that. Everything looking good so far. Like I mentioned before, uh, in the background, Dragon has uh, inhibited the forward uh, bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete that deorbit burn. Uh, this is to ensure that it's safe to latch that nose cone shut for reentry. Also, the vehicle has initiated the nitrox purge. Nitrox is simply a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. It's what we breathe. Uh, and the, the nit nitrox that is being purged into the system is cooled. Uh, so allowing that cool air to circulate around the cabin, but also inside of Bob and Doug's suits, uh, will help to keep them cool and comfortable during re-entry, uh, which will be coming up in about 20 minutes. We're currently tracking 23 minutes and 20 seconds until entry begins.
So in case you're just joining us at this point, the nose cone has closed. The forward thrusters have been, uh, have been disabled and we are latching the nose cone. Currently underway with the first set of hooks. The first of two sets. And we just had confirmation that the first set of hooks is closed. So now the second, the second set will begin to close as well. As we mentioned, after this nose cone is fully closed, we'll have a couple of minutes to catch our breath again, about 20 minutes or just under 20 minutes until Dragon will start to maneuver itself to the entry attitude, essentially pointing the heat shield in the direction of travel as it's going to be leading the way through their reentry through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll look to uh, run into that communications blackout at about 36 minutes after the hour expecting that to last for about six minutes. And then we'll get that back shortly before we uh, deploy the drogue parachutes, followed uh, just less than a minute later by the main parachutes. And by that point, hopefully we should have some views of Dragon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and parachuting to a splashdown in the Gulf. So there in the front row of Mission Control in the center, you can see CEO Elon Musk and our President Gwen Shotwell sitting side by side at those center consoles. In addition to those two, the room is filled with Dragon operators and mission leaders who are continuing to monitor the health and telemetry of the crew and the capsule. Right now, nose cone closure is underway. The first of two sets of hook latching has completed. And we just heard a call out that the nose cone. SpaceX nose cone is secure for entry. Happy, we see it on board. All right, great confirmation there. Back and forth from Mission Control here to Bob and Doug up in Dragon Endeavor. Uh, that Bob and Doug have can also confirmed on their displays that the nose cone has closed nominally and it is secure for entry. So that nose cone, nose cone close completion. A lot of tongue twisters with this right now. Uh, coming uh, with Dragon still flying over the South Pacific. Uh, it is on its way home. We're going to gradually start to see its altitude dip. Uh, right now, already only 207 miles over the Earth's surface. It was at about 260 miles when it was still uh, over on the other side of the Pacific Ocean off the southwestern coast of Australia when it fired its engines for that deorbit burn. Uh, so its altitude going to continue to drop. Uh, once it gets to uh, about 100 kilometers in altitude or about 62 miles, um, it's going to begin what's known as entry interface. And that's when it really begins to start to feel uh, the effects of the Earth's atmosphere will once again be experiencing lift and drag uh, as it's no longer in that near vacuum environment in low Earth orbit. So we're essentially stepping into the second half of entry. Dragon is now beginning to flush nitrox into the cabin and continuing to top it off in Bob and Doug's suits as well. Again, this is cool air essentially flowing through the cabin and the suits. Uh, this is what will allow them and the cabin itself to remain comfortable uh, during reentry while those external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
At this point in time, Dragon's orientation is such that the heat shield is pointing forward, if you will, uh, leading the capsule toward the landing site. If you've been following along over the last couple days, you know that weather has been a big ticket item for us. Uh, the recovery team has been busy over the last week working to determine uh, the selection of a landing site in order to increase the options for space station departures. Uh, the team identified a total of seven possible splashdown locations. In order to meet NASA's timeline requirements for crew recovery, these potential splashdown locations have to be close to a port and uh, they have to be close to medical facilities. So with all of that in mind, you add the ever-evolving weather conditions of Florida, but also that tropical storm Isaia that was moving through. Uh, and it's easy to see how determining that landing site is a it's quite a complex process. Uh, since Dragon is capable of splashdown on either side of the Florida panhandle, uh, we in fact have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels ready to support. Uh, one in the Gulf of Mexico, which is what we're utilizing today, Go Navigator, and the other located uh, off the east coast of Florida, able to service landing sites in the Atlantic Ocean. That one is Go Searcher. Like I mentioned, today we'll be splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Go Navigator, that recovery ship I just mentioned, is in place and ready and waiting for Bob and Doug. Uh, the WB-57 plane, if it hasn't taken off already, I'm sure it will be very soon. It's, uh, yep, it's in the air. Okay, great. Uh, that's what will provide our first views of Dragon during reentry. We'll get a thermal cam off of that airplane, allowing us to see the capsule as it is reentering the atmosphere. If you were tuned in for our demo one broadcast, uh, uh, there, it, it was basically a, a big ball of light <laughs> coming at us. We'll also have cameras on board the recovery vessel. So as Dragon gets closer uh, we and is, is deploying those parachutes, we will also be able to have hopefully some really clear footage of that all occurring as well. All right, so Dragon's altitude continuing to dip. Right now about 174 miles over planet Earth. We're under 11 and a half minutes from where we expect to hit entry interface. So that's where Dragon will really start feeling the effects of being in a denser atmosphere. Um, and then we are still tracking that blackout to come uh, right around that same time. We are under 27 minutes away from splashdown. So we are under 27 minutes away. Bob and Doug being on planet Earth for the first time since May 30th. To kind of put everything in perspective, uh, you know, the Dragon capsule departed from the International Space Station several hours ago, uh, but according to what Dan just said, it's essentially halfway home just based on altitude alone. So the International Space Station is about 250 miles above Earth's surface. I think right now it's between 250 and 300. I think right now it's about 263 miles uh, above Earth's surface. So based on uh, that telemetry that, that Dan just read off is from an altitude standpoint, Dragon is halfway home and yet that second half is gonna be covered in the next 27-ish minutes uh, while we wait for a splashdown and recovery versus the several hours that we've been covering since yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, and we will continue to see its speed drop as it's dropping out of orbit. It's starting to hit the atmosphere. It's starting to slow from the effects of that friction, uh, generating the heat on the heat shield and building up the plasma eventually around the spacecraft. Its speed's gonna continue to drop. It's already below 17,000 miles an hour, and it'll drop to essentially a terminal velocity of about 350 miles an hour, right as those drogue chutes deploy. And those are going to pop out uh, when sensors on the Dragon spacecraft, uh, both GPS and pressure sensors, tell the spacecraft it's at the right altitude, and then those will automatically deploy. Those drogues coming out of the top section of the spacecraft uh, using two mortars, or pyrotechnics essentially, to deploy those to do the initial slowing and stabilizing of the Dragon capsule.
Uh, and then after that, the main parachutes will pop out and further decelerate it to about 119 miles per hour. Uh, and then that will continue to decelerate. And by the time that the capsule is splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico, it's only going 15, 16 miles per hour. So significant reduction in speed there uh, over over just the course of a couple minutes. Uh, that, of course, is you know a pretty comfortable speed. Uh, the way that the uh, astronauts have described it uh, previously with other other types of missions also landing down uh, doing land landings at about the same rate. They said it feels like you're in a, a, a minor fender bender. Yeah, you're definitely running into something. You'll feel it, but uh, they do a lot of work uh, with the seats and the restraints with these crew members just to make sure uh, while it may be a fender bender, you've got more than a seat belt essentially holding you in. So they are they are very secure in their suits and in their seats, and they're going to stay in there even after Dragon touches down. We'll still have communication with Dragon. Uh, once they're in the water, it'll stay powered on. Uh, probably most importantly, the air conditioner will continue to work uh, while they're in the capsule uh, in the now Gulf of Mexico and much warmer temperatures than uh, they've seen for uh, the last couple of months. Uh, and we'll still be able to talk to them from here in Hawthorne, and the recovery teams will be able to as well. Yeah. One of the things we might see them do, uh, depending on uh, sea states and everything after they touch down and the crew themselves, uh, they'll still have a couple of demonstration tasks potentially to carry out. Uh, they have a satellite phone inside of the capsule that has its own uh, satellite antenna integrated into Dragon, and they're able to use that independent of Dragon's communication system. So uh, one thing we might hear them do is do a test call on that to the teams here uh, in Hawthorne. We wouldn't be able to hear the call, but you would hear the, uh, the go to do it over the Dragon to ground audio that we've been listening to this entire time. So. Still have a couple of demonstration steps, essentially, as, again, this is a test flight. This is the flight to really prove out Dragon systems, to bring crew members from Kennedy Space Center to the space station and return them safely to Earth. And so far, we have had a flawless ride downhill. We've completed the deorbit burn. Dragon is continuing to drop down. It's right now at about 132 miles over the Pacific Ocean. Pretty soon we're going to see its ground track cross over Central America, out over the Gulf, culminating in that splashdown in the Gulf just off the coast of Pensacola. Dragon SpaceX 4 entry brief. Okay, Doug, we have no update to timing because the burn went great and your vehicle is still looking really good for entry. No uh, health issues at this time. Okay, very good copy. Thank you. Uh, in addition, the uh, recovery team is go and the weather is still great. Uh, winds are about two knots and waves about a, uh, one foot from the ship. They're reporting very calm. How copy? Copy, good weather at the uh, landing area. Thank you. Okay, and uh, last piece is that we do expect some additional ready calm during entry prep two due to vehicle attitude. Um, so if you can get us your uh, entry check uh, report uh, a little bit prior to entry prep two, we'd appreciate it. Copy, we'll go. Okay, thanks, Doug. So there we just had a bit of a briefing between Mission Control and Bob and Doug up in Crew Endeavor, just confirming with them that the dual orbit burn was great and that the timing on their pads doesn't need to be updated. Uh, we are able to upload new trajectory calculations, including times that remain live depending on uh, you know, how the burn goes, and at this point in time, those don't need to be updated. It is important that they do remain accurate because Bob and Doug, their primary mission right now is to continue to monitor uh, the vehicle status and telemetry and data being presented to them on their touch on their touchscreen displays in front of them. Uh, and so 
During the more dynamic events, uh, they certainly want to be aware when things like parachute deploy will be happening and when splashdown is, is, is expected. So making sure that the timeline of events, the sequencing is accurate, is certainly important for, in order for them to stay aware and updated of upcoming events. Just another quick position check. Dragon still out over the Central Pacific, down to about 108 miles in altitude. And we're expecting that entry interface to come up in the next four minutes or so. Again, at that point, Dragon should be at an altitude of right around 62 statute miles, or about 100 kilometers. And that's when it really starts to feel the effects of the atmosphere. It starts to experience the uh, a lift and drag and other atmospheric effects it's been free from while flying in the near vacuum of low Earth orbit. So continuing to drop in altitude, still looking for an on-time splashdown, should just be about 19 minutes from now. And just a reminder, we do have that blackout period coming. So as they continue to dip in the Earth's atmosphere and get lower and lower, the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker and it's going to generate more and more heat, eventually heating up the outside of Dragon to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And as it hits that peak heating, it'll also be forming a plasma around the spacecraft. So we do expect to lose calm for about six minutes. Uh, Dragon crew entry preps are complete. SpaceX copies, entry prep complete, thank you. The call from spacecraft commander Doug Hurley, entry preps are complete. So they are on board, they are monitoring, they are ready to come home. Yeah, and as of right now, uh, entry prep should have also included uh, final configuration of their flight suits. So we had a question uh, from our social media earlier if the visors will be up or down. Uh, those visors should be down at this point as part of that entry prep check. In that last briefing, we also heard that the weather is looking good. In a previous report, the phrasing was, it looks like glass. And that is certainly ideal for a water splashdown. Uh, that being said, the recovery timeline, um, you know, Bob and Doug should be out of the capsule within an hour after splashing down. So good to hear that the weather is good. We saw blue skies and a couple of white fluffy clouds out there uh, in the Gulf of Mexico as we got views from our recovery vessel, Go Navigator. But glad to hear that conditions are sustaining and that uh, winds also are looking really good around two and two, two and a half miles per hour. So hardly anything at all. Really couldn't ask for better conditions for a splashdown day. We, we kind of threaded the needle once again, almost like we did on launch with the weather today. Um, you, your, your upper limits for wind were about 10 miles an hour. So we're, we're well below that threshold for a splashdown today. Dragon coming up on 82 miles in altitude, continuing to dip down. We're expecting that entry interface to start pretty soon, where the vehicle itself is really going to start heating up. It's going to continue to use its Draco thrusters to maintain its attitude as it continues through the Earth's atmosphere. And we'll have that calm blackout coming up in just a couple of minutes as well. The cabin purge has started again. This is when they're going to flush the cabin of Dragon with cooled air. They're also going to do a suit purge, uh, running cooled nitrox through the suits for Bob and Doug just to keep things at a comfortable temperature for them as the capsule goes through the reentry and starts to heat up.
So like we said, we are anticipating a brief blackout period where we're unable to communicate with the capsule. That's, uh, we're expecting that to start in exactly three minutes. Uh, that will last for six minutes total. And during that time, we will be unable to command the vehicle or receive telemetry. That being said, Dragon is designed to be fully autonomous. So it's driving itself anyway. <laughs> So Bob and Doug uh, will, will stay fastened in their seats. Uh, like I said, that anticipated loss of signal, or as you'll hear it called LOS, is anticipated to last for just six minutes. During that blackout period, the capsule will, uh, will encounter what's known as entry interface. This is when the capsule is now uh, really in the Earth's atmosphere and beginning to be subject to aerodynamic forces. Uh, this is also when a lot of that friction will begin to build up and raise the external temperatures. Dragon SpaceX, we show two minutes until predicted calm blackout. We will see you on the other side at 1842. <laughs> Dragon Cappies, 1842, we'll talk to you then. So there's that heads up uh, communication from Mission Control to Dragon Endeavor, confirming that comms blackout. Like I was saying, during the blackout, the Dragon capsule will be going through entry interface where it is encountering aerodynamic forces really starting to build up uh, the external temperature as it, and that external temperature will reach about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the, the, the interior of the cabin is environmentally cooled, so Bob and Doug will, should, be, should remain comfortable during their descent. There will be cool air flowing not only through the cabin itself, but also through their suits. The suits have sensors on them that are able to detect the temperature inside that suit. And once, it, once uh, that sensor reads that uh, it has reached the, the maximum temperature threshold, uh, it'll flush the suit with some cool air and, uh, and really circulate and, and cool it down. All right, well, we are right around that estimated blackout time. As we heard the call, we'll see them on the other side, expected to regain that communication at about 42 minutes after the hour. So for these next six minutes, they're already less than 60 miles in altitude. And this is when the capsule is really heating up during that reentry, reaching temperatures of around 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. As again, you're essentially hitting the atmosphere at more than 17,000 miles an hour and the friction building up that plasma around the spacecraft. And that's what's gonna prevent us from talking to Bob and Doug or getting data back from the spacecraft for the next six minutes. As flight computers are in control though, it's going to continue to maintain its appropriate trajectory and attitude, uh, having attitude determination devices on board the capsule, not reliant on communications with satellites. And it's going to continue dragging down the correct path for this splashdown off the coast of Pensacola. So uh, we are in that blackout period. We're gonna continue to stand by until we get them on the other side. And just about two minutes after we get acquisition of signal, AOS, back with Dragon, we're going to be looking for those parachutes. And we should hopefully be getting some views from a couple of our assets out at the landing zone, including our WB-57 high altitude research plane, which is going to be relying on Dragon's telemetry to actually lock onto it in the sky and give us an infrared view of the capsule during the final stages of reentry. We're gonna be looking for the drogue deploys at about 44 minutes after the hour. Those will be two drogue shoots. They're gonna come out when the vehicle is still moving at about 350 miles an hour. And it'll be at an altitude of about 18,000 feet. They'll come out and do some initial slowing. 
and stabilization of the spacecraft. And then uh, less than a minute later, they'll detach and the four main parachutes will deploy. You'll see them come out and look kind of closed up initially, and then they'll do what's known as reefing, opening up in really two different stages just to minimize the immediate loads on the parachutes themselves. Uh, those main parachutes will come out at an altitude of about 6,500 feet, with Dragon already slowed down to 119 miles an hour. And they'll do the rest of the slowing the whole way down until we splash down in the Gulf of Mexico. We should be 10 minutes away from splashdown. So right now we're getting our cameras on the WB-57 airplane, which is in the area, uh, getting those cameras ready to give us our first glimpse. And we should still have about three minutes left, a little less than three minutes until we anticipate reacquiring our signal and our connection with Bob and Doug and the Dragon spacecraft. If you're just tuning in, we are in a blackout period that we were expecting. Uh, this blackout period will last a total of six minutes and we're about halfway through there now. Uh, at the moment, Dragon is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and due to the plasma building up on the exterior of the vehicle, uh, we're unable to communicate or send commands, but Dragon is fully autonomous. It is steering itself. Uh, and right now, Bob and Doug are flying home. Dragon SpaceX com check. So we're still inside that anticipated blackout window. It does look like we are getting uh, maybe some sporadic data starting to peek through. This is why you heard that communications check with the spacecraft. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check. Dr. Agile out and clear, we're about 3.9 G. Copy, we've got you 5x5 five five as well, Doug. Looking good and you can expect an automated shoot deployment. Copy, it'll shoot deployment. All right, really good news there. We have come out of the blackout period and we have reestablished connection with Dragon Endeavor with NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley on board. We were able to reacquire that communication a little bit earlier than expected. And now we are just waiting. We should just be about two and a half minutes away from that initial drogue shoot deploy. Yeah, two minutes and 26 seconds. A GPS has converged. Copy that. You may have heard earlier that Bob and Doug are currently experiencing 3.5 Gs. Not too bad. That's about what they pulled during the ascent phase. Just like a mild roller coaster. The vehicle is now over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it is approaching the landing zone uh, off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. And there we have our first shot. There it is, this, the first view from the WB-57 airplane. It is dipping in and out a little bit. This is gonna be an infrared camera showing us Dragon re-entering. We have that comm back with Bob and Doug. Uh, you heard a GPS is converging. Uh, Dragon has uh, three GPS units that it uses uh, 
actually in the parachute deployment process uh, as it helps uh, along with the pressure sensors really give a solid altitude to the flight computers on when these are supposed to deploy. We're standing by for the drogue chute deployments. We should be just under five minutes away from splashdown. Passing 15 kilometers, brace for drogue window. Kathy, we're braced. Just about 14 kilometers in altitude, 8.4 miles continuing to descend. There on your screen, we have a shot of the capsule as it is preparing to deploy those initial parachutes, the drogue parachutes. Again, these parachutes help slow the vehicle down even further and help stabilize in preparation for main chute deployment. Right about now, the capsule is going about 400 miles per hour decelerating quickly. And standing by for drogue deploys. Visual, two drogues out. There on your screen, we have visual confirmation of those two drogue deployments. Happy do drogue. All right, so two of two, the drogues now out. They're gonna do their slowing and stabilizing of the Dragon spacecraft. They should be detaching in just a few moments, and then we'll see four parachutes, the main parachutes deployed. Dragon under drogues. Drogue descent rate nominal. The expected descent rate, the expected velocity under the drogues nominal. We're right at around 150 miles an hour and already dropping. You can see the drogues now detach. And there we have confirmation of deployment of the four main parachutes. We are visual on four chutes out. We are visual. Four main parachutes deployed. Four main. So at this point, the main parachutes have deployed. They are inflating, as you can see there on your screen, continuing to slow Dragon down significantly. We are anticipating splashdown in just under two minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah, we've already slowed the vehicle down to about 16 miles an hour. It's already less than a kilometer in altitude. Main chute descent rate nominal, passing through 700 meters. So at this point, Dragon has saved all propulsion systems on 600 board. 600 meters. 600 meters. And we're 600 meters above the Gulf of Mexico. Should be approximately a minute 30 from splashdown. Mission Control Team here in Hawthorne has reported the precise landing coordinates to the recovery team. They are standing by, ready to go get our space dads. Just passed about 300 meters, one minute till splashdown. Two hundred meters. We are brace for splashdown. Copy brace for splashdown. So there we heard Bob and Doug reporting that they are bracing for a splashdown. We should be able to see uh, the Gulf of Mexico here in the shot just momentarily as we're now just about 20 meters off the ocean.
Splashdown. As you can see on your screen, we have visual confirmation for Splashdown. SpaceX copies and concurs. We see Splashdown and Mains cut. Dragon Endeavor has returned home. NASA astronauts and Bob and Doug. On behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. <laughs> It's truly our honor and privilege to fly the flight of the uh, Crew Dragon and Endeavor. Congratulations, everybody at SpaceX. Uh, all good, and we're uh, into section of four decimal eight zero zero. Thanks for those words, Doug, and we uh, copy that you are into uh, four decimal eight zero zero. The great news all around there. Our space dads are back on Earth after a 19-hour return journey from space. Dragon Endeavor has splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. And on your screen there, you can see our two fast boats, and they are indeed fast, <laughs> racing out to greet Dragon Endeavor as uh, it sits there. The first on there, we can see a view inside the capsule. Bob and Doug looking good. Although the communication was a little choppy, we did Space hear. Uh, Endeavor in three decimal one, we show ourselves in stable one. And SpaceX copies for uh, vehicle assessment, step three decimal one, stable one. Good news. Stable one, essentially. They're upright in the water, stable two. Uh, also, another potential where it could be on its side or even upside down, but Dragon does have a water ballast system. Uh, to keep it upright where it's able to essentially pump seawater uh, into bladders in the service section of the capsule. But they're upright. We already see the fast boats approaching. They touched down, uh, came right on time at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1848 uh, UTC. Bob and Doug now in the water. And the recovery ops, they've already begun. We're, we already see the, the fast boats starting to move in. Uh, we're still maintaining that good communication back uh, with Bob and Doug and the team here in Hawthorne. Uh, pretty soon we should be getting uh, the go for them to move in, begin their hypergall sniffs, and uh, begin wrangling up those parachutes. But we can see Bob and Doug inside the capsule back on planet Earth. Yeah, those fast boats will be moving in to do a couple of things. Uh, they'll be performing what's known as a sniffer test. That's essentially to ensure that the air around the vehicle uh, doesn't have any toxic fumes from the hypergolic propellants on board. So once we get the all clear from there, uh, the water recovery lead will give the uh, will give the go for approach, and that's when the the first fast boat will actually approach the capsule. Hopefully give a little wave to Bob and Doug through the window. <laughs> and uh, one of the crew members will, uh, one of the team members will actually climb on top of Crew Dragon and begin to um, begin to place the rigging equipment necessary to hoist Dragon out of the water. Oh, still getting a view from the WB, uh, the airplane flying overhead. It gave us those, those great views of really our first views of Bob and Doug reentering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, from up above. You can see the four parachutes in the water. Uh, we heard those were cut automatically uh, as expected by Dragon. Uh, so for now, the crew just standing by. Again, they're going to stay in their suits, in their seats. Uh, we're waiting for all these initial checks. Dragon SpaceX com check. Loud and clear, hello. Loud and clear as well. Just wanted to verify a quick com reconfiguration. Thank you. So essentially what just happened there is they reconfigured. And Solo, if you can just relay the uh, status of the uh, fast boats and the recovery uh, as you get them, we would appreciate it. You bet. Absolutely, Doug. Uh, we'll go. So what just happened there, you, you heard uh, comms reconfiguration. That's essentially looping Bob and Doug's communication into the launch, or excuse me, into the recovery team uh, so that if not, they can hear feedback from Bob and Doug directly as well. Now, I, we talked a little bit about SpaceX uh, Endeavor. You can let Ben and James know uh, we're doing pretty good so far. Okay, we'll let the flight docs know that you're feeling good so far. Thanks for that update. 
really good news there to hear that they're feeling good uh, and they can let the flight surgeons know that all is well inside Dragon Endeavor. All right, and it sounds like we do have uh, one of our folks that's on location there with the recovery forces, NASA's Brandy Dean. She's been she's uh, joining us by satellite phone. Brandy, if you can hear me, I mean, what is it like right there in the water? What was it like to watch right in the rear? Uh, watch them splash down for the uh, test objective. So stand by at the console once we get it up and operating on the Okay, SpaceX copies. We'll be ready for that in just a couple minutes. We should have the go for you in just a moment. Please stand by. I can hear you, but there's There in the center of your screen, Dragon Capsule, awaiting for the fast boats to approach and begin the rigging process. And there on the left-hand side of your screen, we can see that second fast boat come into view. Dragon SpaceX, we are go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personal personnel aside, alongside in just under a minute. Thank you. All right, so they're starting to move in. As Kate just said, that first boat's going to go in, sniff around the capsule for any traces of hypergalls. The second one's going to start rounding up the parachutes, uh, which we're getting some really cool views from the WV-57 still flying overhead. Uh, looking down, you can see the parachutes in the water, and the second boat start to gather them up. Uh, We'll try one more time real quick. Uh, we have NASA's Brandy Dean out with the recovery forces. Brandy, if you can hear me, what was it like to watch this dragon come down under parachutes? Oh, it was amazing. I wish everybody could have had my view. It was such a beautiful sight. It was a gorgeous day. The water is calm. Really the best weather we could have asked for. Um, and we did. We heard the, um, the sonic booms as it made its way back. We were able to find it early on as the parachutes were deploying. So it's very exciting for everybody who was gathered here. That's incredible. We actually had some questions from people if you'd be able to hear the sonic boom, and we weren't sure. So I'm really glad you just answered that for us. Um, I mean, we talked so much about the weather. You said it looks great. What? I mean, what was it like on the ride out there? Has it just been kind of clear skies and clear seas the whole way? I'm not sure if you can hear me right now, um, but I think we're asking about the weather, whether it was clear skies. There are just a kind of a circle of clouds along the horizon, very low, but um, the, the, we were able to see the parachute far above the clouds and then follow it all the way until it's flashed down. All right. Well, we're not getting any views on the boat, so what kind of activity is taking place right now? We're able to see the fast boats approaching the capsule. Uh, what's everybody doing on the boat to just kind of get everything ready? Uh, the boat's also making its way for the capsule. I can't see it with my with my rear eyes yet, but we're getting closer. Everybody's been kind of standing by, um, holding ready positions for quite a while now. So as soon as it as soon as it's flush, they'll be able to just stand in um, and start working on their own their own activities. All right, copy that. Well, we're going to keep watching from here. Um, thanks for calling in, and thanks for being out there with everybody and getting us these great views. It's really incredible. Uh, thanks, Brandy. We hope to get you back in port soon, uh, and we'll talk to you back in Houston.
posted there on your screen. Uh, ooh, camera view change. That is a view coming to us from Go Navigator, the recovery vessel. Uh, the two fast boats are out there getting to getting ready to uh, basically uh, plot, or excuse me, install the rigging equipment required to hoist Dragon out of the water. Uh, one, the other fast boat is actually collecting the parachutes from the water. We definitely want to uh, bring those back on board with us. Uh, but shortly here, we should actually see one of the team members uh, crawl up onto the side of the capsule in order to install that, uh, install the rigging, like I, I mentioned. That particular team member is highly experienced and highly trained, as you can imagine. Climbing on top of an oddly shaped thing in, you know, the ocean <laughs> could be a little tricky. So uh, this person has undergone a lot, hours and hours of training and certification in order to perform this very important task. There on the right-hand side of your screen, we see the second fast boat approaching. Uh, of course, both of these boats uh, needed to wait for their queue. Uh, from the water recovery lead in order to approach Dragon after splashdown. Uh, again, that was just to make sure that there weren't any toxic vapors in the air. Uh, and now that they got the all clear, we do see them beginning to work uh, on and around the Dragon capsule. So even though the camera's a little shaky, uh, that water looks super, super duper uh, smooth, almost like glass, which is certainly ideal for a water recovery like today. Yeah, got to remember that this is a view from the, the main recovery vessel, which was still a few miles away from the splashdown point. Dragon SpaceX, we have hypercrawl sweeps and unfired ordnance checks uh, nominal. Rigor is on board the vehicle about two, five minutes until capsule lift. After that, yep, we see him uh, walking outside and uh, good news. All right, confirmation there that all of those hypergolic uh, vapor tests came out uh, positive, or rather negative, which is a positive thing. <laughs> uh, so the team was able to approach, and now the crew member that is installing the rigging is on top of the capsule. It's difficult to see there uh, because the slower vessel, that re the primary recovery ship, is a little further away. But as we heard, it's just a mere two and a half minutes until uh, they will be hoisted out of the water. I'm, I'm sorry, tw 25 minutes, not... 2.5. I misheard that. Yeah. They're fast, but they're not that yeah. fast. Uh, we also have been hearing that uh, the secondary boat, which its primary mission in this case is securing those parachutes, uh, they've already got buoys attached to both droves, and uh, two of the four mains and already had eyes on the other two, so they're moving through that work pretty quickly. Again, their primary responsibility, getting those parachutes together. Uh, the droves uh, detaching from the spacecraft uh, right before the deployment of the mains, the mains automatically detaching immediately as Dragon detected splashdown. All of that happening right per the timeline. And we've talked a little bit about the hardwired buttons that Bob and Doug have on their seats and in their control uh, displays. And cutting the, the main chutes is one of those buttons. In the event that they weren't automatically cut after splashdown, Bob and Doug would have had uh, the ability to do so. Uh, if the winds were stronger and they caught the parachutes, it could certainly create a condition where the capsule could be moved unintentionally by those dragging parachutes. So definitely want to avoid that. So uh, that's one of the, the few buttons that are hardwired into the cabin for the crew. And again, right now we're expecting about 20 minutes uh, for the, the main recovery vessel, the Go Navigator, to reach Dragon. By that point, all the rigging will be affixed, and then they'll be able to use the A-frame hydraulic lift on the back of the on the back of the vessel to begin to pull Dragon up out of the water. Uh, Bob and Doug did report they're seeing the guys climbing around outside their window on the capsule, getting that rigging affixed. Uh, still doing good uh, from all of their reports. And we're just going to see the vessel continue to close in. It's a little over 1.3 nautical miles still away, but you can see things starting to sharpen up in our view as it does draw in closer.
One thing I didn't get to mention as the sequence events was happening, everything was going so quickly, uh, just before the drogue de deployment, the seats automatically rotated to about 26 degrees. Uh, and so if you think back to when we saw Bob and Doug while they were still on orbit and during the, uh, the deorbit burn and all their departure burns, they were actually laying closer to on their backs at the 40 degree position, uh, where essentially they were looking up at the top of Dragon Capsule, like their stomachs were facing uh, the top nose cone there. At this point, the seats would have rotated, so they're in a little bit more of an upright position. Uh, that's done to ensure that um, the loads experienced from landing are, you know, don't, doesn't, doesn't hurt them. So uh, at this point, they are not really laying on their backs in the ocean. They are seated upright a little bit, which would allow them to have a better view of the team working to install the rigging equipment. So at this point, we're at about 22 minutes until Dragon will be lifted onto the recovery vessel. Bob and Doug are still strapped into their seats, kind of like an airplane. You know, they say, do not unbuckle your seatbelt until the captain determines that it's safe to do so. Uh, they will stay, remain in their seats throughout the entire recovery process, essentially until it's time to get them out. Like I said, we are expecting to lift Dragon onto the Go Navigator recovery ship in about 21 minutes. And then in 28 minutes, we will be opening that hatch and beginning crew egress, also known as exit. And we did hear the rigging is pretty much complete. so. Uh, right as they arrive there at the capsule, the main recovery vessel will be able to begin uh, getting it up out of the water. So now as the recovery vessel Go Navigator is getting closer to Dragon, Dragon's position there off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, we're able to see the capsule in a little bit more detail. Uh, it is certainly no longer a bright shade of white. <laughs> like we said, those external temperatures uh, were reaching up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So the thermal protective systems, thermal protection systems, uh, enable Dragon to return while keeping the internal temperature rather temperate. And you are seeing a few more boats than expected. Um, the team's currently working uh, with a few private vessels uh, in the area, making sure that they get out of there. And now we see one of the SpaceX fast boats moving in.
So we are being advised that uh, the recovery team is radioing out to the vessels in the water near Crew Dragon to vacate the area uh, so that we're able to extract Bob and Doug safely. Uh, you know, also for the safety of those folks in the area as well, not just Bob and Doug. Yeah, this is, this is obviously a dynamic operation. One of the first things we do is make sure there aren't essentially poisonous fumes around the capsule. So uh, something like this just really can endanger the whole thing, endanger the crew members and endanger themselves. So uh, the SpaceX team is moving in to try and get them away so they can safely recover the Dragon capsule and get Bob and Doug on deck and safely inside the their medical quarters. So we can see them, they're getting a lot closer. Uh, we expect uh, about 10 minutes or so until they should be in position. Uh, all the rigging has been affixed on the Dragon capsule. And once they arrive, they'll be able to use that hydraulic lift to get Dragon up and out of the water. So the recovery vessel Go Navigator is getting closer and closer to Dragon Endeavor as it awaits its recovery, or as it awaits to be hoisted out of the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we landed just off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. Maybe next time we shouldn't announce our landing zone. <laughs> Oh, there we got a shot from our WB-57 plane. It looks like that area has cleared out significantly, so that is good to see. And we're also hearing that all of the parachutes have buoys on them, so also good news uh, as the recovery process continues for SpaceX Demo 2. Dragon SpaceX for com reconfig. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Doug, we're about to uh, reconfigure the forward link. We uh, may lose that for about one or so minutes, uh, and that should happen shortly. Copy. Yeah, just give us a call back when you think you got it back. Will do. So as the main vessel gets closer, it's gonna back up and get its hydraulic lift set up right next to the Dragon capsule, still in the water. Uh, Bob and Doug still inside, uh, just waiting for that recovery. Uh, we should start the hoisting operations in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And then it'll be a pretty quick uh, lift up out of the water using that hydraulic lift into the Dragon nest on the deck of the boat, or the ship rather. Uh, and then they'll move it underneath the helipad into essentially the crew recovery area where they'll have a platform right up to the hatch. They'll be able to open up the hatch. Uh, SpaceX uh, medical doctor will be the first one through the door, able to do a quick check in with Bob and Doug on their status. And then he and the other uh, medical doctors, flight surgeons and uh, trained technicians will begin to help them out of the capsule. Yeah, earlier, just after splashdown, we did hear uh, Bob and Doug report that they were feeling good after reentry. So uh, that was relayed to the flight surgeon. And good news to hear. Again, this is a view coming from the WB-57 plane uh, as it is circling the area. And we can see Dragon awaiting to be pulled out of the water. Again, we are anticipating that lift uh, to begin in just under 15 minutes. We're approaching 14 minutes here. Uh, and then in 21 minutes, we will have an open hatch. <laughs> and you can see the main recovery vessel in the top right there. That's the helipad with uh, the big SpaceX X on top. It's now backing up towards the capsule. Certainly not to be confused with one of our uh, landing drone ships. <laughs> There's a live view of Dragon, uh, of Dragon floating in the water there in the background, along with many onlookers. <laughs> 
certainly from a safer distance at this point. Uh, this is a live shot coming from Go Navigator, our rec primary recovery vessel here. So it's dra Crew Dragon is also accompanied by the fast boats that are helping to bring it in closer. Um, and there you can see a couple of the recovery team members on the deck. Uh, and also just behind them, we get our first good view of the nest. Uh, yes, so this is uh, essentially the nest in the background there. Dragon will be hoisted using the hydraulic lift out of the water and into that nest. That nest will then be pulled towards the camera from this view, towards those individuals on that upper deck there. Uh, and that's where the... Dragon SpaceX comm check. Loud and clear, solo, how us? Loud and clear as well, and from the video, it looks like the boat is about one uh, length away, about five to ten meters, backing up to you. Copy that. Uh, thanks for the update. All right, so good news there. We're getting ready to see Dragon to be lifted out of the water and into the recovery nest. As I was saying, that nest will be pulled towards the camera, uh, towards the upper deck that we saw there, and that's where the medical stretchers will be waiting uh, to assist them into the medical bays for uh, evaluation after capsule egress. It's already been it's already been 25 minutes since they splashed down. It doesn't feel like it. That uh, was definitely the fastest 25 yeah. minutes of the day. <laughs> the, the timeline we were anticipating was for the lifting operations to start within about 30 minutes, so we're pretty much right on the timeline still. That's been a, a pretty common thing so far today. Uh, you can see them uh, with one of the fast boats getting it positioned to start uh, moving out with the additional rigging uh, to affix to the Dragon capsule where they're going to use this A-frame to pull it up out of the water. And you can see the Dragon nest at the very bottom. It's uh, that circular object uh, with the A-1 right on it. So while this is the first time we are recovering a capsule with crew members on board, the recovery team has been... And Dragon, just letting you know, we got a couple lines connected and uh, rigging is in progress. Copy that, SpaceX. Thank you. All right there. So just updating the crew that they might feel some uh, momentum as the lines, as a couple of the rigging lines are attached. Uh, there we can actually, there's our first good shot of the individual who is uh, placing that rigging equipment. Equipment Again, that's someone that's highly specialized and very well trained for these operations. Uh, as I was saying, the recovery team has rehearsed and practiced this with Bob and Doug themselves, actually, uh, in a test capsule, practicing the, the egress as well as um, they have recovered, or excuse me, they have practiced the recovery process many times uh, and actually through those practice runs, uh, they have effectively cut the recovery period in half from the initial Demo 1 mission. So uh, it's really nice to see that uh, the, the process itself, after being rehearsed and carefully choreographed, uh, is, is going super efficiently. Again, uh, safety is the number one priority, so making sure that only uh, personnel involved in active recovery operations are present on the deck. Uh, you may have heard us mention before that there are about 40 people on board today, but we certainly don't want uh, anyone in danger or, or to fall overboard. <laughs> that guy intentionally jumped. <laughs> Speaking of falling overboard. <laughs> We're ready. Thank you. All right, so the crew was just told in about 30, in the next 30 seconds, they have the lines affixed, so they're going to start lifting the capsule up out of the water. And at this point, the communication we're getting with Dragon is actually being routed through the boat itself at this point. So there we can see the lift. Dragon is out of the water. Yeah, so now they're now... that A-frame is going to start swinging it back. And it's bound right for that nest at the bottom of your screen. So there we're getting a better shot of all the points in which Dragon is tethered to the hydraulic lift, ensuring that it isn't swinging freely. And 
there we can see Dragon Endeavor being carefully set down into the recovery nest on top of Go Navigator. Dragon uh, SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are completing final checks and preparing to translate you to the egress platform. We happy, thank you. So for the first time in two months, NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley are on some sort of ground. I guess we can't call it solid ground because it is a ship. However, uh, it is the first time that they are not in space, uh, on a rocket, or bobbing in the ocean. Yeah, so now that they're in the nest, we're, they're going to start translating it forward. And Dragon's going to move into essentially the hangar section underneath that helipad and then up to that recovery platform that we saw a little bit earlier. At that point, uh, the spacecraft technicians will work to open up the hatch. As we said previously, it's a manual process uh, with a couple of different uh, attachments you have to engage before the hatch itself can be opened. They'll get it opened and then uh, SpaceX's Anil Menon will be the first one through the hatchway to check in on Bob and Doug, get their initial health assessment, see if they're ready to move, and then we'll start assisting them out of the capsule and into that medical facility on the boat. So at this point, the recovery team is doing uh, final securing of the capsule in preparation to actually move the recovery nest uh, into closer to the interior of the ship. It'll actually be uh, in a little bit of a covered deck there. We had a, we saw that camera view earlier uh, looking straight out from the center of the boat. So once Dragon is secured in the nest, uh, the nest will be translated then forward and uh, closer to the recovery uh, the, the, excuse me, closer to the position in which we're able to actually open the hatch. So while Dragon is on board safely, uh, we're not able to do that just yet. Yeah, they're, de they're working to detach some of those lines that were used to hoist it using the A-frame, and uh, we heard that they should be done with that in just a moment, and then we'll start that translation. So right now we can see the recovery team uh, releasing those securing lines that were used during the lift of the capsule from the water uh, into the nest. So they are releasing those securing lines from the sides, making sure it is secure from the bottom. And there we see Dragon moving forward. Look at that. Smooth as a Tesla, I would say. <laughs> it's really interesting to see those scorching marks uh, now that we get a really nice up close detail shot of Dragon. Standing by for the go for side hatch open. That rounded square there in the center of the capsule is that side hatch. And on either side are those oval windows. Dragon SpaceX, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. Happy, we're ready. All right, crew got the call. We are go for hatch open. And if you look closely immediately above the hatch, you can see the area where you can see them working in now. That's where those drogue chutes deployed from. The two circles on either side were where the mortars were. Uh, the main parachutes uh, now hidden by the platform 
underneath the, the side hatch. So the crew is in the process of removing the side hatch. We can see that Go Navigator is in transit. It is making its way back to the Pensacola Naval Air Station. However, Bob and Doug will get a ride from the recovery vessel via helicopter. Uh, So again, we're preparing to open the side hatch, and once that done, once that is done, the flight surgeon will pop his head in, do an initial check, see how Bob and Doug are doing. And Dragon SpaceX, we got a slight delay due to some uh, potential NDO hits near the side hatch. Captain Mike, we're uh, standing by. And so they're still continuing to do kind of those sniffs, so checking for any vapors or anything. So those NDO, it's uh, NO2 nitrogen dioxide, uh, primarily can uh, get detected in the air from the burning of fuel. So they're going to continue to just inspect around the capsule, make sure that it's, again, safe for the crew, safe for the recovery experts uh, before they get this hatch open. But again, moving right along the timeline, it's... Uh, since they splashed down at 11.48 uh, a.m. Pacific. And so again, they're just pausing the operations for a moment, doing some additional air sampling uh, around the prop system. We still have uh, Telemetry being fed from the vehicle, so flight controllers here in Hawthorne able to monitor prop tanks, propulsion tank pressures, and not seeing any issues with those at the moment. So again, just a short pause in the operations is again, they're just sniffing around the capsule, making sure we don't have uh, any readings that might indicate a fuel leak or anything around the vehicle. Uh, they did detect some NDO, some nitrogen dioxide, which is typically a residue that uh, arises from the burning of fuel. So they're continuing to do just a couple of different air readings, uh, grab samples essentially, uh, before they proceed with the hatch opening. Dragon SpaceX update. We're still investigating. It uh, looks like we'll be setting up a service section purge. We're working on an ETA for you. Okay. In case if you're just joining us, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley have safely returned from the International Space Station. They made an on-time splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida at uh, 11.48 a.m. Pacific.
18.48 a.m. Universal Time. And they have been pulled out of the water and hoisted onto the recovery vessel Go Navigator. And right now the team is uh, just completing, uh, they did a, a, an initial check and found that there might be some remnant, remnant vapors, uh, which we certainly don't want to be around when uh, we have Bob and Doug coming out of the capsule. So the team is uh, working to purge the service section in preparation uh, for crew egress. Just a little commentary on uh, the hatches that, that we're, we've been talking about. So while Dragon's top hatch is used to connect to the International Space Station, uh, that's the one that's located under the nose cone, which is currently hidden there uh, at the top of the capsule. Um, uh, before the, this is the, the side hatch is what is utilize, utilized for uh, ingress and egress, both on the launch pad as well as coming up here on the recovery vessel. When the international, or excuse me, when the capsule is docked to the International Space Station, uh, they will use the forward hatch to exit and enter the capsule. Something to note that once that side hatch is opened, uh, it'll be the first time that Bob and Doug have gotten a breath of fresh air. Uh, the first time that they've been able to do so in two months uh, since they boarded the Falcon 9 uh, at the start of their mission back on May 30th. Yeah, with an on-time splashdown, they return with almost exactly 64 days in space on this mission, just a few minutes shy of that. Um, so I know they're looking forward to it. Uh, at a minimum, in a little bit more of a stable condition now that they're on the boat, not in the water. Uh, but again, our team's just continuing to step through. They're, they're reporting that they're seeing uh, all of the vapor levels that they initially detected have been dropping, um, and that service and section purge. Dragon uh, SpaceX, uh, we showed that levels are declining, but are uh, continuing with purge. Uh, and in addition, just so you know, we are not seeing any you know, leak indications or anything like that. These are pretty small levels, but we still need to do the purge at this time. Okay, Cappy. Yeah, you're reading our mind, Mike. We were just wondering if you saw any indications of a leak or some depressurization somewhere, but it sounds like it's just uh, part of the deal. Yeah, that's a good read back, Doug. So we're just continuing to get a view down uh, right at the hatch of the capsule. They are detecting those very small traces uh, of a couple of the hypergalls. Um, the one we've heard specifically mentioned was uh, NDO or NO3 uh, nitrogen or NO2 nitrogen dioxide. Um, they are at very low levels, um, obviously not at a very harmful level as we still have people in close proximity to the capsule. Uh, they are going through with the purge. They're not seeing any indications of a leak uh, in the service section of Dragon. That's where uh, pretty much all of those different fuel tanks uh, with the hypergalls are located uh, inside the capsule. We are just about 44 minutes post splashdown, uh, actually still ahead of the timeline as we weren't expecting to get the hatch open until shortly before 60 minutes, uh, at which point we'd be bringing Bob and Doug out. So uh, this and service Dragon section. SpaceX, another update. The service section purge should begin in a bit under five minutes. Uh, right now we're showing NTO about 2x of our personnel exposure limits, and uh, we're hoping once we start the purge, it'll drop down for us. 
Okay. Thanks, Mike. And I'm going to have to correct myself. So it's NTO, that's the dinitrogen te tetraoxide, and that's one of the hypergolic fuels used inside Dragon for powering those uh, Draco thrusters. So again, the SpaceX engineers detecting uh, levels of NTO, it's dinitrogen tetraoxide. It's one of the hypergolic fuels used inside the Dragon spacecraft. Um, levels higher than they would like, um, so they're essentially doing a purge to help uh, dissipate any vapors in and around the service section where those fuel tanks reside in the Dragon capsule. We're expecting that to take within the next five minutes or so. Uh, we were still expecting the crew out inside of an hour, so still on the timeline or a few minutes ahead, and we should be seeing Bob and Doug, uh, once we see those uh, levels continue to drop around the capsule, they'll begin to step through the hatch opening process once again. So right now we're getting ready to purge the surface section. Uh, this is to make sure that uh, the lingering NTO fumes that the team is detecting uh, get flushed out essentially. Uh, the surface section is not the interior cabin where Bob and Doug are. Uh, it's actually the part of the capsule that is outside of the place where Bob and Doug are. It's, it's external to the, to the cabin but it's inside the capsule itself. So you can think of it as the space between the exterior of the Dragon capsule and the interior space uh, where Bob and Doug are. There's, the, I think the interior pressure vessel, essentially. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Bob and Doug are fine. The air that they are breathing um, is you know, that nitrox uh, mix that they've been getting throughout the entire duration of, of, of today's uh, operations, but it'll be essentially the area below their cabin, um, completely sealed off from the service section. Yeah, that service section is where uh, we. There's a lot of telemetry. It's where um, there are the prop tanks, and we're just making sure that those get aerated so that uh, lingering fumes are swept away. Again, they had detected higher levels than they want to see of nitrogen tetraoxide. Uh, that's one of the two hypergolic fuels used uh, in Dragon, the other one being monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, those two fuels, uh, essentially when thrown together, even without an ignition source, uh, will react. Uh, that's what makes them hypergolic fuels. A uh, much simpler, more elegant uh, solution used in a lot of um, on-orbit maneuvering systems uh, in spacecraft. So again, we're just standing by. It's 
So as you can see on your screen, there is one crew member that has kind of what looks like a... Dragon SpaceX, uh, don't have a great, a huge update for you. Just letting you know the service section uh, purge is still in work. Um, and we'll try to get you out of there shortly. Traffic. So as I was saying, two individuals on your screen there, one uh, with a face mask and what looks like a scuba tank there uh, with some clean breathing air. Um, there might be another crew member with the same personal protective equipment or PPE that will come on deck here. Uh, that type of equipment, ah, there we go. Uh, that's the kind of equipment that is required in order to perform this purge. Again, uh, the NTO is, the fumes from that are toxic. And of course, we want to keep all crew members safe as we prepare the side hatch for opening in order to let Dragon Bob and SpaceX, Doug uh, Looks like limits uh, are dropping and getting pretty good. Uh, we're still continuing with the purge just to be extra sure. Okay, that sounds good, Mike. Thank you. All right, so we just heard the call, the limits continuing to drop uh, on that uh, that NTO, that nitrogen uh, tetraoxide. So they're just going to continue to monitor those. They're doing a purge, essentially flushing the air around the service section where the tanks uh, for those hypergolic fuels are in Dragon. As Kate was talking about, they're not inside the pressure vessel, the section of the Dragon interior where Bob and Doug and their atmosphere exists. Uh, they're essentially outside the pressure vessel, but still inside the outer shell of the Dragon spacecraft. We are just about 52 minutes post splashdown. Again, we're just waiting for them to get good readings on the levels of any hypergol vapors still in existence around the capsule, and then they'll be able to step back in uh, to this hatch opening. Now, we did hear confirmation that they haven't seen any indication of leaks through the telemetry they're still receiving from the Dragon capsule. And so, Dragon SpaceX, we're going to purge for one more minute. Copy. There we go. Should be one more minute. And then if levels have dropped sufficiently, we'll be able to step back in to the hatch opening process. Bob and Doug will be getting assistance from the recovery teams while exiting Dragon Endeavor. Uh, this is the same process for any returning long duration crew members uh, as returning to a gravity rich environment can, you know, be a little jarring, wreak havoc with our vestibular system. So, uh, which is responsible for maintaining balance and motion. Of course, as you've heard us say multiple times earlier, uh, safety is our number one priority with this operation. So you will see both Bob and Doug helped out of the capsule and assisted to just the few feet over to the medical quarters uh, aboard the boat.
Uh, if if you've ever watched long duration crews return on a Soyuz, it's pretty similar process where they're literally carried out of the capsule and immediately placed down into a waiting chair where they usually get some initial medical checks out there in the field before they're then carried to an inflated medical tent. Uh, we don't have a tent. We have quarters, and they're a whole lot closer, so they'll just have a couple of feet to go from the capsule itself into those medical quarters. And then once they're in there, they'll get some initial checkouts uh, from their flight surgeons who are on location on the boat with them. These are the people that have essentially been responsible for their health and well-being throughout their mission, uh, both beforehand, all of their pre-flight data takes, uh, offering them support uh, in the lead up to launch, uh, and then the entire time while on board the International Space Station. And then they're right here with the front line, with the recovery teams, ready to welcome them home. So it's been just about a minute since we heard that last call to the crew. We should be just about done with the purge. We're going to stand by and hopefully we'll resume these hatch opening operations uh, in just a moment. Try again, SpaceX for update. Okay, exterior, we're seeing uh, three parts per million NTO and six parts per billion of uh, MMH. Anil, however, is asking that you uh, destow your Draggers and take a sample inside the cabin. Yeah, which detector, what number, Mike? Yeah, it'll be uh, detectors two and three in location 14. Copy. Okay, thanks, Doug. All right, so we just got the, the call out of the current readings of both uh, the NTO, the nitrogen tetroxide, and the monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, either in the parts per million or the parts per billion, but just as an extra safety precaution, uh, we heard Anil, so Anil Menon, the uh, medical authority from SpaceX on the boat, asking the crew to take out some uh, air detectors that they have inside with them just to do some quick sampling inside the cabin itself. So again, we've said it before, we'll continue to say it throughout safety, the top priority with this operation. So the teams are going to be very methodical and make sure that everything is in a good setup, a safe environment, uh, not only for the crew themselves, but also for our recovery forces. Uh, but for now, Bob and Doug still inside of a Crew Dragon. We are just 58 minutes post landing. with a status. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, for uh, NO2 on detector 2, it reads 0, 0.0. And on detector 3, it also reads 0, 0.0 for MMH. Okay, great news. 0, 0.0 for detectors 2 and 3 for NO2 and MMH. Thank you very much. That's a good copy. And so Doug Hurley reporting zeros across the board, no traces uh, of either the NTO or the MMH.
Dragon SpaceX for a status update. Okay, so currently our exposure limits um, are below limits, but the purge is actually doing a pretty good job. We saw NTO go from uh, three parts per million down to 1.5 over the last few minutes. So ideally, with a lot of caution, we'd go ahead and let the purge run for a little bit longer, but we want to see how you guys are doing, and if you're okay with uh, continuing with, a, with the uh, purge versus uh, knock it off and uh, get you guys out of there quickly. Yeah, we're fine to hang it out, Mike. Uh, yeah, no problem here. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. We'll uh, keep working the purge to uh, get us down, and uh, and uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, let's just keep everybody safe. No reason to rush. Yeah, we concur. Spacecraft Commander Doug Hurley reporting the crew is still doing well in Dragon, so they are good to continue to hang out. Uh, the medical authority there on the boat recommending uh, as long as the crew is okay and still doing well inside Dragon, we'll just continue with the purge, trying to get those uh, trace readings of any hypergol vapors all the way down to zero. Because again, we're really focused on not only keeping the astronauts safe, but all of the recovery engineers and medical professionals there on the scene as well. So they're going to continue this purge, just uh, dispelling uh, the immediate area around the service section uh, of the Dragon spacecraft. So this is uh, really a series of fuel tanks um, outside of the pressure vessel, so where uh, Bob and Doug are inside the Dragon spacecraft, which they did uh, some quick readings inside the cabin and had zeros across the board. Uh, but they're just continuing to let these levels dissipate, bring it down to zero, and then we'll resume hatch operations. We're just a little over an hour now, an hour and two minutes post splashdown. Yeah, good to hear Bob and Doug report that they're good hanging out, meaning they're feeling all right, and they're pretty comfortable staying inside for just a couple more minutes. Yeah, they were, they were doing their best uh, prior to leaving uh, of playing up their expected seasickness. Um, so good. it is good to hear that they're doing well still inside the Dragon Capsule. And uh, Dragon SpaceX, we're still seeing good indications from the purge. We're looking to uh, go about another five minutes and looking for zero indications. If at any time you'd like us to speed things up, please uh, let us know. Oh, we're good. Just keep doing what you're doing. We can wait the five. Easy. All right. Thanks, Doug. All right. So we'll settle in uh, at least another five minutes while they just continue to disperse any trace remnants of those hypergol fuels around the service section uh, of Dragon before we once again step uh, into the hatch opening. Uh, we're going we're gonna to stay with you, stay with this, until Bob and Doug are out of the capsule and into their medical quarters. At this point, Bob and Doug are still uh, strapped into their seats. The seats have actuated uh, away from the position where, I guess, in the orientation in which you see the capsule now, uh, during their on-orbit, excuse me, during the departure phasing earlier this morning and yesterday, the orientation of the seats were such that uh, essentially Bob and Doug would have been laying on their backs in the orientation where we see Dragon now. Uh, currently, the seats have actuated upward slightly, so uh, they are not completely upright, but they are reclined a little bit, nice and comfy there, uh, but they are able to see in and out of those windows there that we see on either side of the side hatch. And then once they're able to finish the really uh, the 
egress process, getting Bob and Doug out of the capsule. Uh, once they're in the medical area, they'll look to start bringing in the helicopter um, as both Bob and Doug are going to be flown back to Pensacola via helicopter, uh, getting them uh, to the shore in just a matter of minutes, where a NASA plane is going to be standing by to then load them up and bring them home to Ellington Airfield at the Johnson Space Center in Houston.